Hello friends. How are you all? This is Fanfic Universe. So we are back with an amazing movie on what if Naruto was the son of king and queen of Greek gods, prince of gods. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this then be sure to sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now let's start the story. This was not just the place where gods and goddesses gathered to have their yearly meeting every winter solstice, the mountain was also called paradise, with golden buildings and happy people. Located at the top of it was a large city containing the palaces for the Olympian gods, goddesses, and residences for many minor gods and other creatures of Greek mythology. But the greatest structure of Mount Olympus was the throne room, the Hall of the Gods. It was the place where the gods of Mount Olympus have their summer, winter solstice, and regular as well as emergency meetings. High above, the blue ceiling could be seen glittering with constellations. The thrones of the gods stand in AU around the hearth, starting with Zeus and Poseidon's thrones as they are the most powerful Greek gods. From Zeus and Poseidon's thrones the goddesses sit on the left side of the hearth and the other gods sit on the right side and Hestia's hearth is in the center of the hall. Since no meeting was currently being held in the throne room, most of the Olympians, the twelve most powerful gods, were minding their own business all around the world, are taking care of the domains that they represented. However, there was a god and a goddess currently sitting in the throne room, sitting on their respective thrones with a dark atmosphere surrounding them. The god was tall, imposing, and very muscular, with long black shoulder-length hair with a grey and black neatly trimmed beard. He had brilliant electrically blue eyes with a serious and proud, but very handsome face. His attire was a dark blue pinstripe suit. This was Zeus, the Greek god of honor, justice, lightning, rain and the sky. He was the king of Olympus, the youngest son of the titans Kronos and Rhea, and the husband of the goddess Hera, who was sitting next to him with a face void of any emotion. Hera was the eldest daughter of Kronos and Rhea, whose long licorice black hair she inherited. She had a face of regal and unapproachable beauty like that of a supermodel on a fashion runway, and a pair of large, soft brown eyes that one could get lost in. She was the goddess of familial love, marriage, motherhood, women and also the queen of Olympus. As they sat on their respective thrones next to each other, the atmosphere between them was thick and heavy, as if one could cut through it with a knife. The king and queen of Olympus had not spoken any words to each other for a whole week now all because of the horrible event that had happened last Sunday. Talia Grace, the latest demigod daughter of Zeus, was killed by the monsters sent by Hades right in front of Camp Half-Blood and later turned into a tree with magic to protect the camp from all monsters by Zeus himself. Hera wasn't happy about it, not in the slightest. Zeus had cheated on her again. Her, the goddess of marriage, for a mere mortal woman. Not only that, but he had also turned his daughter into a tree to make sure that she would never fall into their eldest brother's grasp. She loves her husband with all her heart, but he could never keep it in his pants and stay loyal to her, like how she had always done to him. They had gone through so many things together and yet, Hera, I'm, finally, Zeus decided to speak up, breaking the uncomfortable silence between the two of them with a low tone. I am not in the mood, Zeus, Hera plainly said while looking away her face still remained the same. After so many years of having Zeus cheated on her for so many times, she had come to get used to it. But, unlike her son, Hephaestus, who would gladly divorce his unfaithful wife, she couldn't, couldn't ever get over it mentally. It didn't change the fact that it still hurt a lot whenever an offspring of his showed up, or was discovered. Hera. I am heading back. Hera said emotionlessly as she stood up from her throne and got ready to transform into her true form to teleport away, but her husband suddenly grabbed her wrist. Wait, Kashina. Just how many years had it been since the last time he called her by that name? It had been so long ago. One of the only times in her long, immortal life that Hera had found true happiness with him, and the marriage between them. Sure. They still had powers, but they were not godly. There were no divine responsibilities that they had to worry about, nothing, it was just the love between them, two regular mortals. Elemental nations, the place where their oldest ancestors, the primordial gods and goddesses had created a very long ago, separated from this world. It was the world where mortals called shinobi, or simply ninja in modern language, lived and worked, wielding a special energy called chakra to bend the powers of nature to their will and do things only them, the gods and goddesses of this world, 
as well as their demigods' offsprings, could do. Beside the primordial gods themselves, only Zeus, Hera and their siblings knew about the place, as it was kept as top-secret information from the other gods, who they deemed way too young and irresponsible to know about a world like that. Zeus, who had wanted to experience the life of the mortals of elemental nations, thought it might be a good idea for them to take some time off from the life of deities. At first, Hera did not think it was a good idea, for they were gods who had important works to take care of, but after being convinced by her husband, she had finally agreed to come with him, as long as there were just the two of them. With the powers of the Fates and Hecate, goddess of magic, who both agreed to help them, they were able to create artificial bodies to fuse their divine essences into, while temporarily suppressing their godly aspect as well as their powers, making them almost entirely humans. And with the powers of the Fates, Zeus and Hera were born into elemental nations as mortals, with the king of the Greek gods becoming a young man named Minato Namikaze, while his wife was born into the Uzumaki clan, with her mortal name being Kashina. In order to conceal their true identities from other gods in the situation that they somehow discovered elemental nations by accident, Hecate had made sure that their mortal bodies did not look the same as they were as god and goddess. Despite her best efforts, however, the goddess of magic could not alter Zeus' appearance completely due to his immense power as the king of the Greek gods, leaving him with his brilliant electric blue eyes. He was, however, the god of drama, so Zeus was able to play into his character so much that Hera couldn't help but do the same with her new identity, to the point that there had been times that the two of them completely forgot who they really were. They had so much fun together. Get your hand off me. Hera said coldly without even looking at her husband and don't you dare call me with that name again, Zeus. Even though they were gods, whose powers allowed them to control the aspects of life, Zeus and Hera were well aware of the fact that their authority was not absolute, and they were restricted by the ancient rules that Chaos himself had written in order to keep them from doing exactly what they wanted. For them, everything came with a heavy price, and the fates themselves had warned them about it. They had a son there, and his name was Naruto. He was no god, just a normal boy who Hera had given birth to in the traditional way. She had given birth to many of Zeus' children before, but it was the first time in her life that she had felt so much love and pride for a child. Naruto was everything that she had ever wanted. But the night that they had Naruto, they had to pay the price of happiness, the price of being Minato Namikaze and Kashina Uzumaki, two mortals whose true natures were two of the most powerful gods of their world. Hera, please. Zeus pleaded as he stood up. I can't just leave Talia like that. I cannot let her fall into the hand of my brother. You know what he will do to my child. Then you shouldn't have brought her to this world in the first place, husband. You know the consequence, but no, you still have to do it. It was you who suggested the oath to your brother, and yet, you broke it first. Hera turned around, her beautiful brown eyes radiating with power, it was all your fault. I know. Talia was your daughter. Yes, she's but a child. She does not deserve such a life, such a tragic end. When are you going to realize that you always make the worst, stupidest decisions? She spoke to him sternly, and even though her voice did not hold any emotion, even Zeus could tell that she was incredibly angry, and was ready to explode at him for real. And don't you dare forget, that if it weren't for you, Naruto would still be alive. She finished with a tear falling from her left eye, as she remembered her mortal son. Dot her beautiful mortal son who died the same day she cradled him in her arms for the first time. Kyubi, a creature so powerful his power easily rivaled Typhoon, Olympus Destroyer, also killed them that night. However, because they were gods in mortal bodies, what the tailed beast killed were simply their human aspects. Their divine essences remained and thus, allowed them to return to life soon after. The first thing that they did as soon as they reformed had been heading back to Konoha and looking for their son, Naruto, who became the new vessel for Kyubi, making him a Jinchuriki. Because Kashina, or Hera, were the previous vessel of the beast, knew better than anyone the difficult life of a vessel of a tailed beast, so she did not want her son to be raised in elemental nations, knowing full well that he would have a difficult life ahead of him if he stayed there. She had wanted to raise him on earth, not just because she did not want such a life for her son, but also because he was the clearest proof that Zeus and Hera, worked and there was genuine love between the two of them. But when they came back to Konoha, Sarutobi Hirazan, one of the only people that they had revealed their true existences to, had told them that he was dead. Their son. Naruto was dead. 
Of course Hera did not believe it. With her godly powers, she had threatened to kill the old monkey and everyone he held dear, including Konoha itself, for the lie that he had said. But when she looked into his mind and saw Serutobi laid a small coffin down the hole between the graves of Minato and Kashina, she could not hold it anymore and broke down into tears. Even worse, she couldn't come to Elemental Nation's underworld to see him, or to hold him in her arms, because it was not the same as theirs. Elemental Nation's underworld was out of order, and there was no Elysium, no mercy was ever shown there, just the worst punishment for the souls that had committed crime in life, and simple afterlife for the innocent like her baby. Zeus wasn't any better than her. He had tried to act tough, for he had a pride and an ego that was unmatched by any man or gods, but the death of his mortal son, who was very special to him, had been too much for even the prideful king of the Greek gods to handle. For the first time ever, Zeus had broken down into tears, and called for Naruto in vain. After that night, they both swore to never return to elemental nations, for they were well aware of the fact that it would only bring them the worst memories. Sure they had had their moments of happiness, but the pain of losing their son was too much for either of them to handle. Hera locked herself in her palace for days, then weeks and then months and then years. She had never experienced the death of one of her children before, as all of them were gods or goddesses. But it broke her heart just to remember about Naruto. Do not try to vindicate yourself Zeus, I know you better than anyone. Hera looked away, she didn't want to look into his eyes now. They were the same eyes as those of their son, who had inherited his father's trademark eyes. You sealed the Kyubi in Naruto and that was the reason why he was dead, it was all because of you. I don't have anything to justify myself, but, you know that I don't have a choice, Hera. I did what I must, as a shinobi and the leader of Konoha. Zeus said firmly, and Hera decided to not say anything in return, knowing that she could not argue. Shinobi, she still remembered the meaning of that word. But before neither of them could speak up again, the entire throne room was shaken violently by a massive wave of power. All over Olympus, the gods and goddesses had no choice but to stop whatever they were doing and looked up in shock when they felt such a powerful feeling. While the minor gods were confused by it, the twelve Olympian, especially the eldest six, knew the feeling very well. It had happened once before, many millennia ago. It was the feeling that they would all feel when a human transcended the boundary between mortals and gods, and utilized a power that was on par with a primordial being. Such a fact was almost impossible. Zeus. I know. Nodding his head at his wife and deciding to leave their personal issues for a later time, Zeus summoned his master Bolt and launched a massive bolt of lightning to the sky, summoning the other Olympians, even his eldest brother Hades, who was not welcomed on Olympus except for the winter solstice event. In flashes of light, all twelve appeared in the throne room, with many looking at their king in confusion. Poseidon and Hades were the only ones who immediately took their seats, knowing full well that they would want to sit down to take in whatever that was happening. Despite not being an Olympian and no longer had a seat among them, it did not take long for Hestia, the goddess of the hearth, to arrive and sit down at her usual place beside the center hearth, with no one questioning her arrival despite it being an emergency meeting of the twelve Olympians. Olympians. Zeus spoke up with a thunderous voice after every other Olympian had taken their seats and looked at him in expectation. I am sure that you know why I have summoned you here tonight. We are all here to discuss the wave of energy and the feeling that you have felt just a moment ago. What was it father? Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom asked in a curious tone, in all my immortal life I have never felt something like that. I have already tried to look for it in the ancient records. Please Athena, we don't need you to rant about your library and your books right now. Ares interrupted with a tone full of boredom and a dismissive wave of his hand. You have a death wish, Ares? The goddess of war asked while glaring at her half-brother dangerously. Hey, you wanna fight? Enough, both of you. Zeus warned them firmly, causing the two deities of war to look away from each other, now is not the time for your usual bickering. We have a more important matter to care for. Listen carefully. What you felt just a moment ago was the alerting energy that Chaos himself has created at the point of human's creation. Let there ever be a human that has transcended the boundaries between mortals and gods, and fighting on equal ground with a primordial being. Almost every jaw in the room was dropped down to the ground in shock. You can't be serious, father. Athena broke the silence, picking up her jaw from the ground to utter the only logical statement that she could manage in her mind to speak to her father. 
No mere mortal could fight against a god, let alone a primordial being which could be even stronger than gods themselves. My words are the truth, I swear it on the sticks. Thunders rumbled outside and, even though most of them didn't admit it, they had hoped that Zeus would be punished for telling a lie, no matter his position at the king of the gods. It did, however, confirm that he was telling the truth, that somewhere out there, a human had become as strong as a primordial being. For a mortal to wield such power, they can become a dangerous threat to us if we don't do something about it," Hades said seriously while looking around the throne room. And there is also the problem of the being that they are fighting. Poseidon pointed out, receiving a nod of the heads from both of his brothers. We always keep a close eye on our oldest ancestors, so we know that it couldn't be any of them that are fighting this mortal. Whoever it is, they must have the powers that rivaled one, and is considered a primordial being by nature itself. Which makes them even more dangerous to us than this mortal. Zeus said, before summoning Iris, the goddess of rainbow, who appeared before them looking as confused as the younger Olympians had been. Take this, Iris. With that said, Zeus summoned with his master bolt a brilliant crystal, which he then handed to Iris before telling her, it will allow you to show us with your powers the mortal and this primordial being, if they are still fighting. Make sure that it's one way only. We need to see who they are without alerting them of our presences. Yes, your majesty. Iris replied before activating her powers with the crystal in hand. A rainbow soon appeared in the center of the throne room, showing them the images of a shadowy figure that soon became clear. No, they all heard Hera gasping in shock, even Zeus couldn't hold his master bolt in his hand firmly anymore and rose from his throne in shock. It can't be. Zeus muttered. The person within Iris Rainbow soon revealed themselves to be a woman with extremely long, sweeping white hair that hovered like a cloak behind her back. The most noticeable features about her, however, were the two horn-like protrusions that stuck out from her head. The woman had abnormal white eyes, and a third eye on the center of her forehead that's eyelids parted vertically. For clothing, she wore a transitional high-collared heim kimono, which was adorned with intricate lines that were gold and purple and tomo running down the center and edges of the gown. Kagaya Otsutsuki. Poseidon muttered in absolute horror, with Hades, Demeter and Hestia sharing a similar expression. Father, who is she? Athena asked with a worrying tone, she had never seen the look of shock and horror on her father, his wife and those of the other older gods and goddesses like that. Kagaya Otsutsuki, a otherworldly woman who attained primordial leveled powers by eating the fruit of the world tree, becoming as strong, if not stronger than even some of our ancestors. Poseidon informed them, making every other Olympians widen their eyes in shock. But since she wasn't born a deity, her mortal mind cannot comprehend such power, and she had grown despotic. More or less, you can say that she became mad with power. But father, how come we have never heard of her? Athena couldn't help but ask, surely someone with that much power will. Because, fortunately for us, she is not from this dimension, Hades answered. All questions then disappeared from the Olympians, mind when suddenly a flash of light appeared next to Kagaya. With energy-like claws formed around their hands, the person then used it to cut away one of the goddess of rabbits' arms before disappearing again in a flash of orange light, so fast that even Hermes couldn't keep up with him. This must be that mortal who has ascended beyond the boundary between mortals and gods, Poseidon said, with a hint of admiration in his tone. As that, Hera raised an eyebrow in confusion before looking at her husband, who nodded his head in confirmation before saying. Hiroshin. The lighting god muttered, but only his wife could hear him. It was Hiroshin or something similar to it. Being the one who had perfected the technique, Zeus could recognize it anywhere. The person then reappeared behind Kagaya and delivered a roundhouse kick to her back, sending her flying before pulling out two black sticks from the black orbs leviating behind his back throwing it toward the limp arm of Kagaya on the ground, stabbing through it like he was doing it to keep that arm immobile. They finally got a glimpse of the mortal who was fighting Kagaya head-on, which made Zeus and Hera widen their eyes in utter shock. The person bore a striking resemblance to Zeus' human disguise with spiky blonde hair. His eyes, however, were orange instead of brilliant blue, with his pupils greatly resembling a cross. However, Hera could see that his face had the same shape to that of Kashina Uzumaki. He was wearing what looked like a yellow, energy coat with a black bodysuit underneath. The bodysuit covered his torso, reaching down his arms to his knuckles, and down his legs to the point just above his sandals, 
He also had a pattern of six magatama around his collar. Sasuke, out of the way. It seemed that he wasn't the only one who was fighting her, as there was another boy who had his entire body in a thick, purple-like energy in the shape of a gigantic warrior samurai with wings. Quick Naruto. The black-haired boy, Sasuke shot himself out of the warrior and shouted to the blonde, who nodded his head and attacked Kagaya after him. Naruto. It can't be, Hera, who couldn't stop herself from gasping loudly in shock, shot her hands up and covered her mouth in realization. She had recognized the blonde-haired boy long before his friend shouted out his name, which was the only confirmation to her suspicion. Yosh. Let's do this guy. He shouted before in nine puffs of smoke, eight identical clones of himself appeared and stood on thin air, circling around Kagaya with each raising their hands above their heads and creating nine different kind of spinning energy orbs above them, with the same spinning wings of energy that made them look like large shurikens wielded by ninja. Wow. Apollo and Hermes Wolf whistled in amazement at the sight of such techniques, while Ares was crackling in excitement because of the battle that was unfolding before his eye. The Rasengan. Zeus muttered in a EW as he sat back down his throne, his eyes never leaving the young man as he and clones prepared to throw the energy shuriken at Kagaya, I can't believe it. He completed the Rasengan. Senpo. Cho Biju Rosen Shuriken. They shouted and threw all nine Rosen Shuriken at the goddess of rabbit at once, creating a massive explosion that sent her flying. The combined explosion was so powerful that even though they were only watching, the gods and goddesses of Mount Olympus couldn't help but feel as if it was happening right before them, with some even feeling the intense shockwave and energy generating from it. Incredible. Athena said in amazement, so this is the human whose powers matched that of a primordial being. But powerful as he is right now, are you sure that he's just a normal human? Well, you can argue that he's a bit more than just human, even before attaining such power. Poseidon answered with a shrug of his shoulders, watching the fight with interest. He must be a shinobi, but I have never seen one this powerful for so long. Shinobi. Keep your damn voice down, owlhead. This is starting to get good, Ares once again interrupted his sister when another massive warrior formed, this time around a man with silver hair and a mask covering the lower half of his face. Kakashi? Zeus couldn't help but ask in surprise. Zeus. Do you think it is him? Ignoring the silver-haired man. Hera turned to her husband and asked him with the most hopeful tone, Do you think he is really our Naruto? I think he is, but I don't understand why Hirazan told us he was dead. Zeus said, as lightning crackled dangerously around his master bolt, Hirazan has a lot to explain. That is not the case now Zeus. Dot our son is fighting Kagaya Otsutsuki. Hera gritted her teeth and reminded him. It was fortunate that every other Olympian was watching the fight so intensely they did not notice the conversation between them, we have to help him. Before she could stand up, Zeus suddenly put a hand on her shoulder, stopping her. I don't know why but, I think he got this. Zeus said, turning to look at Hera with a look she had not seen since her husband reformed from the death of his human aspect, plus, remember our oath. Going to elemental nations right now will only bring bad luck to Naruto, and that is the last thing he needs at the moment. Hera bit her bottom lips in frustration, wanting nothing more than to argue with her husband and head straight to elemental nations to help Naruto, but deep down, she knew that he was right. God's oath was not something that even they could break so easily. Normally, it would be their children and those who related to them that would have to suffer the consequences, and in a situation like this, bad luck would be the one thing that she did not want to bring to her son. So without any other choice, Hera chose to sit down to her throne and turn back to Iris Rainbow to watch the fight worriedly, praying to the fates that her son and his friends would triumph over Kagaya. And so, for the next several minutes, the Olympians sat on their thrones of powers and watched as Naruto and his teammates fought Kagaya Otsutsuki, who was slowly pushed back by their combined efforts and powers. Eventually, the four, with Naruto and Sasuke being the two main factors, successfully sealed away Kagaya and the giant rabbit monster that she had become by a sealing technique that gathered rocks on the ground to lock her inside an enormous, planet-sized orb of Earth, which then flew slowly to the sky and looks just like a small version of the moon. Interesting technique. Artemis, the goddess of the moon herself, said after seeing the similarity in the new moon Naruto and Sasuke had created to imprison Kagaya and the moon that mortals of their world interpreted her chariot, which was the moon itself. They did it. They defeated Kagaya. Poseidon uttered in shock, awe and admiration. Son. 
Zeus muttered proudly while fixing his gaze on his son, never before had he felt this proud in his immortal life. Then everyone saw Naruto turning back to normal, revealing his normal features as well as his brilliant azure blue eyes just like Zeus. Um, besides the fact that he's kinda hot, am I the only one who thinks that his eyes look a bit, familiar? Aphrodite asked slowly while glancing toward Zeus, who chose to ignore her and everyone else as he kept his eyes on his son, who walked toward the severed arm of Kagaya, making the Olympians finally notice a strange, blob-like shadow with a face and sharp teeth hiding inside the sleeve. URG. What the hell is that? Aphrodite couldn't help but ask in disgust at the sight of such creature. By the way, you didn't want to leave your mom right? Naruto then asked with a slight smirk down toward the dark being inside the sleeve. Why, you? It muttered in shock. You have been hiding in the shadows all this time, but I noticed you. He reached his hand down out and grabbed the arm, picking it up. You're just a part of the shinobi's history I created so far. You are just a brat, you can't. Naruto's eyes hardened before saying firmly, the shinobi's history was made by the lives of many ninja and their deaths. With that said, Naruto then threw it toward the moon along with the arm of Kagaya, a firm look on his face as he shouted after them, a brat who can't even leave his mother's side, won't ever understand a thing about it. Indeed, Athena nodded her head in approval before snapping her head to look at her father, Shinobi. Ninja, father, you have a lot to explain. Zeus looked at his daughter for a moment before sighing longingly and nodding his head to Iris, who made her rainbow disappear before handing the king back his magic crystal and leaving the throne room, allowing the twelve Olympians and Hestia to stay behind and discuss what just happened among themselves. To say that they were all shocked would be an understatement. Hera, wait. Just think about it for a second here. Zeus called as he followed his wife into the palace they shared together. The queen of the gods was in a hurry as she headed into her room and grabbed whatever that she could bring with her, including her peacock cloak and staff, the symbol of her powers. Don't you dare think you can stop me now, Zeus. I am heading there. Hera replied to her husband with a firm tone. I know that you are worried for Naruto, believe me, I do as well, but we just can't stomp into his world and say we're his parents just like that. Zeus frowned, we have an oath to uphold, Hera. You know how ridiculous it sounds when you are the one who said that. Hera asked sarcastically, making Zeus roll his eyes at her, and I don't care. I am heading there and I'm gonna bring Naruto back with me. Then what? You wait for the sticks to finish punishing our son. Zeus asked in a serious tone, calm down and think about it for a moment here, Kashina. We swore to sticks that we would never return to elemental nations, so the moment that we put our foot back on its earth, Styx would turn her attention to Naruto. He might be powerful now, him defeating Kagaya is the clear proof of that, but there are punishments that even one as powerful as a primordial being cannot avoid. Do you want to make his life even more difficult than it already is? You know better than I do what the life of a Jinchuriki is. Do you want our son to suffer even more because of the decision that we made, and will make? But. Hera tried to argue, but once again, she knew that her husband was right. It was rare for him to win an argument of theirs so easily like that. Then what are we going to do now? I can't just leave him there. It has been 17 years already. I think our best course of action now is to send one of the Olympians to come and get him. Maybe two, just to be sure. They are not bound by the oath like we do, so they can travel to elemental nations with no consequences. Zeus told his wife, making Hera nod her head in understanding. They better bring him back to us unscratched. Hera's eyes then turned cold. What about Hirazan? And Tsunade as well as Jiraiya? They lied to us, Zeus. It was Hirazan who told us that our son was dead, and even faked the scene in his mind. I don't know how he did it, but I want an answer. I do as well, Hera. Zeus replied to his wife with a nod of his head. Why are we here again? Artemis, the goddess of the moon and hunt asked while looking around the hall of the Greek gods, patiently waiting for someone to give the answer to her question. Anyone who looked at Artemis could see that the goddess of the hunt did not want to be there, and no one could blame her since none of them wanted to be summoned at this time of the year either, with the only exception being maybe Athena, who was sitting on her throne burying her face in a book in a manner not unlike a hard reader in a library. Around the throne room, every other Olympian was minding their own business. Ares was yawning in boredom as he sat on his throne in the most ungodly manner. At the same time, 
Aphrodite was, just as Artemis had expected, caring only for herself, double-checking and even triple-checking her own looks in a handheld mirror, trying to perfect her already so-called perfect look. At the very least, Artemis appreciated the fact that the goddess of love was not trying to bother her again, something that she had been doing a lot recently much to her annoyance. Hephaestus, meanwhile, was tickling with the machines on his lap, trying to put together or invent a new mechanical item that Artemis did not recognize. Dionysus, meanwhile, was reading a wine magazine while drinking from a can of coke, looking quite miserable and more drunk than he normally had been before the punishment their father had put on him. Demeter was ranting again about how good cereals were again to their health even if they were gods to anyone who was bothering enough to listen to her, which in this case was none other than the goddess of the hearth, Hestia, everyone's most favorite auntie. Her childish brother was, just as Artemis had expected, engaging his brother in arm in more things than just blood and best friend Hermes about the women that they met in their immortal life, which disgusted her to no end. Poseidon, on the other hand, was sitting by himself and twirling his trident around in his hand, probably thinking about the Atlantic and his people. Surprisingly enough, Hades had also been summoned to the meeting, and the god of the underworld was currently sitting on his throne-like chair, looking quite laid back with his hands behind his head. She had no reason to not like her uncle, but his presence on Olympus outside of winter solstice meeting had always meant that something big was going on and they needed every god of the Olympian council to present. Yo, Arty, do not call me that, brother. Apollo's face instantly lost its color when a knife flew past his head, missing his cheek by only an inch and stabbing into the backrest of his throne. Artemis, please try not to murder your brother here. Poseidon spoke with an amused chuckle. It was him who had changed the trajectory of the knife in the air and saved Apollo the trouble of having to use his own power on himself. I will keep your suggestion in mind, uncle, but no promise. Artemis said with a smile to the king of the sea, as she retrieved her knife with a wave of her hand. And how can I help you, brother? Do you know why we are all here? Didn't I just ask the same question? Artemis responded with her own question, but Apollo simply shrugged his shoulders at her in response. I am also in the dark just like you, brother. Artemis answered, thinking about her huntress. She had no doubt that her lieutenant Zoe would keep everything in order for her while she was gone, but she was worried that monsters might attack them where they were camping while she was away. The monsters had been a whole lot more active recently, and it was in their duty to find out the reason. Artemis opened her mouth to speak, but her father beat her to it as he arrived in the throne room as dramatically as ever in a bolt of lightning. Standing beside him was none other than his wife, the queen of the Greek gods who had a strange look of worries on her face. The beauty that could even rival Aphrodite herself was totally in ruin. Her hair was a mess and her white dress was messy and taken carelessly. It was Artemis' first time seeing the queen like that. She respected the queen, but she did not like her either for the mistreatment she and her brother had had to deal with since the moment that Zeus could not keep it in his pants and wooed their mother. Whoa! What happened? Aphrodite could not help but ask, looking away from her mirror for the first time, you're a mess, Hera. But the normally short-tempered goddess chose to not say anything in response, simply ignoring the goddess of love as she walked to her throne and sat down. Want me to help you fix your look? No. All right then. The goddess of love waved a hand at Hera dismissively, looking as uncared as ever but Artemis could see that Aphrodite was somewhat nervous by the tone that the queen had just spoke to her. Go back to your seats, everyone. Let us start this emergency meeting. Zeus spoke up, tapping his lightning bolt lightly on the floor of the throne room after clearing his throat. He waited until everyone had settled down on their seats, and Ares had woken up to begin. Now, let's discuss the most important matter at hand. It's about the boy we saw last night fighting the primordial being Kagaya Otsutsuki, Naruto Uzumaki. Fishcake Spiral Apollo asked, raising an eyebrow in wonder before grinning broadly and nudging Hermes with his right elbow, hey, sounds like him and I are gonna be good friends. What about him? Ares asked with another yawn. Before we begin, Ares, you should know that. He is your little brother. Hera interrupted her husband, speaking up for the first time and made Ares along with the rest of the Olympian council gasp in surprise. However, it was for a different reason. Man, not again. Apollo groaned, throwing his hands in the air in defeat. Wow. Talk about keeping an oath. Aphrodite giggled playfully in amusement. 
I am not surprised. Hades spoke as he glared at his brother. Brother. Poseidon bellowed as he shot up from his seat and stood facing his youngest brother with power radiating from not just his trident, but also his whole body. You broke the oath twice. Explain yourself. Wanna say anything before I send some underworld folks after him, wherever he is, little brother? Hades asked absently. He was a lot less surprised and angry than he thought he would be. Maybe he had just already seen it coming. He defeated a primordial being, as if those monsters from the underworld are gonna give him trouble. Demeter reasonably pointed out, making Hades shrug his shoulders. Won't stop me from trying though. That boy is a threat for not just being a potential child of prophecy, but for the unimagined power that he poses. It is just like you said, sister, he defeated a primordial being. Is it not already worrisome enough? Hades reminded them all, whether you like it or not, he cannot be kept alive. We gotta do something about it. He's also my son, right? Then that make him even more worry, what? Hades nodded his head in understanding, before widening his eyes in shock at what he had just heard and gasped, looking at Hera as she sat on her throne and tapped her foot on the floor rather impatiently. So you are saying, he's fully my brother? Hephaestus asked, looking at Ares and then back at his mother, our brother? Yes, he is, Hephaestus. Hera answered with a sigh, before glancing over to Zeus and giving him a meaningful look, as if urging him to be quick. Ahem. Allow me to tell you a story, kinda unnecessary dramatic, father. Ignoring Apollo's remark, Zeus began to tell them all the story, the story of elemental nations and how it all began, from the day that Kagaya ate the fruit of the world tree, originally the Jubi itself, whose power was far more terrifying than anything that they all could ever imagine, and attained otherworldly godhood. She then gave birth to two sons, who defeated their mother for the tyrant that she had become. Hagoromo, the younger son, later became the creator of shinobi and their arts, ninjutsu, which led to the creation of the ninja world and the great nations of shinobi. He then told them about the many wars between ninjas, starting with the first, then the second and the third, eventually leading to the births of many shinobi villages, by uniting clans of ninja together. Then he told them about his short but eventful journey there with Hera with the help of the Fates and Hecate, how they had become Minato Namikaze and Kashina Uzumaki, who both grew up in Konoha and lived their life as shinobi of the villages before marrying each other, giving birth to a son whose name was Naruto. It was then that he began to tell them what had happened the night that their mortal self died. Even though Zeus had tried his best, the story was still incredibly hard for him to tell because it was not something he nor his wife wished to ever relive again. He thought he had lost a great son that night, but it turned out that the boy was still alive and grew up to be an amazing young man, and a powerful shinobi. In the end, no one dared to say a word, not even Ares. As much as Artemis wished to deny it, she was in shock. It would be much easier for me to summon Nemozine and have her show you all our memories, but it will take a lot of time to watch. Zeus then said after finishing the story, but we need to talk about the reason that I have summoned I call you here. You wish to bring Naruto Uzumaki here, don't you, father? Athena asked, having come to the conclusion the moment that she found out who Naruto was. She was also the first member of the Olympian Council to collect her composure, as the rest was still trying to process all the information that they had just been given, too shocked to even say a word. You are correct, Athena. We swore to the sticks the night our mortal selves died that we would never return to elemental nations, so we need one of you to go there and retrieve Naruto for us. Zeus spoke to Athena, making the goddess of wisdom nod her head in understanding, having expected as much. Allow me to go, father, Ares shot up from his seat and volunteered instantly with a bloodthirsty grin, I shall bring little brother Naruto back to Olympus. In one piece, I think not, Hermes pointed out while Apollo snorted and I am not talking about him. You think I will lose to him? Duh. Apollo and Hermes spoke at the same time, after looking at each other. How about you allow me to go? Artemis was not surprised to see Aphrodite then volunteering herself, raising her hand in the air and speaking in a sing-song voice, I am good with people, so why don't you let me bring Naruto here? I am sure that he can use a guide like me. I think we can both go also. Apollo said, with Hermes nodding his head in agreement, who can bring Naruto back to our world faster than the fastest duo of Olympus. He asked dramatically, 
his whole body glowing like the sun, making Artemis cover her eyes with a hand as he got up and high-fived Hermes. While I am very glad that there are so many volunteers, Zeus said, while Hera could shake her head while looking around the throne room in slight disappointment and annoyance. It appeared that no one wanted to bring Naruto to Olympus because it was his rightful home, and it was something she had fully expected before going to the meeting. But last night, Hera and I had decided the most suitable choices for this mission. Athena and Artemis, please come forward. Uh, what? was all Artemis could utter in surprise when her father called for her name. Fair enough. The goddess of wisdom, on the other hand, nodded her head, closing the book on her lap and stood up from her seat, having fully expected her father to choose her and her sister. She had nothing against it, and not to mention that it would be a great opportunity for her to see elemental nations with her own eyes. Father, may I know why you have chosen me for the job? Artemis decided to ask while looking at her father. Artemis, you are my best tracker. Elemental Nations is a massive world. It's far larger than ours. Hera and I can teleport you to Konoha, but we need you to help your sister track down Naruto and bring him back as soon as possible, just in case he's not in the village and has gone off on a mission somewhere else. He's a shinobi. My decision is final, Artemis. Zeus spoke up before Artemis could open her mouth to speak anything again, making her blow a strand of her auburn hair away from her face in annoyance. If you're worried about your hunters, send them to Camp Half-Blood and have them stay there for the time being. Make haste, you too. If there is nothing more to talk about, then this council is dismissed. With that announcement from the king, most of the Olympians got up from their seats, with Hades and Poseidon bidding a quick apology for their youngest brother for flipping out at him earlier before teleporting away. A few, however, continued to remain. I will go make the preparation. I will meet with you later, sister. Athena spoke to Artemis before flashing away herself, leaving Artemis to be the only one left in the throne room besides Zeus and Hera. Strapping her hunting knife into its holster, the goddess of the hunt then stood up and walked toward her father, but to her surprise she was stopped by none other than Hera, who grabbed her hands and spoke to her with a pleading look in her eyes. Artemis, please bring Naruto back to me as soon as you can. Hera spoke making Artemis widen her eyes. I know after everything I have done to you, your brother, and your mother, I do not deserve to ask you anything, but please, please bring my son back to Olympus. Artemis became puzzled. On one hand, she wanted to ignore the queen and walk to her father to reason to him that there were obviously better choices for the mission he had given her and Athena, but on the other, she wanted nothing more than to help this woman, realizing that under all that bitterness that she always took out on those around her, she was still a mother, a mother who loved her son, her children dearly. She knew how special Naruto could be to her. She was no goddess of love like Aphrodite, something that she was thankful for, but she knew that Naruto was not just her son. He was the proof of her love for Zeus, the husband who had cheated on her so many times just because that he could. All right, Hera, Artemis spoke finally after making up her mind, squeezing her hands around the queen's as she looked straight into her eyes. I promise to bring your son back to you. Break with a sad look on his face, Naruto put on his black attire, standing in front of the mirror in his room. A week had passed since the end of the Fourth Great Shinobi War, yet, villagers and shinobi all around the world were still burying their beloved fallen comrades, friends, fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, sons, in grief. Thousands of shinobi had lost their lives in the war. Some Naruto knew but many others, he hated himself for not at least knowing their names. Everyone would be there for the funerals, even Sasuke. Standing beside his friends and comrades, Naruto remained silent as he looked at the new names that had been carved on the stone. He did not know what to say, and could only stand there with a bunch of flowers in hands, each flower was for each shinobi of Konoha who had fallen down on the battlefield. But after the rain, the sun would once again rise. A new day had started. A new beginning. What? What do you mean I cannot become the Hokage just yet? Naruto asked in surprise with a dramatic look on his face, one hand holding his head. The other one would have been used to do the same thing, but it was no longer there, having been blown up during the final clash in his battle against Sasuke. Keep your damn voice down, brat. It is still way too early in the morning for you to shout. Tsunade scoffed in annoyance as she glared at Naruto 
while her assistant Shizun could only laugh softly in nervousness while standing behind her and watching the argument between the fifth and Naruto, and my decision is final. Kakashi Hataki will be the Rokudime Hokage of Konoha. You can work to earn your seat next time. EHH. But why not me? He groaned, standing next to him was Kakashi, who was giving Naruto his trademark eyes smile while holding his shoulder comfortingly, I thought after the war. Yes, you are the hero of the shinobi world now, Naruto. Many people will think that you deserve to become Hokage more than anyone in this village. Tsunade spoke as she got up and walked around the table to reach her godson. But you're still way too young for the seat and the hat, to handle the tremendous responsibility of it. I am giving you time to be ready for it, Naruto, not just physically but mentally as well. Saying that, Tsunade then pulled out a bottle of sake from under her jacket, shocking Shizune as she was sure that she had thrown them all away. Now, let's just go to have a drink to celebrate the day I finally escape from this job. With that said, Tsunade wrapped her free arm around Naruto's neck and pulled him out of the room using her ridiculous strength, with Kakashi and Shizun following closely behind them. The whole way, Naruto tried to reason with the blonde woman, but the moment that they arrived at the street of Konoha, the cheer of the villagers caused Naruto to stop, leaving him standing there in surprise. Well, you might not be the Hokage yet, Naruto. Kakashi said as he walked over to his student and spoke to him warmly, but isn't this almost all but only thing that you have ever wanted? Naruto could only nod his head slowly in response as he looked around, finding himself experiencing the same feeling he had had after Kakashi brought him back to Konoha after he had defeated Pain and confronted Nagato. Once again, they had called him their hero. Break. You are drinking too little, brat. Here, drink some more. Tsunade spoke excitedly as she tried to make Naruto drink another bottle of sake giving him no choice but to try to push it away. It was three in the afternoon and he had already been forced to drink his seventh bottle. At the same time, they weren't the only ones currently celebrating in the restaurant. All of his friends were there with them, including even Sasuke himself who had just been released from prison after much efforts from Tsunade and Naruto to convince everyone that he was no longer a threat. Regardless, because they had shown up, Tsunade had invited them to join the celebration with her. Choji was screaming at Lee for eating his last piece of barbecue, but instantly livened up when Ino, who knew her teammate far too well, brought a brand new dish of barbecue to him. Can I sit here? Naruto asked, after managing to shrug off Tsunade and leave the table to walk over to his so-called best friend, who was sitting all by himself at his own table. Sure. The last Uchiha answered simply. How is your arm? Naruto then asked after sitting down. The same as yours. Once again, Sasuke gave Naruto a short answer. Ba-chan told me she was making prosthetic hands for us from the cells of the first Hokage. Naruto informed him, she is still working on it, but we will have both of our arms back soon. I don't think I'm going to stay in this village till then, Sasuke said, surprised Naruto. Hey, don't tell me you're thinking about becoming a missing nin again. He said, looking at Sakura who he knew had been sneaking glances at Sasuke for the past few minutes. There are people who won't accept it if you are just gonna leave again, you know. I need to find my own path, Naruto. Not to mention it will be better for us all. I don't hang out around the village often. Sasuke answered before he decided to ask, what about you? What are you going to do now? At that, both young men turned their head to the Hokage monument where a new face was being carved onto it. I am going to train and study harder. My dream is to become the Hokage, and that hasn't changed, Naruto said with a determined expression on his face. I see. Pouring some sake into an empty cup, Sasuke then pushed it toward his blonde-haired friend before picking up his own cup and holding it out toward him. So, for the non-aidime Hokage. Yeah, for me. Naruto grinned. At the same time training ground 44, the forest of death. A bolt of lightning then shot down from the sky and struck an empty spoke between trees. From there, three women emerged, the first being none other than the virgin goddess of the hunt and moon herself, Artemis, dressed in a white shirt, silver jackets and black jeans to go with black combat boots. On her back was a quiver filled with silver arrows emitting a moonlight glow while in her hand was a beautiful silver bow that was radiating a tremendous amount of raw power. Is this the place? Artemis asked, looking at her older sister who was looking around in wonder. 
Standing beside them both was a girl who was dressed in almost the same outfit as Artemis did, with the only exception being the camo pants. She was also a tall, graceful and gorgeously beautiful young woman with dark brown eyes, a slightly upturned nose and copper-colored skin. I think we are. Athena finally answered, nodding her head to her sister. What nature? Zoe, the lieutenant of the hunt of Artemis, spoke in amazement while looking around, this forest, it's breathtaking. Artemis could only nod her head to her lieutenant and best friend in agreement while looking around the place herself. Being the goddess of wildlife, she had a powerful connection to the nature around her, and she could feel a very powerful natural energy within the forest, reminding her of earth before mortals invented machines and started cutting down trees for their own profits. Sister, are we close to Konoha? I believe we are actually inside Konoha. This must be the forest training ground that father mentioned. Athena spoke as she walked around ahead of both Artemis and her hunter and brought out from her back pocket a map of Konoha, which her father had given to her before teleporting them to the place. It seems we need to go this way to get to the village. From there, we can look for father and Lady Hera's old home, where Naruto Uzumaki lives. Very well. Artemis said, and together, the three of them headed out of the Forest of Death, with Athena having no trouble keeping up with two incredibly agile hunters who had spent thousands of years fighting in the wild, being the goddess of war herself. During their journey, they had an unpleasant encounter with a giant centipede but it was quickly shot down by Artemis and Zoe before it could do anything. On the other hand, they also had many pleasant meetings with the animals of the forest, which all had incredible sizes. Artemis, the goddess of wildlife, did not have much trouble befriending them and asking them for directions, which they were more than willing to provide after finding out who she was. When the village came into view, Athena stopped them and spoke up. From here, we should be a bit careful. I know that you two are more than capable of taking care of yourselves, but we must try to stay away from troubles as much as possible, especially unwanted encounters with the shinobi. Some of them can do feats that even the strongest demigods could not hope to compare. Let's keep to the shadows then. With that said, Artemis, Zoe and Athena entered the village, using alleys and corners to hide from attention while traversing the street of Konoha, skillfully avoiding the eyes of the mortal villagers. As soon as they stepped into the village, the group of goddesses and huntress got a lot of attention from the villagers because it wasn't every day they got women as beautiful as they are walking in the village. However, when they were deciding the best way to cross a street to reach Namikaze residence, Zoe and Artemis spoke up at the same time as they felt presence approaching them at rapid pace from above. We got companies. They all spun around, and saw a ninja wearing a bird mask appearing in front of them, with two more accompanying him from behind. With the exceptions of the masks, they all wore a type of uniform, which consisted of black clothing, a gray flak jacket, metal arm guards and gloves, ninja sandals with spike, three ninja pouches on their back waist, a signature spiral tattoo on their shoulder and sword on their back. Who are you and what is your intention? The bird mask shinobi, an anbu, asked in a dead serious tone. Let me handle this. Athena stepped forward and spoke calmly, holding up both of her hands. Greetings. My name is Athena. My name is Athena and this is Artemis and Zoe Nightshade. We're friends of Minato Namikaze and Kashina Uzumaki, your Yandaimi Hokage and his wife. The Anbu captain's eyes widened behind his mask at the introduction, but visibly he made no bodily reaction to show them what he was feeling. At the same time, he could tell that the woman was not lying. Our superiors will decide if you're speaking the truth or not, calmly, he replied to them, if you do not mind, please follow us peacefully. We will escort you to the ones in charge. Very well then. Athena turned to the two eternal maidens and translated everything she had just said to them having been speaking to them in their languages, which he had been learning, he wants us to come with him. Artemis nodded her head in understanding and removed her quiver from her back, making Zoe do the same, the both of them understanding very well that they would have to give their weapons to secure some trust from the other party. It was standard procedure anywhere and not just their world, not to mention that they could retrieve their gears any time with just a snap of their fingers. But before she could give her weapons to Athena so that her sister could hand them to the shinobi, a glint of yellow caught her attention, causing Artemis to snap her head up and look at the house on her right. Time seemed to slow down around Artemis as she focused her sight on that yellow blur, having no trouble keeping up with it and fully seeing it as Naruto Uzumaki, 
who was jumping from rooftop to rooftop at the speed and grace that surpassed even some of her best huntresses. Artemis wait. Athena called when suddenly the goddess of the hunt turned around and leapt into the air, launching herself so high up the Anbu was left gasping in surprise. Transforming into an eagle, Artemis then flew forward until she was ahead of Naruto and transformed to drop down right in front of him, causing the blonde to gasp in surprise and stop himself, tripping on his feet and falling down on his ass before incredibly beautiful auburn-haired woman that suddenly appeared in front of him. Found you, Naruto Uzumaki. Artemis said. Wa, who are you? Was the only logical question that Naruto could ask in response as he gazed up at Atomus. Artemis. Oh no, Kurama thought inside of Naruto's mindscape, knowing well who this woman was from Naruto's mother. Oh right, I cannot understand what you are saying. Artemis said, hitting herself mentally for not giving enough effort in learning his language before leaving. Uh, sorry, but I cannot understand what you are saying. Naruto spoke to her while silently reaching behind his back to pull out a kanai at the ready. Anyone who could suddenly appear out of nowhere in such a manner could be quite dangerous. Uh, Naruto, I sagely advise you to keep your weapon holstered in front of this woman, and try not to piss her off, okay? Huh, why? You know her Kurama. Naruto could not help but ask his biju companion, looking at the gigantic Nine Tails fox in his mindscape. Her name is Artemis. I can reassure you that she's friendly and quite reasonable to talk to so long as you do not rub her the wrong way, as she has some problems with the opposite gender. What does that even mean? She doesn't trust men. Ah, why didn't you just say so? Naruto scoffed in amusement at Kurama, making the fully merged nine-tailed fox roll his eyes at him before turning his attention back to the auburn-haired woman standing before him. Standing up, Naruto pointed a finger at her making her look at him disapprovingly, before saying, Artemis. How do you, before the goddess of the hunt could finish asking how he would know her name, even though Hera had told her and Athena that he did not have any knowledge about them, Naruto pointed at himself. Naruto, Naruto pointed to himself, Naruto Uzumaki. I know who you are, boy. TCH, where is Apollo when you need him? Artemis clicked her tongue in annoyance, making Naruto mistake it for a gesture that was directed at him and step back in caution. Before either of them could say anything, they heard voices. Artemis. Hold it right there. Instantly, Artemis spun around and notched an arrow, holding her bow up and aiming it at the Anbu who had shot down behind her, aiming at his forehead. Do not, sneak up behind me, boy. Artemis warned in a firm tone, pulling the string of her bow back and making it glow with her divine power. Before she could say anything, a whole group of Anbu then appeared around her and Naruto, looking alarmingly at the auburn-haired woman who did not look worried as she glanced around before seeing Athena coming toward her with Zoe, the two of them being chased by a team of shinobi, using Aegis to knock away the throwing weapons that were thrown at them as warnings. Whoa whoa whoa, easy there, you guys, Naruto called out as he stepped forward, pushing Artemis back with his hand just as Athena and Zoe arrived at Artemis' side with the lieutenant huntress immediately backing her mistress up with her own bow and arrows. Everyone, calm down. Naruto-san, these women, they. Naruto Uzumaki, we are friends with your parents. Before the Anbu leader could inform Naruto of the situation, Athena spoke hurriedly to the blonde in his language, making him widen his eyes in surprise and immediately turn his head to look at her. At the same time, still with Artemis aiming her arrow at his forehead, the Anbu leader held up his hand and made a signal for his squad to lower their weapons, but at the same time keeping their guard up. You know my parents? He asked. It's not strange for people to claim to know his parents, now that the truth about him being the son of the fourth Hokage and his wife, Kashina Uzumaki, one of the former last surviving member of the Uzumaki clan had gotten out, but he could not help but feel that there were more to her claim that meet the eyes. What do you mean when you say you know my parents? Who are you? The blonde continued to ask. Before answering his question, Athena looked firmly at Artemis, who narrowed her eyes at the Anbu around her before lowering her weapon along with Zoe, causing her bow to stop glowing. My name is Athena, Naruto, we are here to bring you back to your parents. The truth is that they are still alive. Athena answered him, shocking everyone standing in the area, and Artemis and I, we are your sisters. Hey Naruto, don't take it too seriously but your sisters are freaking hot. Be nice, Kiba. 
Naruto scoffed lightly and spoke to Kiba with a roll of his eyes, but it only made the smile on his face get wider. As much as he had his doubts just like everyone else, it would be an understatement to say that Kiba had been shocked to learn that the two out of the three incredibly beautiful and attractive girls currently standing only a few feet in front of them had claimed themselves to be the sisters of the hero of the shinobi world. Though, nothing could surprise him more than the claim that Minato Namikaze, the fourth Hokage of Konoha, and his wife Kashina Uzumaki were both still alive. And they are not my sisters, but even if they are really not, they are still hot. Woof. The two young shinobi then turned their head when they heard a playful bark, and both found themselves widening their eyes in surprise when they saw Akamaru nodding his head to the auburn-haired girl, who appeared to be conversing with him in a casual manner in her language. Is she, talking to Akamaru? Kiba asked in shock before looking at Artemis, who reached a hand out and petted Akamaru softly on his head. Hold on a second there, you can, really, real talk to dogs? Naruto asked in disbelief with his and Kiba's eyes widening as wide as dinner plates, despite having been told that Athena was the only one who could understand their language. Um, what is she saying? Naruto looked at Athena and asked her after hearing Artemis spoke something more to Akamaru, making the black-haired woman then turn her attention away from Tsunade for a moment to answer him. She said his dog appeared to be smarter than him. Adan said, making Kiba drop his jaws in shock. And yes, Artemis can talk to dog, but her power does not just limit to carnies. She can talk to all kinds of wildlife. Seriously. Naruto said, looking at Artemis as she kneeled down to stroke Akamaru's fur with Zoe, who gave Naruto the impression that she adored the Ninkan far more than she liked anyone else in the room, or at the very least, the boys. My apology, Tsunade-san, Athena continued as she turned her attention back to Tsunade who continued to give the woman a puzzled look from behind her desk, as I was saying. My name is Athena, and these two here are my sister Artemis and her lieutenant, Zoe Nightshades. We are Naruto Uzumaki's sisters, and here to bring him to his parents, who are both alive. That, I must admit, is a lot to take in, Athena-san. Tsunade shook her head and said, glancing over to Naruto who only gave her a shrug of his shoulders, looking just as disbelieving as everyone in the room. Minato Namikaze and his wife Kashina Uzumaki were two of the most beloved shinobi and kunoichi of this village, of our life. For you to suddenly appear from nowhere and make claims that they are still alive like that, I am very sorry but, it is very hard to believe. Understandable, Tsunade-san. However, I believe that there is someone who can justify my claim. Athena nodded her head in understanding, before she turned slightly to the side to look at Naruto who crossed his arms on his chest in wonder as everyone else in the room turned their attention to him. Naruto, can you ask the Kayubi, or Kurama, I believe that is his name. You know, yes, your mother told me. Athena nodded her head in confirmation, making Naruto look at her for a second before closing his slightly opening mouth in surprise to move his consciousness into his mindscape, finding himself standing before Kurama who was also scratching his chin in wonder. So, are they telling the truth, Kurama? Unfortunately, she is telling the truth, Kayubi told Naruto, your parents are alive and well. What? He asked in shock, both at the outside and inside world. How can that be possible? And why didn't you tell me if you have known this the whole time? I wanted to, but I also wanted to give you some time to collect yourself after the war. I figured a few weeks after the funeral would be a good time. Kurama answered, making Naruto widen his eyes slightly before calming down finding his reason to be reasonable as he could still remember, and for your information, the knowledge and memories that I had about your parents just happened to be split to the other me. It was only after fusing with him that I remembered that your parents were really alive. I, I see, Naruto nodded his head in understanding at Kurama before returning to the real world, looking at Athena to ask her, so my parents are alive. How were they alive again? Because they are not humans, or in our terms, mortals. Naruto, your parents are the king and queen of the Greek gods. Athena answered, and her words made everyone in the room gasp and widen their eyes in shock, with no one more so than Naruto himself, who could not stop looking at Athena as if she had just grown a second head instead of dropping that piece of information on him. Of all the answer that she could give him, Minato and Keisahina being gods was the last thing that they could think of. About 40 years ago, 
Your parents came to this world to rekindle their marriage and start everything over not as gods, but as mortals. With the help of the fates and Hecate, the goddess of magic from our world, they created mortal, artificial bodies for themselves and blent in in this world. Athena explained, and she raised her hand to create a projection of the king and queen of the Greek gods in the room, each standing alongside their mortal selves who then joined with them to create a singular being in a bright flash of light. The display left Naruto and everyone completely speechless, even though it was far from the most impressive thing that they had ever seen and also did not prove anything. Our father, Zeus, the king of the Greek gods and the Olympians god of lightning and skies, became the man that you hear all addressed as the Yandaimi Hokage, Minato Namikaze. Meanwhile, his wife Hera, the Olympian goddess of family and marriage became Kashina Uzumaki. After that, Athena made the projection she created disappear, remaining silent with her sister in order to give the mortals time to take it all in, as no one knew what to say about what they had just heard and witnessed. Kurama. Naruto whispered. Yes, Naruto. As hard to believe as it is, everything she just said to you was the truth. The orange-tailed beast answered with a solemn nod of his head, making Naruto look down. I, I need a moment. Naruto said with his hands reaching out to stop Kiba and Shino when the two tried to help him as he stumbled back, at the same time giving Hanada a weak smile when she tried to do the same. I know it's incredibly hard for you to believe it, Naruto, but I swear it on the sticks that I am telling the truth. And in that moment, the sky rumbled, causing the shinobi to widen their eyes in shock. And if you need further proof. With that said, Athena raised a hand and summoned a bronze spear, causing the Anbu to instantly appear around her, with Naruto and teammate becoming alerted at the sight of the weapon. But the black-haired woman did not use it to attack any of them, and instead turned the spear to the palm of her other hand as she held it out for all to see. You see, Naruto, you are immortal because you were born from the mortal selves of your parents. Athena then pressed the blade of her spear down her palm and slid it back a little to make a shallow cut but I was born a goddess, and as a deity, my blood is not the same as yours. With that said, Athena raised her hand and showed them her palm, showing them the cut where a glowing, golden liquid was trickling down much to the shock of the shinobi in the room. This is Ikor, the blood of a god, and I am the goddess of wisdom and war. After a moment, the cut suddenly healed itself and Athena simply wiped her Ikor away with a handkerchief, which she had magically summoned after making the spear disappear. Artemis is goddess of the moon, hunt, maiden and wilderness. The goddess of wisdom then continued her introduction, and to show them the proof that she was indeed what she had been introduced as, Artemis caused the sky to turn dark and the moon to appear, glowing brighter than anyone had ever seen in their life for a brief moment. However, those few seconds of the darkened sky and the full moon right in the middle of the day was far more than enough to cause the villagers of Konoha to look up in confusion, but only the shinobi and Kunoichi inside the Hokage office knew what was happening. Even so, they could stop themselves from gasping like fishes on water. Kurinai, who was acknowledged as one of the best genjutsu users in the village, could tell that what they had just seen was no illusion, even though it had happened too fast for her to collect herself and try to dispel it. A bit too far, sister, and unnecessary. These ninjas have techniques that allow them to create illusions like that, so you can't convince them by showing them your powers in such a manner. Athena spoke to Artemis, who simply shrugged her shoulders in response before she turned back to Naruto to speak to him. And if you still need further proof, I believe someone other than Kurama holds the answers to every question that you have. With that said, Athena then looked at Tsunade who was still trying to collect herself and comprehend what happened, and spoke to her. If it's possible, Tsunade-san, I would like to talk to this man whose name is Hirazan Serutobi. I believe he is your teacher, and predecessor. You are, correct, Athena-sama, but unfortunately, after a moment of silence, Tsunade finally spoke up, in a more respectful tone than she had before, showing everyone that she had accepted the fact that the two women standing in front of her were indeed goddesses, Serutobi-sensei passed away two years ago. He was killed by another student of his during an invasion against our village. What about Jiraiya? Zu? Minato's sensei? Aten asked, but it was Naruto who answered. He died also. The blonde said in a low tone, and that was enough for Athena to know that she had mentioned someone that Naruto held dearly. I see so everyone who might hold the answers to your questions are gone. Sadly, 
Those are the only people that Minato and Kashina trust with their secrets. Athena said with a small sigh before turning to Naruto to explain to speak to him. A couple of weeks ago, you fought against this, Kagaya Otsutsuki, correct? Yeah. Naruto nodded his head. What about her? Well, your father had magical measures set up to alarm us of individuals who might have the strength to overthrow Olympus, where we're from. Athena answered. And a few weeks ago, your fight against Kagaya has released so much power that it could be felt across all realms, and set off our alarm. We tried to locate the source, and we saw you fighting Kagaya. That was how your parents found out that you were alive, Naruto. Wait. What do you mean that they found out that I was alive? Naruto asked with an arching eyebrow. I still don't know the full story, but they believed that you were dead. They were both in so much grief that they refused to return to this realm after that night, the night that their mortal selves died. Athena answered, making Naruto widen his eyes in shock. Us gods cannot die, but when we were slain in battles, we entered a static state and returned some time later. It could be days, months, or even hours in the case of your parents. When they returned, they tried to look for you, to bring you to Olympus to live with them. Athena said, and then looked over to Tsunade to continue, but they were told that you did not survive and died. It was Hiruzen Serutobi who told them that Naruto Uzumaki was dead. The statement caused Tsunade to become completely speechless, and was unable to do anything but look back at the goddess standing before her with shock-filled eyes. Your mother searched his mind to see if he was telling the truth or not. Athena then continued, and he did. I don't know how he tricked her, but he did. So, you're telling me that he lied to them, and he lied to me about my parents. Naruto asked Athena in disbelief, his voice trembling a little. He did not want to believe it, and was forcing himself to. But he knew, deep down inside, she was telling the truth. I will assume nothing, Naruto. You are going to have to figure out a way to discover the truth yourself. Athena said in a calm tone. However, you can trust that every word that came out of my mouth is the truth, or at the very least, what I know. I did not make anything up, and I did not lie to you about what I know. I swear it on the sticks, Naruto. And once again, the sky rumbled and Naruto could no longer stop himself from asking about it. What kind of swearing is that? The river Styx is a sacred river that separates the land of the living from the realm of the dead located in the underworld. Oaths made by this river bring forth something, worse than death, to the oath-bearer if not fulfilled. Athena explained it to him, causing Naruto to widen his eyes in surprise. Oh, all right. Naruto nodded his head in understanding before he continued, you don't have to go that far to prove that you are telling the truth but still, I guess I appreciate it. Thank you, brother. Too soon for that. Naruto immediately spoke up to stop her, we didn't know that for sure yet. Fair. Athena nodded her head to him with an acknowledging smile before she decided to ask, and it also happened to be the question that everyone was having in their mind, so what are you going to do now? I, uh, I guess I need some time, you know. It just, a lot to take it. Naruto said with a weak smile, this is not how I thought my day was going to be when I woke up this morning. Hey man. Same here. If you need any help with this, feel free to ask any of us. We will be happy to help. Kiba reached out and grabbed his shoulder comfortingly, making Naruto smile at him in appreciation before doing the same to Shino and Kiba, who nodded their heads to him alongside Kurenai. Please, take as much time as you want. We are in no rush. Athena said to him, before turning back to Tsunade to ask, Tsunade san, would it be possible for you to arrange us a place to stay in your village for the time being? That night, Naruto sat on top of his father's head at the Hokage Monument, looking at the village below while thinking about all that had been said to him earlier on that day. From where he was, he could see the inn where Athena, Artemis and Zoe were staying, and wondered what they were doing there. Because they were not allowed to leave the inn unless absolutely necessary, Athena had requested a bunch of books to read, but Artemis and Zoe did not strike him as someone who could stay still in one place for too long and be happy about it. So you're here. Naruto. A familiar voice spoke up from behind him, making Naruto turn around to look, not feeling surprised in the slightest when he saw Sasuke walking toward him. I heard the story from the Godem. Sakura and everyone are worried about you. Naruto only replied to him with a shrug of his shoulders as Sasuke walked up and sat down next to him. 
Remember our first fight at the Valley of the End? Sasuke asked. The fight you literally shoved your whole arm through my chest. Yeah, I remember that. Naruto nodded his head, there was a long moment of silence before both of them broke out in chuckles. Very funny, but. Dot you remember what I screamed at you? About our parents? Yeah, at that time I didn't even know who they were. Naruto said as he stretched his legs out and leaned back a little. I thought they were killed during Kurama's attack on the village or maybe they left me. But it turned out your dad was the Yandaimi Hokage and your mom is a very skilled Kunoichi. Sasuke nodded, pausing for a moment before continuing with a very small smile, and now, it has turned out that they might be even more than that. The king and the queen of the Greek gods, huh? Naruto said and looked up, finally noticing for the first time that night that the moon was larger and brighter for some reason. Although it did not take long for the blonde to figure out that it might have something to do with a certain goddess of the moon who was staying in the village, if she really was who she claimed to be. Anyway, Godem-sama also told me about the Sandame. It doesn't matter anymore, Sasuke. Naruto shook his head and interrupted his friend, stopping him because he could finish it. He's dead, even if I want to ask him why he told my parents that I was dead that night, we couldn't. Who said we couldn't? Sasuke asked causing Naruto to snap his head over to look at him. And it was only at that moment that Naruto thought about the idea. But didn't that snake face disappear shortly after the war ended? He asked, and they both knew who was referring to, can we find him? Which snake face are you talking about? Orochimaru or Kabuto? Who is more likely to help us? It might take time to find him. Sasuke pointed out, but we can start looking tomorrow. I know a few places that he can be. We might be able to find something there. But what about the sacrifice? Naruto then asked, remembering the requirements for that certain technique to be possible, I'm not going to let him kill another person just to summon Oji-chan back so I can ask him a few question. Don't worry, we will both make sure that will not happen. That night Naruto couldn't sleep, his mind filled with so much thoughts that it kept his eyes from closing and rest. He just laid there and stared at the ceiling and the next things he knew, it was 4 o'clock in the morning. It wasn't like he could get any sleep anyway so Naruto put on his shirt, a little hard because he was getting familiar with working with one hand only but he Naruto still managed to put both of his feet into his pants and tied the kanai porch around his legs, with another shuriken porch on behind him on his belt. Tying the Konoha's forehead protector at the back of his head, Naruto walked to the door of his apartment and walked outside, heading to training ground number three to have a morning workouts. It didn't take long for Naruto to arrive at the memorable place, the training ground where Team 7 was formed and the place Kakashi taught them the first lesson, one of the most important rules of his life. Those who break the rules are scum, but those who abandon their friends are worse than scum. The training ground held so many memories so maybe he should ask Sasuke and Sakura about having one last lesson with Kakashi before he became the Rokudame of Konoha to let him know how much Team 7 had grown after reuniting with each other. Sudden LT Naruto heard the very familiar twang of a bow string and the following thud of an arrow hitting its target. He followed the sound until she reached a clearing with three wooden logs, the same place he fought Kakashi for the first time. There he found a little girl about the age of 10 or 11 years old with a very family auburn hair firing arrows at a target around 100 yards away. EVN when Naruto knew very little about bow and arrows, he was slightly awed at the girl's skill with a bow. The speed and accuracy she was shooting at was better than any shinobi throwing their weapons. That girl looked oddly familiar though. You know that I may shoot you down right there Uzumaki. The girl suddenly spoke up when Naruto landed on top of a tree. The voice was much more childlike, but it was the same kind of tone that Goddess of the Moon used to talk to him yesterday. Artemis, Naruto asked jumping down to the ground about a few feet away from the goddess, then walked toward her very carefully so that she would know he don't have any weird intent. Wow, you're a kid, what happened? Kurama was in action again to translate everything for Naruto. The only one he knew could change their age like that was Tsunade, but she was a 50-year-old lady who had problem with gamble, he doubted that that she and Artemis shared the same interest in wager. Us gods can change our appearance as will, this is the age I usually look like, she said and shot another arrow, saying that calmly. Huntresses, like Zoe, yes, like Zoe, she nodded her head before saying, I could appear as a grown woman like yesterday, or a blazing fire, 
or anything else I want, but this is what I prefer. This is the average age of my hunters, and all young maidens for whom I am patron, before they go astray. Go astray. Grow up. Become smitten with boys. Become silly, preoccupied, insecure. Forget themselves. Oh you mean fallen in love? Naruto suddenly realized with a large smile, his hand hitting his other palm. Artemis' left eyes twitched, turning around she returned to her training, shooting arrow straight to the middle wooden log. I rather not talk about it, she used that sentence to end their conversation, but Naruto still standing there right behind her. Then, the blonde reached his hand into his shuriken porch and pulled out a half dozen of shurikens. With just a simple throwing move, all six shuriken left his hand and flew straight forward toward the middle wooden log which was filled with silver arrows. But unlike Artemis who hit the wooden surface right away, Naruto's shuriken splitted six arrows of Artemis in half before their blade striking into the log. Artemis instantly turned around, glaring at him, you're welcome, his chuckling then stopped, Artemis, my mom and dad. Do they have any more children other than me? Kurama had filled him in that gods was immortal and his so-called godly parent had lived for more than three thousand years at husband and wife, so it wouldn't be a surprise if they had any more children than him. Artemis looked at Naruto for a moment. She didn't know if she should tell him the truth or not, that his father, her father was basically the biggest man whore ever and had countless affairs. Even the goddess standing in front of him, the goddess who was reading books in a tent not too far away were all his half-sisters. But since he asked Zeus' children with Hera, she would answer the things he wanted. There are Hebe as the Greek goddess of youth and also the former cup-bearer of the gods back at the old day, Artemis started, then Enyo was a goddess of war and destruction. Wait, isn't Athena the goddess of war? Naruto asked, cutting Artemis off her speech. Athena is the Olympian's goddess of war and wisdom, while Enyo was a minor goddess of war, she told him, Athena has a more important role than Enyo, but it's kind of opposite in Roman. She wanted to pull out the knife and gut Naruto right there for making that totally confused face. Um. Imagine your leader Tsunade and your shinobi council. Ah, so why didn't you just say so? Artemis nearly face palmed, it seemed that she had figured it out his problem. This whisker cheeks idiot wasn't as stupid as she thought, quite opposite actually, it just that he was relatively naive, simple, and slow to understand principle or situations, often requiring an oversimplified analogy in order to grasp what was being explained to him. In short, to Artemis, a simple mind idiot boy. Please continue. Okay then. Next is Enyo the goddess of war and destruction. Can't say I will get along with her if we ever met. So the boy wasn't like war, Artemis mused. Fair enough since he already went through a war himself. The goddess of the moob already figured it out what he was going to say when she mentions Ares. Elethia, the goddess of childbirth, Artemis continued, and then Hephaestus, the Olympian's god of forges, fire, technology, craftsmen, sculptors, volcanoes, and blacksmiths. Wow, that is a lot. Some of us Olympians have more than one domains, like me other than the goddess of the hunt and moon, I'm the also the goddess of the chastity, animals, and the wilderness. Okay alright, is there anyone else? Yes Ares, Artemis said that Sith a very distasteful tone, making Naruto raised an eyebrow at her Olympians god of war. That's it, yes, your eldest brother is mortal's least favorite, Naruto nodded, unlike Athena, who is the goddess of wisdom making her somewhat a goddess of war of justice, your brother is the complete warmonger, battlemaniac and bloodthirsty, typical man. Damn. Naruto scratched the back of his head. Why do I have a feeling that he is going to challenge me for a fight? Probably, was all Artemis said before returning to what she was doing. He got a big family was all Naruto thought in his head, he got a big family waiting for him at this place, Olympus. While most of them might not as pretty as he thought like Ares or Enyo, they are his family, the family he always wished for when he was young. Then suddenly, after 30 minutes of neither party said any words to each other and focused on their morning workouts, Naruto's stomach suddenly grumbled like thunder earning the attention of Artemis, who looked at him as if she was looking at a strange creature. Hee <laughs> hee, sorry about that, Naruto laughed sheepishly. You're never stopped to amaze me, Artemis sighed, shaking her head, just when I thought you're done showing how, showing yourself. Once again you come back and show a new side of you. Guess IIT is because I am awesome right? He grinned brightly, 
which really reminded her of Apollo's upbeat attitude, hopefully he would never turn out like her childish brother. His stomach rumbled once again. Ugh, I have enough of your hungry ass, she snapped her finger and in a flash of light, a set of picnic table and chair appeared from thin air beside Naruto, surprise him. Wow, how can you do that? Godly power. Artemis replied shortly, now sit down and I will find you something to eat. Do you know how to cook? Naruto asked, sat down while looking at Artemis in surprise. What do you really mean when you ask that question? Artemis asked, glaring at Naruto slightly who just laughed sheepishly, of course I know how to cook, but some, boy like you don't deserve to taste my cooking, let alone eat it, she said that with a smirk. Well, then how? But Naruto was silenced for the second time because Artemis clicked her fingers once again and food suddenly filled the entire table, various kinds of foods, some Naruto never tasted or even saw in his life. Consider this an apology for how I acted yesterday, said Artemis, sat down the chair opposite from Naruto. I attacked you for something nonsense and my behavior was like of an immature little girl. Well you're a little girl right? I mean, you can continue, Naruto was about to tell a joke but stopped himself because Artemis looked up and glared at him like he wanted to eat him alive or put an arrow through his head. As I was saying before being rudely interrupted, Artemis said, voice full of sarcasm, please consider this simple breakfast at the redemption for my actions. It wasn't like I was holding something against you, Naruto grinned, that thank for the meal anyway, he then picked up the chopstick and dug in. But after the first bite was in his mouth, Naruto looked at Artemis and asked, you don't eat. Gods don't eat. We live from the mortal's faith in our domains. Artemis then summoned a bowl of small cubes that put a piece in her mouth. But we can eat this, ambrosia, the food eaten by gods or drink this, nectar the drink consumed by the gods. She then summoned a cup filled with strange color liquor inside. Can I have some? He asked, wondering how the food and drink of gods taste like. Sure have some, Artemis gave it to Naruto, who took it and threw it into his mouth but since you're mortal, unless you want your blood to be turned to fire and bones to sand then sure, have as much as you like, Naruto instantly spitted it out of his mouth, horrified. What the hell? He screamed in Japanese, and even though Artemis couldn't understand, he knew he was cursing and couldn't help but laugh. Naruto looked at the laughing little girl, pouting before turning down and returned to the normal foods. Right about the time I thought you're nice enough, he said, putting the food into his mouth, hey Artemis. What? Can you summon ramen? Why is that food? It unhealthy and. Please, it's my favorite food, he begged with hand in front of him, if he still had his right hand then his hands would clap together, to me, it's the food of the gods, not the, dangerous cookies, he pointed to the bowl of ambrosia, which Artemis was pouring the nectar inside and ate it from a spoon. Okay go on, Artemis groaned and summoned the food he wanted. Itadakimasu. He shouted and dug in, not even ten seconds later. Done, can I have some more? He asked, grinning brightly and put the bowl down much to the shock of the goddess of the hunt. What in the Hades, what is wrong with you? She asked before shaking her head with her hands massaging her forehead. Forget that, here just eat. She replaced the entire table with bowl and bowl of ramen, making Naruto grin. Thank you. The rest of Naruto's breakfast ended in just 10 minutes, as he finished 10 bowls of ramen in just a few seconds really surprised Artemis. Artemis had never seen a boy like him before, who had proved to her that he was much more than he appeared to be. Sure he was simple mind, disrespectful and sometime, full of himself, but he had amazing skills in fighting and a very great mind for strategy as Athena had commented it when they watched Naruto and his friend fought against Kagaya. She hated to admit it but she would have to fight her hardest if she wanted to keep up with a Naruto who only fought with just one arm, who easily defeat her yesterday and actually show enough skills with just that to defeat her 3000 years of experience. Or maybe she was blinded with anger and he defeated her easily using that at his advantage. That must be it, Artemis mused to herself, it was her anger that clouded her judgment and made her to lose to him. He fought on the equal ground against a primordial being, remember? Artemis shivered, she could hear those words from the deepest part of her mind. Even ninja of this village was able to keep up with Zoe and could kill her in a close combat battle by the time her arrows ran out yesterday. She now know why the older gods and goddesses never told them about this world. Hey Artemis, Artemis, Naruto suddenly spoke up, 
clicking his fingers in front of her face to draw the goddess of the moon back to the ground, her mind probably like the moon going somewhere above the sky, he mused. Oh sorry. What do you want to say again? She blinked and looked at him. I want your help today Artemis, he said, I want to find out the truth about Serutobi Oji Chan's lie about me to my parent. But wasn't he already dead? Artemis crossed her arms on her chest. Sure gods like us can go to the underworld if the owner allow but your world's world of afterlife is very different than ours, there is no guarantee that we can enter it the same way. I don't need you to take me to the underworld, hell or heaven, whatever it is, he shook his head, but I heard from Kurama that you have the ability to track one down even if they are halfway around the world, I want you to help me find this man, Orochimaru and he is the key to all my questions. Find another man. This mission can't get worse, Artemis wanted to slap herself. All right I will help you, but as soon as you got your answer you will come with us all right? If that satisfy me, Naruto nodded line break, it's nice to see you two so friendly this morning, what happened? The goddess of wisdom asked Artemis, sitting down the picnic table, the same spot Naruto had been sitting a few hours ago to talk to her half-sister. The blonde shinobi was standing in the water while punching and kicking his feet around, trying to get used to fight with his left arm since now he had to fight with just one hand for some time. We started off in the wrong foot, Artemis nodded, but at least he didn't do anything wrong yet. At least until now. So you two. Talk? Athena asked before bringing out a book. Just yesterday, the two was head ahead against each other and Naruto had absolute problem with the opposite gender after all. Dot and treat him breakfast, as an apology for action tomorrow. Did he talk anything about coming with us? Yes but he needs to find out the truth about him being here without his parent knowing. He need me to help him find this man, name Orochimaru. Athena raised an eyebrow at this, something about this man could help him talk to Hiruzen. Well, Shinobi has plenty ninjutsu and powers that we still don't know anything about. Artemis couldn't help but agree. You two talk? Can we just talk about something else? 7 o'clock the two goddesses and Huntress stood in front of the main gate of Konoha behind Team 7, the same team of mortal fought that fought against a woman who was as strong as the primordial gods. Naruto and Sasuke had told Tsunade about the idea of finding Orochimaru to search for the information he wanted and since Sakura was there as well, Naruto couldn't help but ask the last member of Team 7 to go with them to make their team a whole again in this mission. Tsunade-sama is nearly done with the prosthetic hands make from Hashirama-sama's cells. Sakura told her teammate, I guess when we come back after this mission you too will have your hands back. Great. Naruto grinned. At least he wouldn't have to learn to do the simplest kind of things with just one hand for the rest of his life. Like fighting with both arms were better than with just one. I don't think I can receive it anytime soon, Sasuke suddenly spoke up. What do you mean? Sakura asked while Naruto remained silent, he knew his friend would bring up this subject and told it to Sakura. I need to see it for myself. How the world looks, Sasuke told her. W.H. What? Sakura shuddered, looking down Artemis' eyes twitched a little. Did that girl in love with that black hair boy? In her opinion, that was the worst possibility that could happen to any girls, no matter what worlds they were. Sakura was a strong young woman. The fight with Kagaya clearly showed that and would be a fine addition to her hunt, maybe she could ask the young pink hair lady to join her hunt after this, since it looked like the black haired boy was going to leave her. Before Sakura can say anything further, Kakashi Hataki appeared with his hands in his pocket. So, the team is all here, Kakashi said with his usual tone, yo, he greeted team 7 with an eye smile before turning to the goddesses and huntress, it's my pleasure to see two goddess in person. I'm Kakashi Hataki and the Rokudaim Hokage of this village, he then added, I was also the sensei of Team 7. Kakashi sensei, Naruto gasped in surprise, what are you doing here? I thought you're. Now now don't worry, the masked man smiled, when I heard that you three are about to head out to find Orochimaru, I couldn't help but come here as soon as I can. As soon as you can? Naruto asked, slightly smirking. So, there is no black cat on the street and helping old lady this time. It was two hours ago that I walked out of the Hokage's office Naruto. Naruto and Sakura groaned while Sasuke just sighed. Relax, I'm just kidding. Great Team 7 are all here for our last mission. Naruto grinned brightly before turning to the immortal group behind him. I think it's time to go ladies, he spoke in English. 
Okay. But first, Artemis walked to the group. Can anyone tell me how is this Orochimaru looks like? Snake face. Evil eyes. Naruto described very simple, really pale skin. Look like someone already dead. Those who can speak English looked at him. What? It's the truth. Kakashi. Do you have a picture of Orochimaru or anything that can show Artemis about him? Athena asked the new Hokage of Konoha. Oh, Tsunade Sama gave this to me. Kakashi pulled out from his shirt pocket a picture and gave it to Athena, who could see a younger Tsunade and a man with long spiky white hair and another one with long black hair and pale skin. Naruto was right, his skin was really pale and looked like someone already dead. I take that this man is Orochimaru, Athena nodded her head before giving it to Artemis, pointing the pale skin man in the picture. Then, she closed her eyes and not a moment later the shinobi could hear the sound of lot of animals were approaching them, all gasped in shock when hundreds and hundreds of various kinds of animals instantly present in front of Artemis, birds gathered around the area and there were still more to come. Foxes, wolves, wild cats, even creature like bugs, butterflies and snails were present and in front of the goddess of the hunt. Damn, Naruto said in amazement, she probably a goddess, Naruto commented while looking at Artemis, who was showing the animals the picture of Orochimaru and the other Sani. All right split up and find this man for me, also tell your friends and the other creatures as well, she said loudly and instantly, the animals all bowed to Artemis before parting away, disappeared as fast as they appeared, now we wait. Just in case they can find him, Sasuke spoke up, we should head to one of Orochimaru's old hideouts at Odogakur, in case he decided to return there. All right, Kakashi nodded his head while Athena translating everything back to Artemis. Let's go team, they all nodded and the shinobi shot up, moving fast on top of the tree while the goddess of the mood and her lieutenant ran below them on the ground, Athena transformed herself into an owl and flew up, flying on the sky. They traveled for three hours at top speed, neither parties talked to each other but talked among themselves, as Athena and Artemis were conversation through telepathy about elemental nation and what Athena had found out about this world, Zoe was keeping a close eyes on everything around her, taking in every details of the incredible wilderness of elemental nations. Neither Huntress had seen such fine nature like this before. Then suddenly when they about to arrive at the border between Land of Fire and the Land of Sound, Artemis shouted. Wait, everyone stopped and the shinobi got down to the ground, the stormy grey owl flew down and transformed back to Athena. Did you find him mistress? Zoe asked, the same question all wanted to ask her. Just wait a second. After saying that, the auburn-haired goddess put her hand on the ground and stayed silent for a little before standing up again, found him. What? Just like that? Naruto asked, surprise, I mean. Shouldn't one of the animals return to you and tell you wherever Orochimaru is? I can communicate with animals even from far distance, Artemis shook her head, one of them found Orochimaru and three more shinobi at the underground base about three miles from here. I know that place, Orochimaru returned there to gather all of his research with the rest of Taka, Sasuke nodded his head at Naruto, and he was wondering where his short-time teammate was. His old team, Naruto explained. I will lead the way. The auburn-haired goddess said before heading toward the direction the animals were leading her as fast as she could while everyone following closely behind. It didn't take long for them to arrive at their destination, a small area surrounded with trees and rocks, hard to find Orochimaru's headquarter if not for Artemis leading them. The first impression about Orochimaru's headquarter was an underground basement, with a secret door hid really well but soon found by Zoe. Naruto, wait. Sakura shouted when suddenly, Naruto launched himself forward and rushed toward the secret door of Orochimaru's hideout without any stopping. However before he could get in, Naruto was bounced back by an invisible barrier. Interesting, Athena got next to Naruto, bringing her hand out to touch the invisible barrier. Of course, Orochimaru will put something like this to protect his base, Kakashi nodded his head before turning to his team, this is a very. But before he could say anything more. Naruto, who just took a few seconds to gather natural energy, with his left hand, punched the barrier with so much raw strength that the collision shook the entire area and shocked everyone, completely shattered Orochimaru's protection with his physical power alone. Powerful barrier, Kakashi finished his sentence while the barrier collapsing in front of them, Sasuke just sighed. Idiot. 
Sakura shouted and punched Naruto upside down on his head, actually held back a lot of her strength in order to not seriously hurt him, now he is going to think someone is attacking him. Hey, this is faster than waiting for Orochimaru to come out or us unseal the barrier, Naruto cried out while holding his head in pain. Typical do first think second, Athena commented, blindly charge into battlefield like that can get you kill sometime. So you have any other ideas to get in? It's not like we are in good term with Orochimaru and Taka, well, other than Sasuke. I had plans, Athena said blankly, but you ruined it thank you very much. Duh. A guy is trying to find the truth here, Athena only shook her head and followed the other inside, with Naruto opened the door for all of them. Naruto, Kakashi was the last one, standing at the door and looked at Naruto, can I have a few words with you? Of course sensei, he nodded. I know that you're very worried about the upcoming meeting with the Sandame, the Rokudame Hokage said, but you need to calm down, losing your cool and risking everyone's life like that is not you at all. Sensei. Artemis Sama said Orochimaru inside, a goddess said Orochimaru is inside this place then then mean he is in here, Kakashi gave him an eyes smile, he is not going anywhere and more friendly than before, I believe that he will help you summon Sandame Sama. So takes a deep breath and calm down, with that Kakashi walked inside, leaving Naruto with himself outside of the underground basement. The blonde sighed, he shouldn't act like that, Kakashi was right he needed to calm down and think more carefully about the situation, he had to make sure he was calm and clear mind when talking with the man who currently the reason for his childhood without his family. Taking a deep breath Naruto walked in, when Naruto were three steps inside. Sasuke-kun. A squeak could be heard and a girl with red hair and glasses launched herself forward toward Sasuke, who had foreseen it and replaced himself with Sakura. To say the student of Tsunade Senju was unpleased was an understatement, her eyes twitched when Karen crashed into her with the redhead's arms wrapped tightly around her head, which she thought should be Sasuke's. Gripping her hand into a fist tightly Sakura then crooked it back and punched Karen away from her sending Naruto's human side relative across the underground basement and crashed into a wall. This is the worst, Zoe commented about what the redhead just do. I thought you only have problem with boys, Naruto asked, looking at the lieutenant of Artemis, not the girls. I don't have problem with love-struck girls, Zoe said emotionlessly, I pity them. Blindly got into something that only hurt them later on, while they can do much better than following behind boy. Artemis Hunt was a group of girls and Naruto already figured out why Artemis formed said hunt in the first place as well as their opinion about the opposite sex. Karen got out of the wall Sakura punched her through with the last two shinobi of Team Keita, Suigetsu and Jugo right behind her. My my, Sasuke, Suigetsu said with a mouth full of sharp teeth, it's just two day and you're already here with the hero. He then looked at Naruto, you're here to capture us or something. Of course not idiot. Sasuke-kun is here to visit me and later bring him back to the village, she then shot to Sasuke and wrapped her arms around his left arm, leaning her head slightly on his shoulder, isn't that right Sasuke-kun? Those women behind them, Jugo spoke up with his usual calm tone, they're not normal, Suigetsu and Karen looked at him as if he was crazy while the three immortal beings just looked at the orange hair man in a little surprise. Up to this time they shouldn't feel any surprise from what the shinobi can do anymore. They're my friends, Naruto said before looking around, can you two lead me to where Orochimaru is? I got a favor to ask him. There is no need for that, a cold and chilling voice could be heard as Orochimaru made himself present to everyone, wearing the same attire he wore, the legendary Sanin of Konoha walked out from a secret tunnel with a smile. You four especially the Hokage and Sasuke-kun are the last person I expected to visit this place, he then turned his eyes slightly to the immortal group, and bring some unfamiliar women with you too. Good to see you too Orochimaru, Kakashi sighed, so can I ask why you are here? The snake Sanin asked, not here to bring me back to the village and commit my crime I hope. We need you to help Naruto talk to the Sandame Sama, Sasuke informed and Orochimaru was a little surprised at this, there is something he needs to ask. Then you're perfectly know what jutsu is need to summon him as well as the requirement, the Sanin said calmly, lucky for you that Naruto, I have one here with me, Orochimaru then turned around and walked ahead, please follow me. Oh right, but let me warn you if you intend to use a human's life to summon the Sandame, 
I will make sure that you have a few scars that can never heal. Naruto quickly followed right behind Orochimaru, saying that and made the snake eyes man stopped. If using a human is the only choice for the sacrifice, will you still do it Naruto? The blonde was a little taken aback by that question, he looked down a little before quickly turning his eyes back to Orochimaru. I will find another way, I just want to ask Oji-chan directly, Naruto told him, if there is no other choice I will find a different way to find out the truth. Very well then, they all head to a wide room of Orochimaru's underground basement, where the room was being lighted up by multi-candles inside of the snake's mouth which were opened wide on the wall. Athena could clearly see the place was some kind of laboratory in a way, with multi-strange device and documents on the papers, with lots of scroll and some books as well. And in the middle of the room there is a tank filled with liquid and inside was. Isn't that Zetsu's clones? Naruto asked, surprised, I thought they was all disintegrating. Took me a while to keep him alive but he is not the original one from Zetsu army Orochimaru smirked, he is the second one and the most stable one, the original and the first clone already crumble away before I could stable them. He cloned that man from my original man. Athena asked Naruto quietly, as far as she concerned their origin shouldn't be known by too many people. Athena was talking with Naruto while looking at the pale man with spikes on his body floating inside the tank filled with water. Taka was helping Orochimaru drank the liquid away to take Zetsu outside. Indeed he was? Naruto the scratched his chin, your worlds doesn't have cloning? Artemis and Zoe turned to hear their conversation in interest. Cloning isn't an unfamiliar term to our world, but clone a human being was banned right after the idea was given. It was wrong, simply inhuman, but we can clone animals or an organ to replace the damaged organ. Wow. I think I can understand that, Naruto nodded his head. I don't think my world have any rule forbid us from cloning, but I don't think anyone other than Orochimaru and Kabuto ever done this. He then made a clone of himself appeared next to him with one hand seal, surprised the immortal group when a perfect replica of Naruto appeared. We also have a jutsu that allow us to create copies ourselves, called Cage Bushin no Jutsu. He dispelled the clone, who grinned at the immortal group before disappearing. These clones are just real as I am because I distributed my chakra among every clone, giving each clone an equal fraction of the my overall power. Then that mean you split this, chakra energy in half and give it to each clone, right? Athena's head perked up with interest, she knew what was chakra from the books she read at Olympus, given by her father, then the more clones you make the more exhausted you are. Yeah, kind of, Naruto nodded, it was particularly true but Naruto was a different case, he never felt tired before when summoned hundreds of clones. The preparation is ready, Orochimaru said, drawing everyone attention. Zetsu, still breathing but was just barely, was lying on the ground in front of them. I'm sorry because this is one of the first jutsus you have to see, Naruto told the immortal group. Orochimaru then opened the scroll contained the Sandame's DNA he got long ago and put it on the ground and put his hand on it, activating the jutsu. Once the scroll was activated, the marks inside spread out in the form of a special seal with Zetsu, the living sacrifice in the center. Then dust and ash encased the Zetsu's body before slowly forming itself into an old man wearing black battle attire with the Konoha's forehead protector on top of his head. What was that? Artemis asked, did he just, summon the dead people, Naruto said, in order to make this technique work he needs a DNA sample and a sacrifice, a vessel for the soul of the person he wants to reincarnate. Now Athena and the other immortal understood why Naruto was so against the idea of using a human's being, to them. Zetsu was nothing but human and the goddesses couldn't feel any human from them. The Sandame then looked around, realizing himself was at the living world once again, he then turned his eyes to the only person in the room he knew was there and could perform this technique. Orochimaru, the Sandame said before looking around, he could see that every member of Team 7 was here as well, what is going on here? Why did you summon me this time for Orochimaru? Naruto Uzumaki wanted to ask you a question, and who am I to refuse the request of the hero of the Shinobi War? Orochimaru chuckled before turning around. I will leave you guys two alone. With that the Sanin worked out of the room with Jugo and Suigetsu pulling Karen behind them, who was screaming about not leaving Sasuke's side. We will let you hear too Naruto, Kakashi said and hurried outside with the rest of Team 7. Thank you Kakashi Sensei. Now that we are alone, the Sandame turned to Naruto and said kindly, Naruto-kun, what do you want to ask me? If the question wasn't very important, 
Naruto would never go to Orochimaru to ask for help from a forbidden jutsu to have a direct answer from him. He got a feeling that he knew what Naruto was going to ask, but he didn't think that the blonde could find out after all these years. Oji chan. Do you know who they are? Naruto asked, stepping aside a little and motioned his hand to Artemis and Athean, the two Olympians' goddesses, they are Athena, Olympians' goddess of war and wisdom and Artemis, Olympians' goddess of the moon and hunt. Serutobi widened his eyes in shock before his expression returned to normal, instantly letting Naruto know that the old man knew more than he appeared to be. So you find out Naruto-kun, Serutobi said calmly, his eyes not leaving Naruto, your parent finally finds out the truth. But why Ji-chan, Naruto asked, he could barely believe all of that was true, why did you not give me to my parent when they came back to find me? Naruto-kun, not just because you're the son of Minato Namikaze and Kashina Uzumaki, you're also the son of Zeus and Hera, the royal couple of Mount Olympus, the god's realm. Naruto stayed silent in order to let the Sandame explained, the great toad sage had foretold that the child of the prophecy would be a student of Jiraiya that would bring a great revolution to the world of the ninja. Jiraiya's actions would determine if this revolution would be for the world's salvation or the world's destruction. You Naruto-kun is one of the children of prophecy and the one who bring the world's salvation and fulfill the prophecy. Lady Athena, Lady Artemis, who is the first ones you think about when it came to prophecy, he then turned to the two goddesses and asked with a respectful tone, someone who can decide, who can change and control the destinies of others. I would think about my brother Apollo the god of prophecy but, Artemis then said, but if you're talking about someone who can control the destiny then, the fates, Athena nodded her head and Serutobi also nodded. They came to me the same night Minato and Kashina died, releasing their godly counterpart from their body, Zeus and Athena. It was a dark night and Serutobi never felt so scared before in his life. I am one of the only two people that know about Naruto-kun's parents' true origin, the other is Jiraiya. That night, three women appeared before me when I was about to bring Naruto-kun to his parent, knowing full well that they will come back for their son. They came and told me that no matter what happened I must not give Naruto-kun to his godly parent because by the time Naruto left this world, there will be no children of prophecy and if there was no children of prophecy. This world by this time, is done for, Serutobi continued, sooner or later when Kagaya Otsutsuki is done with our world, she will head to the realm of the gods to take the position she thought was hers. Everything would end if you did not stay here Naruto-kun. Was my life as just a simple game for someone to control? Naruto asked through gritted teeth, he still remembered Neji's words during their fight at the Chunin exam years ago, that fate could not be changed. He said he could change fate and yet, dot all his life, what he do had been decided by three old women. They took the opportunity of having a family, what he desired the most away from him just because some stupid prophecy. The fates shouldn't be able to affect your life Naruto-kun, Serutobi said with a sad eyes, our world is completely separated from theirs, each person can chose what they want to do in this world but you, you're the son of two Olympians. Human or God, you're still the son of them, two beings from that world. Zeus and Hera didn't know that they had gave birth to a perfect child who the fates can use to stop the end of the war. Naruto gritted his teeth even harder and slammed his fist on the wall, completely shattered that section under his strength. Fates huh, Naruto snorted with anger, you three, can you leave us alone? The immortal group knew better than argue with Naruto at the moment so they quickly got out of the room and left Naruto alone with Serutobi. What are you going to do now Naruto-kun? The old Hokage said. Now? I'm going to that world, he said before grinning evilly, not just because I want to meet my parent and seek for something I always wanted. I want to mess with fate. Truthfully, he wanted to beat them, since gods couldn't die, simply fade away for a few years or so before returning. It would be very simple to beat them until they couldn't get up from the ground. No, that would be too easy, he wanted to prove to them that his life wasn't for them to decide. He would piss them off first, do something that was out of original, he would mess with their domains. He would change every single future they decided to his liking. Unpredictable is in your name brat. Karama smirked, but not even gods dare to defy the fates like you, are you sure you're ready to take this challenge? You know me Karama. Naruto said with a confident smile, I will show them I am more than capable of doing that. Ji Chan. Naruto looked at the Hokage, thank you for telling me the truth, I think I know what I should do. 
I'm sorry for not telling you Naruto-kun, but as you can see, I died too soon before you can mature enough to handle the informations, Serutobi said sadly. Don't worry Ji-chan, but Naruto-kun, if you decided to go to your parent world, I have a few words for you, he then said with serious tone, the world you are about to go to is a very complicated world, the gods held pride and powers that sometime, they shouldn't be the people you think they should be. Even your parent Naruto, Zeus and Hera, while they could be one of the greatest people in this world a human, they was. Dot not the best kind of gods out there. Even the two goddesses waiting for you outside, Naruto nodded. Athena might appear to be a wise goddess, Artemis could be a very prideful goddess but sometime. They are not who you think. Just promise me that when you know the truth, you will handle wisely everything like the hero you are, who led the shinobi world to victory. I promise Ji Chan. Oh okay. Uh, Naruto scratched the back of his he's, P Pacific Ocean. Good, what about this one? Athena pointed to another area on the huge map she was using to teach Naruto about their world, around them was multi-books and various kind of comics, which were all for children half of his age. Of course, Naruto couldn't depend on Kurama all the time, so he asked Athena to help him with English since she was the most friendly one among the immortal group. But it wasn't make her an easy teacher, quite opposite to say the least. Naruto totally forgot that this woman was the goddess of wisdom and his normal behavior wasn't tolerated by Athena in the slightest. This goddess made Aruka's strict teaching look like teaching children how to count from 1 to 10. But he learned fast, Athena said that herself. Even the goddess of wisdom was surprised by this. Artemis, however wasn't. What Athena was teaching was pretty simple so of course the simple mind idiot understood it pretty fast, it would soon change when they get to the complicate things. Speaking of whom, the huntress along with her lieutenant already went hunting at the forest outside of Konoha. In just a few hours after Naruto and his team returned to Konoha and told Tsunade about his upcoming leaving, the news somehow spread all over elemental nations like fire on hay. Of course, the information about Naruto's real parent and his true origin, as well as the immortal group with him right now was kept at the triple S top secret information. It would cause chaos all over the countries if they found out that Naruto was the son of two powerful gods and the two women staying at Konoha right now was goddess, not to mention Zoe being an immortal. What the people of elemental nations knew was that he was about to leave for a very long time, going to the faraway lands that were even outside of the elemental nation and became a wanderer like his late sensei. I heard that you dreamed to become this village's leader, the Hokage right? Athena asked as she put the book down and asked Naruto. Yeah, to be Hokage. That's my dream. Naruto smiled slightly. At first I just want to be Hokage in order to have people acknowledge me, grow up and I found it is more than just acknowledgement. True, Athena nodded her head. She of all people was too familiar with the word, leader. You know, you don't have to leave this village forever. With your father's power he can teleport you to this place whenever he wants, it just that he can't come to this world due to the oath he made with the sticks long ago. As the sticks that terrify. For us gods, we won't be affected by her curse. But the curse itself will go to our children, Athena explained. So if they broke that oath, bad fortune will get to you and that will be the last thing they want to do. As that's so, Naruto nodded his head and stood up. Hey where are you going? We're still finished this yet. Athena tried to grab him but the boy already got to the front door of his apartment. Hey what is the big deal? I already have the clone study for me, he pointed out. Clones filled the every single area of his apartment, with a book in each of their hands his copies were helping him speeding up the language learning process. With the speed they were learning and the amount of clones Naruto summoned, he would more or less have the basic grab of the world he was going to come to. To say Athena was shocked was an understatement because she'd never seen such useful technique before in her immortal life, both in daily learning and war strategies. Athena could read dozens of books per days and perfectly understand them. But the idea of Naruto with his clones could read hundreds maybe thousands of books depend on the amount of clones he summoned then at the end of the day all knowledge transfer back to him when the clones disappear, was truly terrifying. It wasn't like she didn't believe in this method of learning and she could teach the clones if she wanted to, but she preferred to teach the original, since everything gone to him anyway. Plus, teaching a whole class with the same face was a little bit creepy, even for a goddess like her. Naruto put on his jacket and opened the door. 
But the moment he opened it, Naruto Senpei, please don't leave. Please, our village needs you. You're our hero. Don't leave. Please give me your child first before departing. If you really have to go, please accept my gifts first. The hero of the elemental nation instantly slammed his door closed and used his back to block the door. There were a lot of people waiting outside of his apartment, most of them were girls and young women and some of them even had gifts in their hands, from foods to various kinds of gifts that he could think of. Well, don't let Artemis see that girls are swooning over you. Athena advised wisely while explaining a few details to a clone of Naruto. You don't have to tell me, he quickly escaped through the window and headed to the hospital, where Tsunade was waiting with his new hand. Line break. How do you feel Naruto? Tsunade Senju asked as she held a small board with a pen in her hands, looking at Naruto who just went through a surgery just fine. Naruto looked at his new hand made from the Shodaim Hokage's cells, which was wrapped completely in bandages. Tsunade thought it would be best wrapped his new hands by bandages, since her grandfather's cells combined with the flesh of other could get a very unhealthy feeling for the one who saw it. At least he didn't have the Shodime's face poked out of his arms like Madara or Danzo. The blonde moved his index finger and saw that it reacted to him immediately. Naruto then turned his hand around and tightened his hand into a fist, gripping it tightly and smirked. Well Ba-chan, this is as good as my original one. He grinned at the former Godime Hokage. Good, but we still need to run some more tests on your arms. The blonde groaned making Tsunade glared at him. Shut up brat, this is for your own good. Ya yeah, ya, yeah. what about Sasuke? He asked. If Tsunade had finished with his right arm then she probably finished with Sasuke's left arm. Sakura is taking care of his hand. Naruto Wolf whistled before receiving a light swat on the head by Tsunade's clipboard. Naruto quickly gathered his things and got out of the hospital before the 53 years old lady in disguise could grab him, heading toward Ichiraku Ramen to grab a hot and delicious meal. The surgery took him three hours in the morning, it could take longer but since Tsunade was a professional she made it way faster than normal medic nin, so Naruto particularly very hungry right now. Thank to Naruto's reputation, in just a few days after the world, Ichiraku's ramen had become one of the most popular restaurant in the entire elemental nations. The place literally overwhelmed with costumers 24 hours. What made him supper glad was that the Naruto topping had become the most popular topping now and every shinobi and kunoichi of Konoha came to eat a bow of ramen before missions in hopes of getting success on mission like Naruto. Now just wait a minute. Ichiraku Chuki even hired some of the shinobi team of the village to become the entrance guard for his restaurant, so it was the common sight to see some of the new graduated teams of Konoha standing in front of the entrance and stop the massive crowds of costumers trying to get into the place. Please step in line, please. Maybe it wasn't a good decision for coming to a crowd place like this, remembering what happened this morning at his apartment, but Naruto was craving for an extra big bowl of ramen with ramen topping so he decided to take the risk. Stood at the end of the line with both of his hands in his pocket, Naruto waited patiently for his turn until. It's Naruto Senpei. He heard the shout and turned behind to see a young boy pointing at him with the brightest smile ever. Instantly those words reached everyone's ears and they turned around and soon got to see the familiar hero of elemental nations. Ah uh, yeah, he chuckled nervously. That's me, soon. Villagers surrounded around him and tried to ask him for his signatures or even trying to convince him to not leave the village at this timing. Luckily for him, a certain teacher of Ninja Academy came into rescue as he pulled Naruto out of the crowd by his collar, making everyone yelled out in disappointment. Sorry guys, let me borrow him for a moment, Naruto turned around and a smile made it to his face when he saw one of his most favorite teachers, Uruka Yumino standing behind him with a smile on his face. Uruka sensei the blonde grinned widely let's come in naruto my treat this time this day couldn't get any better a few minutes later sitting at a table in the middle of the crowded ramen restaurant naruto and Uruka were eating their foods which the former more or less gulping down bowl after bowl of extra big ramen served by the restaurant's waitresses the blonde ate his food with a happy smile on his face happy that he didn't have to worry about his gama chan became thin because of him so Naruto, when are you going to go? Uruka started the conversation, slowly eating his ramen. Well, after Sasuke go I will go too, 
Naruto nodded his head, putting the empty ramen bowl down and grabbed another one. He told me something about traveling the world to see how it works, so more or less we both will leave Konoha in a day or two. Uruka was one of a few people knew the truth behind Naruto's departure. Can't say that I'm not sad when you are about to leave, the teacher smiled at him. Don't worry Uruka sensei Athena said that I can visit Konoha from time to time if I can ask Pop help me with the transportation, he pointed out with a grin. Plus I don't think that world ramen is as good as Ichiraku, the brown-haired chunin laughed at that. To say Naruto was glad when he found out the earth also had ramen was an understatement. Artemis or any gods could summon foods and really delicious at that, but he prefers handmade more than magical made like what the goddess did. I never got to say this to you Naruto, but I thought it was just yesterday that you're still a genin and I treated you at the small ramen restaurant like usual, Uruka said, looking Naruto with soft eyes, but now you sit here, the hero of the fourth great shinobi war, adores by many and loved by all. I couldn't be more proud of my little brother, the teacher smiled and rubbed Naruto's head, making him grin. A few minutes later, Naruto and Aruka existed the ramen restaurant with the brown-haired Chunin's wallet literally broke, but he didn't have anything against it. The owner of the restaurant, Ichiraku Chuki wanted to treat his favorite costumer free ramen but the both of them quickly shut down the ideas and paid for the meal, Aruka paid for the meal. Naruto ni chan, oi, the blonde turned his head and saw Konohamaru running toward him while waving his arm, hey Aruka sensei. Konohamaru, he asked in surprise before grinning, how are you? I'm great, the grandson of the late Sandame Hokage grinned before saying, hey check this out. There is something I want to show you. Really? Yeah. He nodded before running ahead. Hurry. Oi. Wait for me. Naruto quickly followed behind. Not forgot to wave goodbye to Uruka. See you later Uruka sensei. The two of them got to Konohamaru's house and the genin ledded Naruto into a room looked like a storage room with a lot of stuffs and boxes and things that looked pretty old and untouched for a long time, though the place was well kept and tidy. I found this while cleaning the place. The smaller genin grabbed a big box and put it down to the ground, opened it and showed Naruto a grinning monkey wearing the Hokage's hat as well as the costume of the Sandame Hokage. What is this anyway? He looked at it with curious eyes, glancing into the box and saw a lot of things inside too, junks. It's not junks. Konohamaru shook his head. They are all remembrances of Oji-chan. Oh. Naruto nodded his head. So what is this stuff's all about? Ah. I think this is your mother's things Naruto ni chan. His eyes widened in surprise. Oji chan keeps all her things here. He then reached his hands into the box and pulled out a blue scarf with white stripes. Here, I think she made this for you. Naruto gently took the scarf from Kanahamanru and held it in both hands. Mother, he whispered in English. She made this for him. Kashina Uzumaki or better known as Hera, made this for him. You should keep them. This is your mother's belongings after all. Okay. Thank you Konohamaru. Line break. Yash Naruto kun. The flame of youth within us is burning brighter than ever so let's party until both of us can even walk anymore. Lee shouted energetically, with a voice full of power, youth, and put his hand on Naruto's shoulders, leaning against the blonde while holding a bottle of water in his hand. Hee hee. All right. Naruto chuckled nervously. Glad that guy had changed the bottle of sake with the bottle of water from Lee's hand, or else he would be screaming and using drunken fist to destroy the whole place. They were at the Ichiraku's ramen again, but this time the place was used to give Naruto the farewell party. He had tried to explain to Tsunade that he wasn't going to go forever and would visit the village from time to time, but the busty Hokage shook it off and forced him to go to the party against his will. All of Naruto's friends and close people were here. From the rookie 12 and team guy to Konohamaru and his squad with Ebisu sitting at the round table in the middle of the street, which had been closed at both sides in order to have enough spaces for the people invited to the party for the party, laughing with each other. Guy and Kakashi and the teachers of each team with Aruka were talking with each other, with the former sitting on a wheelchair and still hadn't fully recovered yet but still came here, which Naruto very grateful about. Even the cages were here, sitting at the table while talking with each other. The Sand siblings were having a hard time trying not to get sucked too much into the party, but he could see that Shikamaru and Tamari was pretty close with each other now. 
The immortal maidens were also invited and they currently sitting at a lone table at the corner. They would never come here if not for Naruto forcing them to come, with Athena was the first goddess since she was curious about the villages and Artemis and Zoe had no choice but followed her as well, since Athena was the only one who could speak Japanese, misunderstanding in language could cause unnecessary trouble. Here you go Naruto. Ino and Sai approached him and gave the blonde a small box, a departing gift, this is from the both of us. Thank you, Ino. Sai, he nodded gratefully and opened his scroll to store the next departing gifts his friends gave him, which he had received all night. The party continued for the next three hours with a lot of things happened, Lee finally got his hand on sake and the next things they knew, Guy's favorite student was dancing around while moving his body wildly in the drunken fist, destroying everything he caught sight of and sent anyone who tried to stop him flying until Artemis snapped her finger turning him into a creature that resembled a rabbit and antelope horns much to everyone's shock. But she did turn him back to normal after everyone secured him, to make sure he wouldn't destroy the restaurant if he is turned back to normal. Naruto sat opposite from Sasuke, who liked him already had a new hand. They talked about their own intention in the future, separating themselves from the wild party. However, when the party was about to end, Naruto caught sight of a young woman sitting at teammates a table, Unlike everyone who had already drunk and laughing, she was having her head down and her eyes looked sad, hands gripping a small box tightly on her lap. Since the funeral, he'd never seen Hinata Hayuga look so sad like that. Excuse me, Sasuke, Sakura-chan, he stood up from their seat and walked toward Hinata's table. Where are, but Sasuke was stopped when Sakura put a finger on his lips, she was smiling while looking at Naruto. Naruto stood at Team Aid's a table for a moment, it seemed that Hinata still not realize he was standing behind her yet so he spoke up. Hey Hinata, can I sit here? The girl's head snapped up and she turned around to look at him with wide eyes. And Naruto-kun, she stuttered in surprise, of course you can. And he did, sitting at the chair next to Hinata. They stayed silent for a moment as neither party decided to be the first one who start the conversation. Getting uncomfortable with the silent between them Naruto decided to speak up first. So Hinata, Naruto-kun. However, Hinata also decided to break the silent as the two looked at each other for a moment. You, once again they said at the same time, but the light lavender eyes beauty quickly said. You go first Naruto-kun. Oh, all right, he nodded, why didn't you enjoy the party and sit here all alone? He asked, looking at her. I comma I don't feel like partying tonight, she whispered, Naruto-kun. Yeah, are you, really going to leave? She asked quietly. Yeah, was all his reply, I, don't know for how long, but I will make sure to ask my dad bring me back to visit you guys every chance I got, even himself was unsure of that. Sorry Nar, Yuto-kun, but I n, need to go now. Hanada then suddenly stood up and ran away with the box held close to her chest, in just a moment Naruto could see a small glint of light from her eyes. It was tears. Dumbfounded Naruto sat there questioned himself about what just happened, scratching the back of his head in confusion, his eyes stayed on Hanada. Sigh, Naruto turned around and saw Sasuke and Sakura standing behind him, you will never learn do you. L learn what? Naruto asked with a slight forced smile. Follow her dumbass. Sakura shouted and slammed her hand on the table, making it broke into pieces and made the foods and plates fell down to the ground. Naruto flinched and jumped out of his chair. Hi, he shouted, spinning around and went after Hinata as quick as he could. With his speed he quickly caught up to her, but Hinata already got into her house and closed the door behind her. Oi Hinata, he shouted, slamming his hands against the door rapidly, please open the door there was no answer, if you don't open the door I will break in. He was going to be in so much trouble with Hiyashi after this, but then again, he wasn't going to stay in this village for long so luckily he would escape the usual stoic Hyuga's wrath. And it was about time he test his new hand's ability to use ninjutsu. Bringing his hand back Naruto summoned an orange Rasengan in his hand. It was a lot easier to do it with only one hand than before and the blonde couldn't help but grin at that. I will count to three if you don't open it I will break in, maybe this method was a bit extreme, one, two, three, he thrust his hand forward. However right at that moment the door opened. 
But the girl who opened it wasn't Hanada, but her sister Hanabi. Shit. He stopped midway and deactivated the jutsu before it could touch Hanabi. N Naruto Senpei. The girl looked up. What was that? Nothing. He hid his hand behind his back quickly while the other scratching the back of his head, laughing forcefully. Nothing at all Hanabi-chan. I heard your voice I came to open the door. She explained. You want to come in. Nay Sama just returned home. Oh all right. He walked in and followed behind Hanabi. Sorry for not coming to the farewell party Naruto Senpei. Hanabi glanced at him and said apologetically. Don't worry about it. He shook his head and followed Hanabi until they were in front of Hanada's room. Nay Sama. Naruto Senpei is here to see you. She knocked the door slightly. Nay Sama. She is not inside. Naruto suddenly said. He could feel somebody else in this mansion other than Hanabi. But they wasn't in the room. I will go to her. You go to your room all right Hanabi. Uh. All right then. The young Hyuga waved slightly. Naruto got to the place appeared to be a garden of the Hyuga mansion, the place filled with plants and all the kinds of flowers he could think of. He could hear the faint sobbing sound and moved toward that direction as quickly yet gently as he could, knowing full well that Hinata was there and he didn't want her to run away again. True enough the girl was having her head resting against her arms, with both of them put on her knees as she was sitting while leaning her back against a tree. The box was being held closely to her. Hey, Hinata-chan. Naruto kneed down next to her and said with a gentle tone, you all right. The dark blue hair Hyuga princess looked up and turned her eyes at Naruto, showing her beautiful lavender eyes, which were full of tears to Naruto. Looking at her now, the blonde felt like he was really an ass now. Then suddenly, Hinata threw herself into his chest, crying out loudly. Naruto was surprised by her sudden action but his eyes then softened and gently brought his arms around her, hugging her tightly to his chest. It's okay now, I'm here, he said gently, gently running his hand through her hair. This is going to be a long night, he thought. Line break. This is for you Naruto-kun, Hanada said with her head resting on his shoulder, the both of them was sitting close to each other while leaning their back against the tree. She handed him the small box, which Naruto took it with both of his hand. Thank you, Hanada-chan, he smiled. He had decided to wait until he got to the new world, but everything had it exception so he would make one with Hanada's gift. He reached his hand inside and felt something very soft, like clothes or something like that. Naruto then grabbed a hole of it and pulled out. It was a long red scarf. And it looked very familiar. This is... You remember Naruto-kun, she asked quietly, closing her eyes, that is the scarf you wore many years ago. On a snowy day, when we were both preparing to enroll the academy, you came and saved me from a group of bullies. Memories returned to his mind, now Naruto remembered that day and the scarf in his hand, though you failed and easily beaten. Dot and your scarf trampled over by them. I asked you to keep it right, Naruto asked, chuckling to himself. He was so weak back then, since it was ruined. Yes, and you kept it till this day, he looked at the scarf, and you even knitted it back again. Yes, Naruto-kun, she whispered. Strange, in just a day and I got two scarf, he chuckled, pulled out from his pocket the green one of his mother, showing it to Hanada, my mother made this to me before, you know she died and returned to her world. As that so, Hanada put her hand on the scarf and gently moved her hand on it. She could tell that the person who made it put a lot of effort into making the scarf, just like her when she knit Naruto's scarf. Thank for the gift again Hanada. He smiled at her, thought it would be weird if I wear them both at once, so maybe he would change them to a regular basic. Naruto-kun, you said you will return, she then moved her head back slightly to look at him, are you really mean it? Of course Hanada, I mean it, he nodded. No matter where I go this place will always be my home. To me, there are a lot precious people here, those that I consider my family, Sasuke, Sakura-chan, Kakashi-sensei, Ba-chan, Uruka-sensei, you, he looked up, leaning the back of his head against the tree, so of course I will be back, there is no way I can leave this place for long. Every weekend if I can help it. I'm glad, Hanada smiled softly and leaned her head against his shoulder once again. The two of them stayed like that for the rest of the night, enjoying each other company. Line break. All set.
All set. Naruto nodded his head, gathering the rest of the scrolls which was containing his ninja's gears, weapons and of course the gifts everyone gave him and put it into his backpack. He walked to the table and took the old picture of the Team 7 when they were just past Kakashi's bell test ad put it into his bag, checking every drawers to make sure he didn't leave anything back. Naruto opened the last drawer and saw Sasuke's old head protector, freezing for a moment he then reached his hand out and grabbed the thing, put it into his pocket and threw the backpack on his shoulder after zipping the zipper up. All right let's go, Naruto said to Athena, who was standing by the door waiting for him. The two of them walked to the main gate of Konoha in silent. He was going to leave the village very soon in the morning, so there weren't many people currently on the street of Konoha. The two regrouped with Artemis and Zoe after the two of them had finished packing up their things, some of which were the fur of animals Artemis said could only be found at this world. When they got to the main gate, Naruto caught sight of his best friend, standing with his back leaning against the gate. Can't say I'm not surprised to see you here Sasuke, Naruto said with a slight grin, his hand reached into his pocket and grabbed Sasuke's forehead protector. I thought I would be the first person to say goodbye the Uchiha said, but I guess I was wrong, he stepped forward and stood in front of Naruto, so I guess this is it huh? Yeah, when I return to visit Konoha, Naruto said, I doubt that you will be here to greet me. Do you really have to leave? Naruto asked, pulling what he was holding out of his pocket, Sakura-chan will be sad you know. I know I have to do this, Sasuke shook his head, to see how this world really work, and read him for my sins. Naruto sighed before his face spread it out on a small smile, he then brought the forehead protector up and gave it to Sasuke. I think this is yours, Sasuke grabbed it with a nod. You can leave this world to me, Konoha, Fire Country, Elemental Nations, Sasuke then smiled, if you need any helps, you know where to find. I know, take care Naruto, Sasuke said loudly. You too. With the final nod. Naruto stepped up and stood beside the immortal group. Sasuke the took a few steps back to make some distance with them. Let's go, Naruto said, earning a nod from Athena. Okay then. She then looked at the sky, we're ready, father. Father, Naruto asked in confusion, but the next moment, a lightning bolt shot out from the sky and struck the four of them. In a blink, the group was gone. Why do they have to be here anyway? Zeus asked blankly as all of his children, including the children he had through affairs with immortal women were present in the throne room, the place where he and Hera planned to have a warm welcome for Naruto. Speaking of his wife, she was pacing back and forth around the throne room, looking nervous and worried. He could understand what his wife was feeling, as he was also experiencing the same feelings but hid it better than her. What if something goes wrong? What will Naruto do when he reunites with them? What is he going to say to them for all the years Naruto had to live alone without his family in the elemental nations? He knew that Hera was also having similar thoughts. While the parents were worrying about their son, the other Olympians however were having different thoughts about the incoming blonde. Damn man, Apollo was chatting merrily with Hermes with his usual, shiny smile, displayed for all to see, much to their annoyance, I don't know what to say but, I think we're gonna have so much fun hanging out with Lil fish cake. You know, I think it's about time we did our jobs as big bros and take our lil bros to a brothel. A 17 years old hormonal teenager. Yeah, it's good to be young. The god of messengers nodded his head, and Naruto seems pretty fast too, I want to challenge him for a run already, his sandals flapped their tiny wings rapidly while the Olympian god grinned. Dionysus, as usual, was reading a wine magazine and really not that interested in Naruto. Being here was just an excuse for him to get away from Camp Half-Blood as long as possible, babysitting a bunch of disrespectful demigods could get boring in just a few hours after he received his punishment. Demeter was sitting beside the goddess of the hearth, Hestia who was tending the main hearth. Aside from Zeus and Hera, Hestia was one of the only goddesses that really wanted to get to know Naruto as a family member, which wasn't a surprise since it was her main domain. Demeter, however, do you think that he loves Serial Sister? Demeter asked, clearly unaware of the blonde's love for a more unhealthy kind of food even if ramen noodles were made of cereal. I don't know sister, the kind goddess shook her head with an amused smile. At the far side of the throne room, 
sitting on their respective thrones were the rest of the Olympians who were present in the Hall of the Gods. Hephaestus, I need you to fix these weapons up for me, Ares said loudly and dropped a magical bag full of weapons, from the traditional ones like swords, spears, shields to the more modern, heavy weapons like machine guns, explosives, RPGs. I need them in the best condition when little brother arrives, he said with a bloodthirsty grin. Why should I? Hephaestus grumbled, picking up a spear which had many cracks adorning it. He really wondered what Ares did these days when peace was a lot more spread out than before for his weapons to end up in this state, you're going to give them to him as a welcome home gift. No, I want to have enough firearms to show that Blondie who is the bigger man here, Hephaestus just shook his head. Since he currently didn't have anything to do, he took the bag and began to fix Ares' weapons. The last Olympian however was in her own little world. Aphrodite was looking at herself in a mirror, with her hand holding a pink lipstick and gently moving the tip on her kissable lips. What are you doing? Ares asked his lover with an annoyed tone. I'm making myself perfect. Aphrodite said as she winked at herself in the mirror, the makeup was applied flawlessly, the Prince of Olympus is going to arrive so I can't make myself look bad, can I? She giggled to herself. It was bad enough that Naruto had showed himself to be a better warrior than Ares, as much as he hated to admit that, and never will, the blonde also caught Aphrodite's interest as well. Not only was she making herself look even sexier than their daily routine, but she also took to her true form. As the goddess of beauty, Aphrodite could change her appearance at will, depending on the perception of beauty of the person she was in the presence of. But this power only applied to mortals, demigods and minor gods, as Olympians could see through her power and get to see her true form, which at the founding of Olympus had driven the gods mad with lust. She was more beautiful than any mortal's perception of beauty, breathtaking wasn't the right word to describe such an example of physical perfection. With deep sky blue eyes and long, curly golden blonde hair that flowed like a waterfall on her back and the sides of her beautiful visage, the latter which was perfectly decorated with magical makeup that seemed to enhance the woman's beauty even further. She was dressed in a skin-tight hot pink backless dress that hugged her otherworldly voluptuous figure and showed off her sexy curves, especially her wide hip and round ass. The dress was tied together behind her neck, with the upper part just enough to cover the front part of her large breasts and left the rest of her cleavage for all to see. Babe, you don't have to look perfect for a little, pretty boy who doesn't have a single drop of ichor in his veins. He tried to reason with her, leaning over and put his massive muscular right arm on the armrest of her throne, showing off his muscles. You do know that you have me, right baby? Even with these muscles, Naruto still has more charm than you dear. The smirk on Ares' face instantly dropped after hearing Aphrodite said that. He's so handsome, not to mention so adorable with those whisker marks it just gives him a feral look, it's so appealing. Dot and from what I've seen, he sure has lots and lots of stamina, Aphrodite daydreamed. This was just more reason for the god of war to punch Naruto's face in. Father, we're ready, Athena's voice rang inside Zeus's head which snapped him out of his musings. The master bolt instantly appeared in his hand and Zeus shot a massive bolt of lightning to the sky, making the other Olympians look at him in surprise before understanding what was about to happen. Naruto Uzumaki was about to come. About a minute later, a blue lightning bolt shot out from the sky and struck the throne room's floor, those who were standing near it instantly backed off to make the room for the ones who just arrived. Artemis and Athena were the first ones to appear from the lightning bolt, followed closely by Zoe. Naruto, however fell face first onto the ground crashing into the hard floor his clothes were singed and his hair became even spikier and blackened at the tips. Transportation like this, while very cool, made Naruto feel like Sasuke just punched him with a full-powered Chidori and the fact that he wasn't used to it, made him fall and look like an idiot. I'm good, he instantly got on his knees to his belongings which had fell out of his backpack before standing up with a large grin, I'm good, whoa. Damn, his eyes were as wide as dinner plates, totally amazed at the sight of the place he was in, which was big enough to make the Chunin exam arena look like a small closet. Twelve gigantic chairs with different kind of designs, the thrones of the gods, stood in a U-shape around the hearth. Even standing at a distance, Naruto could feel a massive amount of energy radiating coming from those thrones, which surprised him, 
this whole place has yet to blow up and could withstand such a powerful amount of energy. Naruto. The blonde was surprised once again when a beautiful brown-haired woman threw herself as him with tearful eyes, wrapping her hands around his neck and hugging him tightly against her body, openly crying. Normally Naruto would have blushed because of the sudden close contact with such a beautiful woman like her, but at e moment, a sudden familiar wave of warmth washed over him. Slowly looking down at her, he gasped. M mom. Yes. Yes. It's me Naruto. She looked at him and put a hand on his cheek. It's your mother, my baby boy. Naruto wanted to smile, to cheer in glee, but all he could do was let tears fall out from his eyes as he hugged the goddess who called herself his mother, his arms wrapped tightly around her. He had waited so long for this moment, to be able to feel the motherly love from his mother, who a month ago he thought was truly dead. A little moment in his mindscape wasn't enough to tell her how much he loved his mother, his family. You're wearing the scarf I made for you, Naruto looked at the green scarf he had wrapped around his neck. I found it a few days ago. Naruto nodded his head. Hey mom, where is dad? He pulled back and asked his mother, using his right hand to wipe away his tears, is he here? Yes my son, he's here, Hera nodded her head, letting go of her youngest child and stepped aside. Hello son. The king of the gods slowly approached his son with a smile on his face. Like Hera. While his appearance looked nothing like Minato Namikaze, he could feel the familiar feeling of his father coming from the man standing in front of him, the same feeling he felt when he met the Yondaimi in his mindscape during Pain's invasion and when his father came to his aid with the previous Hokages during the Fourth Shinobi War. This man was his dad, and he knew it. Hey Pops. Naruto grinned widely, walking towards Zeus. Zeus spread his arms a little to welcome his son in a fatherly hug. However. The instant Naruto got in front of his dad, Zeus found his son's fist buried in his stomach and delivered a massive blow into his abdomen, knocking the wind out of the king of the gods. Every Olympian save for Ares gasped at his sudden action. N Naruto. What the hell? He coughed. His son really knew how to punch. It had been ages since Zeus received a hard blow like that and he would never think that his youngest son would be the one who struck him this hard. That's for sealing Kurama into me. If someone ever asked him, Naruto would say that punching his father in the gut for the second time felt extremely good was an understatement. Well I think I do deserve, but he wasn't able to finish that sentence because Naruto's bandaged right hand suddenly engulfed in Kurama's chakra and went straight at his face, sending the proud and prideful king of the gods himself flying across the room, straight into the opposite wall with so much force that it shook the entire place violently. And that's for cheating on mom, bastard. Naruto said, loud enough so that Zeus from the other side of the hall could hear him loud and clear. Hera didn't know what to say. Her son just punched her husband in the face with so much force it sent the most powerful god flying like he was just a simple punching bag. A side of hers was so satisfied to have her beloved son stand up for her like that, which never happened before with her other sons but another side of hers wanted to scold her son for what he did. Damn. Apollo and Hermes said at once with dropped jaws, turning their eyes back and forth between Naruto and a stumped Zeus, who was wiping the ichor from the corner of his mouth and checking his slack jaw, which appeared to be punched out of the place by his human child. Wow! Did you see that Kurama? Naruto said in amazement while looking at his right hand, which had returned to normal, I think that with this new hand I really don't need to transform my whole body to fight. I agree but, was it necessary to do that? Kurama asked, sighing boringly. Well, he day, but he was stopped when his mother swatted him on the back of his head slightly. No fighting between family, understand. She told him with a motherly glare, the kind of eyes a mother gave to her child when she caught him with his hand in the cookie jar. Huh, yeah, but he does deserve it for cheating on you, Naruto said firmly, Athena told me everything after she called dad, father. I knew something was off with these gods thing. During the teleportation Naruto was able to force the goddess of wisdom to tell him everything and to say he was shocked to know that his father was literally a man whore was an understatement, cheating on his mother for thousands of years without stopping. Having a punch to the face from his son was the least kind of punishment Naruto could think about. So you know, Naruto nodded his head without even turning around to look at Zeus. From now on you better watch your move old man, or I'm going to kick your ass, 
Naruto turned around and glared at him with a smirk before turning around to look at his mother. So mom, can you introduce me to the rest of our big family? He asked with a happy smile. A palm then collided with his upper back in greeting as he stumbled forward to regain balance. Looking at the side the blonde saw a handsome looking teenager about 18 or 19, with sandy blonde hair and outdoorsy good looks, a bright and playful smile and a look that just screamed, movie star. The guy was very tall, taller than him by almost a head and was dressed in jeans, loafers, and a sleeveless t-shirt. But what surprised him the most was that his face greatly resembled a certain feisty moon goddess. Yo little bro, Apollo said with a bright smile. I take that you already know little sis over there. He pointed his thumb at Artemis, who was crossing her arms underneath her chest, but instantly turned to glare daggers at Apollo. Apollo for the thousandth time, we're twins. The goddess of the moon scolded. Plus, mother birthed me first. Whatever little sis, don't call me that. Naruto chuckled a little at the brother and sister's bickering. Well, good to see you Apollo. Naruto grinned at him. The name's Naruto. I know fish cake, Apollo said with a hint of humor in his tone and held out his fist, which Naruto punched it lightly, now we're talking, guy's shining smile stood no chance against this guy's bright smile, Naruto was sure of it. So, I take it we're half brothers, Naruto grinned at him, that's cool with me, he didn't have any problem with Zeus' other children, it just made the family he always wanted bigger. How do you do Naruto, a middle-aged man with a muscular build? curly black hair, blue eyes, elfish features, and a sly grin approached him. He was wearing a black suit and his shoes, the coolest thing about this man Naruto could think about was his shoes, which had a pair of tiny wings flapping slowly on each of them, I'm Hermes. God of messengers, astronomy, thieves, roads, swordsmanship and speed. Yeah, Athena forced me to remember every single detail, Naruto nodded his head, glancing at the goddess of wisdom a little before turning his eyes down Hermes' shoes with excitement. Can those things, you know, let you fly or something? You mean like this? Naruto whistled when Hermes' body was lifted off the ground and floated on the air with the help of his magical shoes. Where can I find one of those? Naruto asked, amazed. Suddenly, a thick and powerful scent of perfume hit his nose, the kind of perfume Eno and the more girlish girls of Konoha would use but about a hundred times or so stronger. What do you want Aphrodite? Naruto could hear annoyance in his mother's voice as the most beautiful and attractive woman he had ever seen in his life slowly approached him with an alluring smile on her face. How cold of you Hera? The goddess of love giggled, her blue eyes fixed on Naruto. Well hello there, handsome, her voice was sweet. He could hear Artemis sniggering mockingly behind him. Any advice about her, Kurama? Naruto asked his partner. This woman smelled exactly like trouble, she made his instincts go haywire. Athena never mentioned anything about this woman during her lectures and since she definitely didn't forget to, there must be a reason when the goddess of wisdom decided to not tell Naruto about something. Let's see, the fox scratched his chin slightly, your mother once told me about her. Aphrodite. The goddess of love and beauty. Oh. Naruto nodded his head, his mind replayed Artemis and Zoe's reaction when he asked about whether or not they had a love gods. And also of lust and sexuality. Naruto nearly fell face first to the ground. When it came to keep a close relationship, maybe she is only second to your dad. Hera always complained about her. Uh huh. She cheated on her husband. Who is your brother? Kurama groaned. These humans' relationships were too complicated for his liking, for her lover, who is also your brother. Ah, I think I get it now. Naruto, at the outside world, slammed his fist into his the palm of his other hand. Surprise everyone, I think I read about these kind of girls in a book Athena lent me. Oh, and, Aphrodite asked sultrily, slowly closing the gap between them. Let's see, the right word is, floor, no, no, score, um, score. Athena instantly knew what Naruto was going to say, whore. That's it, you're a whore. He declared like it was the most obvious thing in the world, leaving everyone stunned and froze in absolute shock. Aphrodite felt like her world was just shattered right in front of her eyes after hearing Natuto calling her that, a hey, whore. She had been called that many times before, to the point she was now completely immune to insults. But those insults were never said by a male 
most of the time it was Artemis, never a mortal man like him. And that pissed her off to no end. Ah sorry. She then used her charms peak. But what did you call me again Naruto dear? Kurama roared out in laughter before shaking his head, reacting rapidly and negating the affect of the goddess of love's charms peak. She is using her godly power to charm you Naruto, the fox warned, be careful. Sorry, but that won't work on me. He took a step forward and used his index finger to flick Aphrodite on her forehead, strong enough to push her down to the ground and stun her momentarily. Aphrodite gasped in shock when she fell on her backside. Her charm speak failed. Her charm speak never failed before. Not even the gods themselves could withstand the effect of her full-powered charm speak. If you know what is good for you Aphrodite, she heard Hera's voice talking to her through telepathy. Stay away from Naruto. He isn't someone you can play around with. The goddess of love bit her lips, it seems that she would have to wait for another opportunity. Naruto turned his head to the next god who was slowly approaching him. He was a huge and ugly lump of a man with his shoulders at different heights and a huge, bulging, misshapen head and his leg in a creaking steel brace, with a wild brown beard that sparks fire from time to time. He was the only Olympian he saw so far to show such extreme physical injuries, however, he was also very muscular. His face is red, lumpy and covered with welts. Hello. Naruto greeted him politely. Hello Naruto. Hephaestus' voice was deep, booming, and rumbly. I'm Hephaestus and I'm your brother. His eyes glanced to Hera slightly but quickly returned to Naruto quickly. Naruto saw bitterness inside his eyes. And as you can see, I. But Naruto stopped him by stepping forward and wrapped his arms around his brother's neck in a brotherly hug grinning from ear to ear as he held the god of smiths and craftsmanship in his arms. Hephaestus was stunned and looked at Naruto in confusion. None of his siblings, especially a certain warmonger, had showed this much brotherly affection towards him like Naruto. You have no idea how much I wanted to meet my, well, full-blooded siblings, he chuckled when he saw Zeus look down in guiltily, but what happened to you, you seem like someone who had been ran over by a train. Well, as I was saying, Hephaestus said, his usual, permanent scowl, disappeared, I'm not the most handsome kind of gods here. Nah, you're cool to me, Naruto patted the man's muscular arm playfully, I heard that you're very smart and talented in making things, how cool is that? Never judge a book by his cover. Hephaestus might be ugly, but he was extremely talented and could make almost anything, having such a cool brother like that was something he always wished for in a family. Well. If you say so, brother, a smile made it to his face when Hephaestus nodded his head at his younger brother. Hey mama's boy, voice laced with arrogance made Naruto turn his head slightly to see a rather tall handsome man with scarred cheeks and an oiled crew cut. He wore black jeans, combat boots, a leather duster, and muscle shirt with a bulletproof vest and an iron padlock necklace, red tinted wraparound sunglasses to cover his flame-filled eye sockets, come and greet your big brother. I take it that you're Ares, Naruto said blankly before a blank smile spread out on his face, well, hello. Show some respect to your elder's little punk. Ares pulled out his massive knife and twirling it in his hand. The only reason I didn't gut you right here for that disrespectful greeting is mom and dad's presence here. And the only reason I didn't do anything to you yet was because mom doesn't want violence between family members, Naruto said lazily. I like that kind of tone. Watch your steps punk, he walked towards Aphrodite and grabbed her by the arm, let's go dite. Hey, let go of me. Aphrodite shook her hand from the strong grip of her lover, feeling rather annoyed by his sudden action. So, I take that she's your wife, nay. He only had two older brothers and one of them was trying to pull the beautiful love goddess with him. It was not that hard to figure it out. Yes she is, Hephaestus grumbled. He used to love her a lot. But after 3,000 years of being cheated on constantly, he didn't feel any love to the love goddess anymore and would happily divorce to her if his mother allowed him to. Too bad for him thought, Hera was the goddess of marriage and there would be absolutely no chance for him to have their marriage bond broken. Ares left the place while mumbling about going to the mortal world to find a woman, as Aphrodite had refused to go back to his place this time. And nice to see you too brother, Naruto shouted over. The love goddess turned around and winked at Naruto, who just laughed forcefully at that. From what Kurama told him, 
Aphrodite was a woman with a happy-go-lucky attitude and immunity to insults similar to him. She was someone who usually just shrugged off insults and lived her days without caring about it one bit. Naruto could already see himself in a future with Aphrodite poking her head into every single corner of his life, as the goddess seemed to take a liking to him already. Oh how right he was. Forget about it. Now, Naruto looked around. Where is this super kind goddess of the hearth and family, who Athena told me about? I think she was talking about me. Another goddess walked toward him gracefully from the hearth, followed closely by a woman with long blonde hair the color of ripe wheat and wore a bright green dress with a dark cape, which gave her the appearance of a fresh plant breaking through fertile earth whenever she moved. She also wore a crown of woven corn leaves and adornments of poppies, and she had a scent of a rainstorm over a field of jasmine. Unlike Aphrodite whose beauty seemed otherworld, the goddess of love didn't have the kind of natural beauty Hestia, the goddess of the hearth, had. She was sweet and beautiful in an unpretentious way. She had an honest smile warm brown eyes, and black hair that framed her face in ringlets. She wore a plain, modest brown dress and kept her hair tucked under a linen shawl. Aunt Hestia right, Naruto smiled and hugged the black-haired woman tightly, who welcomed him with a tight hug. Welcome to Olympus, nephew, she smiled warmly at him after pulling back, and welcome to the family. Thank you, Aunt Hestia, Naruto smiled and turned to the last woman, and your Aunt Demeter right. Why yes I am. The goddess of the harvest nodded her head. Tell me Naruto, do you like cereal? She asked hopefully. Oh uh, no, truthfully it is one of my least favorite meals. Naruto shook his head and Demeter was taken aback by his declaration. I like ramen more, he smiled sheepishly. The blonde hair woman shook her head before turning away, huffing and flashing away with a scowl on her face. Uh, did I say something wrong? Of course not Naruto. Hestia shook her head with a kind smile, she is just upset that you don't like cereal that is all. Ahem, Zeus cleared his throat, now if everyone is done with their greetings and introductions, I would like you to all return to your duty, we can't leave the world running without the gods watching over it. Then I will return to the hunt father, Artemis was the first one to say that to the king of gods and put a hand on her lieutenant's shoulder, flashing both of them away in a silver flash. Naruto if you need any help. Feel free to ask, Athena told the blonde, who nodded gratefully, before flashing away as well. See you later, handsome, Aphrodite approached Naruto and tried to kiss his cheek goodbye, but the blonde blocked her lips with his bandaged hand. Ah, you're no fun at all, she winced playfully, playing hard to get. With that, she teleported away in a thick cloud of perfume, returning to her duty of spreading love and broken hearts all over the world. Naruto coughed while using his hand to blow the perfume away. Hard to get. He didn't even understand what she mean by that. Naruto, if you want any kind of ninja weapon made or just want to chat feel free to come over my forge. Hephaestus offered. Are you kidding me? Of course I will. He then reached his hand into his pocket and pulled out a kunai. Check this out. I don't think this world has this kind of metal so have a look at it. The god of smiths nodded his head and disappeared. Oya, oh yeah, I think it is about time I ride my baby around the world again, Apollo said cheerily to Naruto, sayonara bro, Naruto chuckled when the god flashed away in a blinding flash. If you need ant delivery made, or just want to hang out, contact me, Hermes said, cause I'm the fastest being alive, he teleported away as well. My place is here, Hestia walked toward the main hearth and sat down, you three should go somewhere else to have a family bonding moment. You don't have to tell a sister, both Zeus and Hera said at the same time before leading Naruto out of the throne room. Line break. Damn, Naruto muttered, standing at the cliff of Olympus with his hand leaning against the barrier, looking at the city below, you mean this mountain actually floats in the sky. Even from this place, high above the clouds Naruto could hear the sound of bustling in the city, with strange vehicles and people in strange outfits. He was looking at the city from the cliff of Olympus with his father who was standing next to him with his back leaning against the barrier. Hera, who decided to let Naruto have a few moments with his father, who didn't give a very good first impression to his son, had gone somewhere else and would return later. Naruto could also see a lot of tall buildings, called skyscrapers from this position as well, actually amazed by the capability of the humans of this world. 
Maybe when he returned to visit Konoha he would bring the idea of making skyscrapers back with him to the elemental nations as well. Yes, Olympus is originally located on Mount Olympus in Greece. It has steadily moved over to the west, following the heart of Western civilization over the centuries. Zeus nodded his head. Instead of being located on a physical mountain, it is a metaphysical duplicate. This mountain does not connect with the ground and cannot be detected by mortals due to the mist. The two stood in silence for a moment before Naruto decided to speak up. Dad, can I ask you a question? Of course my son. Why did you cheat on mom? Naruto asked. His voice remained as calm as possible. Was she not enough for you? I had nothing to say for my actions in the past Naruto. Zeus shook his head. I fathered too many children with other women. Athena, Artemis, Apollo, Hermes. But you Naruto. The god turned to his son with a smile, you're my redemption to her. After everything I had done, Hera agreed to start everything over with me, not as immortals, but as two normal humans, he then chuckled, well, not entirely normal, but we did start over. I came to love her again, more than ever, Zeus looked at Hera who was running toward them with a basket in her hand. We got each other once again with the love of two mortals, unaffected by Aphrodite because we formed it in a different dimension, you're the result of that love. All right dad. Naruto smiled at him, and you better keep it that way or else a punch won't be the only thing you will get from me. But for some reason, something was telling him there were more to this. Okay guys. Hera smiled at them, kneeling on a colorful picnic sheet in the basket next to her, come here. Zeus looked at Hera in confusion while Naruto just grinned and sat down in front of his mother with his legs crossed. Come on dad, come here, Naruto called him. I made some of your favorite ramen Naruto. Hera reached her hand inside the basket and pulled out a few bowls of ramen and since she already took out about a dozen of them, the basket must be a magical thing to be able to contain that many, and since I don't really know which ones you like the most, I made everything I can think of. Wow. This many mom. Naruto asked, picking up a bowl and took a sniff, and it smells good too, you made this yourself in such a short time. Of course I made them myself. Naruto looked at her, okay okay, I did make them with the help of magic, but I didn't just summon them. Now eat up Naruto. Hera smiled, eat and tell us everything. Naruto opened the first bowl of ramen and took the chopsticks from his father, starting to eat while retelling his story at Elemental Nations. From the day he became a genin to the day Sasuke left the village then Naruto and his friends nearly lost their life to the Yanan Shuf not for the help of the Sand siblings and Lee. He retold his fight with Sasuke at the Valley of the End and his departure with Jiraiya for the two and a half years training trip. Hera scowled a little when she heard the part where Jiraiya tried to make Naruto read his Ika Ika Paradise series while his father just laughed it off while shaking his head. Naruto used to think about what was it felt like to have a family that you could return to, a real family where you could share the most important moments with them. And he finally understood that feeling. Later. Clang. Clang. The sound of a hammer hitting hot metal could be heard all over the forge of Hephaestus. You work here. Naruto asked as he picked up a celestial bronze sword from the basket full of weapons made in the same metal. It was 9 o'clock in the morning and after saying goodbye to his parents who returned to their duty after their unofficial picnic he began to wander around Olympus and Hephaestus's forge was the first place he visited, what is this metal anyway? Celestial bronze, the powerful metal used by the gods, Hephaestus explained, it is mined by the Cyclops from Mount Olympus. The ore is shaped by tempering the metal in Mount Etna and pooling it in the river Lethe. I take that it it's hard to make, Naruto swung the sword around. Try stabbing yourself. Hephaestus returned to his work, because our parents gave birth to you in artificial mortal bodies, you're fully mortal therefore it is useless against you, there wasn't a single drop of godly blood within Naruto, so the celestial bronze would pass through him harmlessly. Just like Hephaestus said, Naruto touched the sharp edge of the sword and he didn't feel anything at all. He could still feel the weight of this sword and yet he didn't feel it cut him in the slightest. He then tried to do something more extreme, putting his hand on the table Naruto took out a celestial bronze knife and stabbed his hand with it. He waited for the pain, yet it never came. Cool. Naruto grinned before turning to Hephaestus, you need any help. He asked when the god thrust the weapon into water to cool it down. Don't worry, 
There is nothing I can't handle. Line break. What can I say? Hephaestus chuckled as he sat down on his chair, using a rag to wipe away his sweat. It wasn't every day that I have so many useful workers like this. He could use his machines, but it looked like Naruto and his clones worked more effectively. Clones could be seen everywhere around the large forge of Hephaestus, as they were doing everything they were assigned to. From sorting weapons to moving objects, with Naruto's superhuman strength his clones made work look easier than usual. Clang. Careful, Hephaestus called out to the original, who was trying to make his very first weapon. You won't be able to get it into shape if you hit it too lightly. So I should hit it with more strength. Naruto grinned and went into sage mode, raising the hammer above his head. Fine then, he slammed the hammer down the glowing hot sword. However due to the strength he used behind that hammering was too great, it not only completely broke the incomplete sword in half but also the table the anvil underneath used for crafting was sitting on as well. Damn kid, Hephaestus roared in laughter as Naruto looked at the hammer while scratching the back of his head, unsure what just happened, you really pack some serious strength there. Naruto chuckled and put the hammer down, it didn't take him long to realize that he wasn't good at crafting like his brother. But this was just the beginning of Naruto Uzumaki's new adventure in this new world. Give up Ares, Naruto said coolly as he blocked the massive broadsword swung to his head with the back of his bandaged and chakra reinforced hand. A handgun, as the god of war called it, appeared in his hand and he instantly pointed it at Naruto's face, pulling the trigger not a second later. However, what he didn't expect was for Naruto to jerk his head out of the way so fast that Ares saw an afterimage, making the bullet miss its target. I'll say it again, it's no use, Naruto disarmed Ares by kicking his arm only for the god to grab his little brother's foot and tug on it to throw him away. Naruto back flipped in the air and landed gracefully on the ground, using chakra to propel himself to into Ares' personal space and using the momentum to bury his knee into the god's stomach which was followed with a fast punch to the face. Artemis was right, Naruto mused as he sent the man who was double his size flying back like a ragdoll, smashing him head first into the outside wall of the throne room. His mother had prohibited any kind of family fighting, but Naruto had no choice but give his older brother one hell of a beating for messing around with him. A few hours ago, it had been two days since Naruto moved to his parents' world and he had more or less gotten used to the godly realm. He spent half of his time here exploring every single square meter of the mountain, taking in everything that was in sight. To say Naruto was amazed by the incredible architecture of Mount Olympus was an understatement, as he had never seen something like this before and Olympus truly lived up to its name as the home of the gods. He learnt that aside from the winter solstice or the rare emergency meetings, the gods were free to go do whatever they wanted, taking care of their domains to make sure the mortal world would be functioning perfectly. While his mom and dad were busy, they tried to spend as much time with him as possible, especially his mother. She tried to smother him with love every instance she had some time to spare. They mainly talked about Naruto's life at Konoha and Hera sometime asked about the more, private part of his life. His dad, Zeus always appeared to remind Hera of her duty at the goddess of marriage. While Naruto's relationship with his father had become better, the blonde still hadn't forgiven Zeus for his affairs. Three days away from winter solstice and Naruto already got tired of the citizens of Olympus asking him about his name or how a mortal was able to get to Olympus. The only ones who knew about his existence were the Olympians and it would take some time for the whole godly world to know about his existence so he would have to wait till the yearly meeting of the Olympians to be known. Hephaestus was the only Olympians that always remained in Olympus and Naruto spent a few hours every few days with his brother, helping him in the forge. Last night, he slept at his mother's temple and everything about it gave him a warm cozy feeling of familiarity, just as he expected from the house of the goddess of the perfect family. As a goddess, his mother didn't need to sleep like him, but he could feel her motherly love for him after waking up in the morning. It was six in the morning and Naruto was still exploring his new home, passing the group of beautiful women called nymphs who occasionally went into giggling fits after stealing glances at him. Some of the minor gods greeted him while others demanded to know his reason to be in their amazing presence. Naruto simply replaced himself with a wooden log every time they pestered him. Later, the blonde was standing in front of what seemed to be a giant metal block, with the metal doors closed together at the front and some kind of weird designs on top of it. 
Reaching into his pocket Naruto pulled out the notebook he used to take note of everything Athena told him about Olympus, just in case he saw something new that didn't exist in his world. The blonde found out that the thing in front of was called an elevator, the only thing that connected Olympus to the mortal world, or the Empire State Building, the highest building in New York City. Hum, Nerut scratched his chin, holding the notebook in front of him while moving his finger towards the control panel, curious what would happen if he pressed one of the button. But suddenly, the familiar strong and thick scent of perfume alerted Naruto as his notebook was taken from his hand, turning to the side Naruto saw the infamous goddess of love standing next to him, radiating beauty and sexuality like no other. Uh, hey, good morning, Naruto greeted her with his trademark smile. When your parent was a god and goddess, seeing someone having such incredible and unimaginable beauty was something you got used to after a while. Good morning handsome, the goddess of love giggled and the notebook in her hand faded away as she closed the distance between them. You know, why are you bothering to write in that pesky notebook when I would be more than happy to give you a more, private tour, hem. She stood right in front of him, with Naruto a little taller than her which gave him a very generous view of her cleavage, come on, let me show you everything. That was when Naruto realized something Aphrodite and Tsunade shared in common. They were both old, their appearance didn't match their age and they both liked to expose their bust, only Aphrodite was hundreds of times or so older than the god I'm Hokage. Uh, okay, since I don't have anything to do anyway, she didn't use that charm power of hers, so Naruto was more or less cool with that. Poor or not, cheating on his brother for thousands of years or not, she was a part of his big family and he planned to spend some time to bond with each of them after all. But before they could start make any step, Naruto's stomach suddenly grumbled loudly, making Aphrodite look at him in amusement and, as a woman, slight disgust. Hee hee, I'm kind of hungry, it wasn't like he didn't have breakfast before starting to wander around Olympus, his mother left him with a very, healthy, breakfast at her palace waiting for him when he wake up. The tradition breakfast any mother would make for their children in the morning, with bacon, eggs, sausage, beans and toast, one of the most delicious breakfasts he ever had in his life. However such breakfast only applied to the children of this world. Him, he would need more than just a dish of that to fill him in the morning. Okay, then let's make this a picnic shall we? Aphrodite clapped her hands together and in a flash, her clothes changed to a white, tight-fitting top that clung to her upper body like a second skin, with a large pink heart at the middle, short jeans that barely reached her mid-thighs and a white large hat on top of her head, in her hand was a basket, let's go, she instantly pulled Naruto with her. Since Hera wasn't on Olympus at the moment, this was the opportunity she was waiting for to get into Naruto's pants. Hey, wait up, he shouted after her, they arrived in a wide garden which acted as the mountains, park, but this place was more like a place to honor the Olympians as he could see there spread out, wearing different kind of armors and costumes and in different heroic poses. He even saw a statue of his father and mother, with his dad wearing some kind of a dress that showed off his massive muscles holding his wife's hand as they leaned their head against each other. Well here you go, she reached her hands into the basket and pulled out a dark green bottle with two glasses, I'm imagining a fancy hotel with champagne and candles when we have times together like this, but this is okay for now. Champagne? Naruto took the bottle and saw the word, champagne, written on it, some kind of wine? Why yes. Can you summon ramen datbeo? Naruto asked with a smile, putting the bottle down. Ramen, that Japanese starch, she visited Japan many times before, where do you think hentai anime and manga came from? So of course she would know about its national dishes. Hey, it's the food of the go. Well, the food's more than worthy to be listed at the food of gods, since he learnt that ambrosia and nectar were the only things gods ate, he couldn't call his favorite dishes the food of the gods anymore. Aphrodite looked at him like he was crazy, but shrugged it off. Since I'm the goddess of love, I can only summon dishes that eaten in romantic dinners, she picked up the champagne bottle. Combine this with a fancy restaurant with light music, long candles, roses and complete privacy and it would have everything a couple would like to have a good time. What with that face? She asked, nearly yelled. Oh. All right then, Naruto nodded his head with a straight face, so can I have ramen? Sigh. I told you I can't summon ramen, tell Apollo to do that for you, she brought out a pink box wrapped in a beautiful white ribbon, but I have this, 
only the best kind of French chocolate, the richest and most scrumptious you can find. Naruto took a piece from her and threw it into his mouth. The chocolate was really bitter and he wanted to spill it out the moment he took it in. This chocolate was way bitterer than the one he had in Konoha every once in a while. However the more he chewed, the stranger it became. Naruto couldn't explain it with words, it was like bitter and sweet at the same time, he gulped the piece of chocolate down and felt heat spread all over his body. W wow, it's delicious, bitter at first but, yeah, can't say I have had such a unique flavor before, he told her making Aphrodite giggle. Well, then have some more, she opened the bottle and poured a little into Naruto's glass, have some of this too, honey, she told him smiling sweetly. Thank you. Naruto smiled and put the next piece of chocolate into his mouth, taking the glass of wine from the beautiful goddess, Aphrodite can I ask you a question? Go on, she nodded her head. I know that my brother wasn't the best good looking guy in the world, or even the godly world, Aphrodite then frowned, but why did you, there was always a reason for one's actions, Naruto had learnt that with his life. Unlike his father, Aphrodite was the goddess of love, making her the one who understood love better than anyone else. Like Athena, the goddess of wisdom who represented her domains perfectly, Naruto could see that everything about Aphrodite was about love and lust. With his power, it was clear to him that his sister-in-law held no feelings for Hephaestus in the first place, then how come she didn't marry Ares, her lover as Karama told him. But before he could finish his question, Naruto suddenly shot forward and grabbed Aphrodite's shoulders, pulling her out of the way just in time to avoid a gigantic axe swung down from above. The blonde steadied himself on the ground with the goddess of love behind him, his eyes focused on his attacker, Ares the god of war. You have good reflexes punk, I'll give you that, the god of war smirked, picking his axe up and putting it on his shoulder. Well next time you try to teleport behind me, make sure not to do it with someone with big and clear blue eyes like Aphrodite in front of me, he told the god of war. The god's way of transportation was really annoying, if it wasn't for Aphrodite's eyes reflecting Ares, he didn't know if he would have reacted in time to pull Aphrodite out of the place or not. Ares, what the hell are you doing? The goddess of love asked angrily, and did you just try to attack us? The both of us? She nearly yelled. Stay away from my woman Uzumaki. The goddess of war was pretty angry right now, combine that with his carnal needs that hadn't been satisfied by the one behind Naruto, one could say that he wasn't in the right mood for rejection, and I might just break some of your bones. First, she's Hesphestus's wife, our sister-in-law not your woman Jack, ah, jackass, Naruto smirked, second, why do I have the feeling that if we don't settle down right here, you will keep bugging me for a proper fight in the future? You got it brat, he turned his eyes to Aphrodite, get out of the way woman, your flesh will be a nice trophy after I finish little bro here in his place, he was as horny as hell so maybe he was going to finish this fight fast and get his juicy reward. The fight started faster than the goddess of love could follow the moment Ares finished that statement, she felt her surrounding change magically. You stay here, she saw a Naruto clone standing next to her and another making a jump to avoid Ares' giant axe a hundred meters away from them, boss told me to protect you, the Naruto standing next to her smiled and gave her a thumbs up. The goddess of love couldn't help but gasp, even though she already saw this ability during Naruto's fight with Ares, she couldn't help but feel amazed and wonder if there was any more use to this power of cloning. You know that you're way too slow Ares. Naruto said as he dodged all the sharp blades swung at his head, looking like he wasn't trying at all when he stepped to the side to avoid the god of war's attack. You bet ya little punk, let's see if you're faster than this, an M16 appeared in his hand and the god jumped back to make some distance, licking his lips in a sadistic manner before unloading a barrel of bullets at Naruto. But Ares never expected Naruto to be even faster than bullets. Naruto, actually wondering what kind of weapon was that, took a few milliseconds to examining the bullets coming at his head. But it didn't take a genius to know something with the pointing tip moving at that kind of speed was dangerous, as Naruto disappeared and reappeared even faster than those bullets, playing around with a wide grin. Oops, you missed me, missed me again, every time he appeared he said with an amused tone. Pulling a kanai out from his pouch the blonde chose a bullet and used the flat edge of his kanai to send it back, here you go. The bullet went straight into the gun much to Ares' shock, he didn't manage to stop his trigger in time so his weapon exploded right in his face, the metal pieces smashed into his nose and his forehead much to his anger. Damn, didn't know it could do that, Naruto smirked. 
Hey, where can I find one of them? Damn you. Ares roared and summoned a sword and shield, standing to his godly height which completely towered over Naruto. What the- the blonde managed to say before Ares smashed his shield down to the ground, but Naruto was faster and kicked into the celestial bronze surface, launching out of the way before the sword can get in contact with his head. Naruto then took several feet back, gathering natural energy in just a matter of second before shooting himself forward with his fist brought back. You know what people say about size? Naruto shouted as Ares raised his shield to block, the bigger you are, the harder you fall. Naruto punched the shield with incredible amount of force and did something Ares would never think about. The ground underneath them cracked and a giant hole then appeared because of the collision between Naruto's fist and the shield. Ares gasped when he felt the force of Naruto's punch actually went through the hard shield itself and smashed into his body, sending him flying without anything to stop him. Ares flew like a bullet, going through building after building which didn't do anything to decrease the speed. The god of war roared out in shock when he was shot out of Olympus, passing over the edge and falling freely down to the city bellow. Damn you Uzumaki! The blonde heard him roar out in anger. Suck it! Jackass, Naruto stood straight up but, the hell now, in a red flash Ares once again appeared behind him with a gigantic broad sword in hand, haven't you realized that it's no use against me? Present it wasn't like Naruto enjoyed doing this anyway beating the holy crap out of his brother, it made him feel like Sasuke years ago. Yield Ares, Naruto said as he knocked the god of war down to the ground, whose face covered in bruises and cuts. Godly endurance was something really new to him, he didn't think that someone could receive such a beating like this and stay conscious. But thanks to Athena, he perfectly understood the god's limit and didn't hold anything back. I think he had enough, Aphrodite appeared next to him with the help of his clone, thanks, handsome. She winked at the clone, getting a laugh from him before disappearing away in a puff of smoke. The goddess of love clicked her finger and a few nymphs appeared, bowing their head to the goddess of love. Bring him to Apollo's palace girls, the goddess of love said. Yes, Lady Aphrodite, they said at once and brought a half-conscious Ares away. Naruto, Aphrodite turned around to face the blonde, who was dusting himself. I have never seen Ares being beaten around like that before, you were incredible. Thanks for the compliment, Naruto grinned at her. Ares might be the god of war, but he didn't seem to have the fighting skills to back it up like Artemis. So handling him wasn't such a difficult task for Naruto, anyway, can I have some more of that? The rest of Naruto's morning was spent in the goddess of love's company, listening to her rant about candy and trying out everything she could summon. These chocolate and candy tasted really good, the champagne was outstanding, but he still preferred ramen over the other. Line break later that night, Find a book called Greek Mythology and you will understand why I cheat on your brother. Aphrodite's last words for him resounded in his head as Naruto headed to Athena's palace, the only place he could think of that had the information he was searching for. He didn't like this feeling one bit, but the closer he got to Athena's palace, the more he felt himself worried about it like he was about to discover a horrible truth. Aphrodite told him that the book was about the mortals' point of view about the gods they worshipped and she did warn him that not everything inside that book was a nice thing to read. She said that it was going to change his point of view about this world, that he would never look at his parent in the same way again. Naruto was totally shocked by the goddess of love's words and it made him want to find out the truth even more than before. Knock. 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 He knocked on Athena's temple's door three times, hoping that she was here. He waited for 10 seconds before the stormy grey-eyed goddess opened the door. She seemed to be a little surprised when she saw Naruto. Naruto. What are you doing here at this time? Time was meaningless for a god, but for a mortal like him, it mean a lot. Athena, can I use your library? The goddess of wisdom widened her eyes a little. I want to borrow some books. The sound of something falling snapped Athena out of her train of thought. The book she was reading was closed as she stood up from her seat and walked over to the direction the noise came from, looking at the door that led to her personal, huge library only to nearly gasp in shock upon seeing some of the bookcases lying on the ground stacked on each other. What the? A scowl made it to her face when she remembered who was in there, the only person she gave full admission to enter. You got to be kidding me, Athena muttered under her breath. Moreover, here she thought this child of Zeus and Hera was better than his warmonger brother who once made all the bookcase of her library collapse the same way his younger brother did today. 
she stomped towards the library section of her palace with the intent to kill the one who was destroying her collection. But before she could even reach the place, an orange blur went past her before she could even see what it was. Slightly knocked back because of the wind caused by the speed of the movement, Athena ignored the strange phenomenon and continued to walk to her library. Just like she thought, every single bookcase had fallen to the ground. Books were lying all around the floor of her library and for someone like Athena, this looked like her worst nightmare. The worst part was that there was a bookcase on the wall at the other side of the room, which looked like it was punched across the room and stuck to the wall. Looking around, Athena tried to search for the destroyer of her library but couldn't find anyone other than herself standing inside it. Curious, Athena recalled the orange blur and realized it must have been Naruto trying to get out of the place before she could get to him. Sighing, Athena clicked her fingers and everything was slowly moving back into place. But something caught her eyes when she picked up a few books on the ground, it was lying open on the table used for reading. Her eyes widened when she realized what that book was about. Greek mythology, at the same time, Naruto ran, he ran like never before across the field of Olympus, crossing streets at lightning speed and almost knocking over a handful of minor gods. His body was covered in Karama's chakra, his eyes pupils were showing the combination of sage mode and biju mode. Through the use of senjutsu, he could feel them all, every single immortal being living on Olympus, including his family. When he reached the cliff, Naruto did the first thing anyone with a lot of troubles on his mind would do, if he had balls of steel that is. He took the jump. He had enough of this place. He wanted to go somewhere else. He wanted to have some alone time to clear his mind. Naruto. Don't. His head snapped to the side and saw the beautiful love goddess Aphrodite standing there with her hand reached out, her eyes wide and her mouth wide opened in shock. She probably thought he was doing something very stupid, which, according to common sense, he was. It wasn't like falling from the floating mountain above the highest building of New York could kill him. However her shout made him slip a bit, his right foot slammed into the balcony, making Naruto lose his balance and fall off Olympus head down. Shit. Fuck you Aphrodite. That was the only curses he knew, he had read it from a book he borrowed from Athena's collection when she was in his world. Naruto twisted his body in the air, balancing himself before pressing both of his arms as close to his body as he could, his feet stuck together in order to eliminate most of the wind resistance. Mount Olympus was the highest point he had ever jumped from so hopefully he would be able to land on the ground without any broken bones. Naruto. Not now Karama, I need some fresh air, Naruto told his partner, letting the sound of wind blowing around him south his nerves. Some of things he read from Greek mythology, everything that was written from the mortal's point of view, were sickening and downright horrifying. Aphrodite had told him to read it to find out the reason behind her affairs. He did find it, along with a lot of interesting things about his family, though he was not so sure he should be calling them that now. However, what made him sad, not angry, but very, very sad was that most of it came from his own parents. He didn't think that he could look at them the same way again, dot his parents. The Empire State Building was in sight, Naruto once again twisted his body on the air so both of his feet could make the contact with the building. His chakra moved from his stomach to the cores of his feet, ready to stick to the vertical surface of the building. With his amazing skills and control, Naruto managed to land both of his feet on the vertical surface of the building, his hand reached out and stuck to the building, also having a large yet controlled quantity chakra on them to slow him down. Naruto slid on the hard surface of the building, slowly decreasing his falling speed. The mist will cover you, so don't worry, Karama advised him after realizing that he just slid across a window with a man standing on the inside holding window wiper in his hand. How does that work anyway? Naruto asked, mostly to himself. Unlike the elemental nations, Earth had something called the mist, which covered the mortal's eyes from the unnatural things around them. As far as he was concerned, he wasn't affected by the mist and he was very pleased to know that. Not knowing what happened around him was not a good thing, especially for a shinobi. When his speed finally returned to normal, he took a strong jump, cracking the window a bit. Landing on the ground as gently as he could, Naruto fixed his jacket and looked around. This was his first time in the mortal world, New York to be exact but he was not keen on traveling and sightseeing. Line break, more, Naruto told the barmaid with a very lazy tone. Aren't you too young to drink this much? She asked, 
her hand pouring the wine into Naruto's cup and he, once again drank it in one gulp. Old enough to kill, old enough to drink, Naruto muttered to himself. That statement was something he got from some drunk shinobi drinking with each other after a day of hard work. Strange. What is this wine anyway? It wasn't like he never drank before, after all. Most of his role models were either an alcoholic, Tsunade, or perverts with a love for bars, Jiraiya, Kakashi and Aruka, even if the latter would not admit it. Drink to forget, Naruto thought. As soon as he found out a place that resembled the bars around the elemental nations, he went in despite having no money to pay for the fees later. Naruto immediately ordered the strongest drink they had and began to drink himself silly, he didn't remember how many times he had asked the waitress to fill his cup but the last time he stopped counting, it was an hour ago. Vodka. The waitress shook her head before heading to serve someone else after filling Naruto's cup once again, wondering how someone as young as him could handle so much alcohol, she didn't complain either way, as long as the guy had money, he could kill himself for all she cared. Naruto kept on drinking for another hour before reaching his limit, his vision a little blurry, not because he was drunk but the fact that there were so many things on his mind. Folding his hands on the table, Naruto rested his head against them and closed his eyes. No sooner did he do that, he found something interesting happening right in front of him. I usually do not drink, the woman who just sat down on the chair beside him said, but I think I will make an exception this time. Give me the same thing he's having, she told the waitress casually. The beautiful woman was drawing a lot of attention from the opposite around the bar with her incredible beauty, not to mention she was also sitting next to quite a specimen. Aunt Hestia, a small smile made it to his face when he realized who she was, did my parents tell you to come here to get me? No, Naruto, Hestia said softly, I came here by myself. The goddess of the hearth moved her fingers and smiled sadly at him. How does it feel Naruto? She asked him even though she knew most of the answer. Naruto didn't why but he felt as if the only one he could trust right now with his problems was Hestia. Sad, yes, hurt, probably, betrayed, of course, tricked, sure, angry, not really, he muttered under his breath even though she could hear him loud and clear. He then turned his head to the goddess, Aunt Hestia, how can you put up with them for so long? You're a kind and very peaceful goddess and probably the only one who is still in my good book. Because they're my family, Naruto, Hestia said softly. So it was true, Naruto muttered. He still had some doubts over what he read but now he finally found out it was all real, family doesn't throw their member from Olympus to the ground when he was a baby. Naruto said with the emotionless tone, family doesn't fight over each other to decide who is the most beautiful which results in a war killing thousands of people. The list went on and went on, to the point Naruto hardly believed that some of them were real. I don't know what to do anymore Aunt Hestia. Naruto grabbed his face, looking at the glass of vodka in front of him, they're my parents and yet, they did something unforgivable so randomly just because they are gods and powerful, he then thought about Aphrodite, they forced Aphrodite to marry my brother, someone who she clearly doesn't love. Despite the thing everything she did, how could they force a love goddess to marry someone she doesn't love? For someone who is just getting used to this world, this is a lot to take in, isn't it? Naruto couldn't help but nod his head. I need time to think, time to accept this. Those were the things they did in the past and I. I can't change it, he whispered and drank his wine in one gulp, the past is the past. The only thing I can do now is to look at the future. Then suddenly a lightning bolt struck. Said lightning bolt seemed more powerful than normal ones. Zeus is calling for a meeting of the Olympians, sooner or later they will come searching for you Naruto, Hestia told him, pulling out a stack of dollars and giving it to the barmaid. I will let them try, Naruto muttered. I don't think I should return to Olympus at this time Andy, I might blow the whole place up if I do so, he said truthfully. He really wanted to blow something up right now, can you? Dot not tell them? Of course Naruto, I respect your decision, Hestia nodded her head, but, what are you going to do now? I don't know. But I think I can manage to find something to do to pass time and know what I need to do, to me and also the ones living in the sky. Naruto said, it's too bad that now I don't have any way to go back to the elemental nations. You can find that help from me Naruto, Hestia smiled at him, if you want I can secretly bring you back to your home in the elemental nations. But you have to promise me that you won't stay there forever. This place, this family needs someone like you Naruto, she said. 
I will ante, Naruto nodded his head, leaning his head back against his chair and closing his eyes. In the blink of an eye, Hestia disappeared, as if she never sat next to him in the first place. Looking at Hestia's glass of vodka, he saw that she didn't even touch it at all. Reaching his hand to the cup, Naruto put it close to his mouth, drank the strong substance in one gulp before standing up, and getting out of the bar. Two years later, she couldn't see their face. Only the back of two men, one was a tall blonde with spiky golden hair wearing an orange jacket and black pants while the other with straight black hair, navy blue sash wrapped multi-times around his head and dark color cloth. Miraculously, they both standing on top of two lightning rod of two skyscrapers as if they were standing on the ground, seemingly unfazed by the unimaginable hurricane around them. Sasuke. Yeah? Thanks for coming. I always know that I can trust my back to you, the blond man smiled before suddenly his entire body engulfed in flame, golden flame as black marks appeared around his body. Hum. You dragged me into this Naruto, want it or not, his companion replied shortly, purple flame appeared around him before materializing into a gigantic ribcage, shall we do this? And you want to ask? The blonde-haired man shouted and they both launched each other at two different directions just as a gigantic hand shot down from the black stormy sky, trying to grab one of them but fail. The angry roar of a monster from the deepest part of her mind woke Caitlin Sharp from her sleep, making her fell from the chair she was leaning on to the floor of the running car she was in. She was a woman who was in her late 30, but looking no older than a woman who was in her mid-twenties with dark brown hair and dark color eyes with shapely figure. Caitlin, are you all right? A woman wearing a business suit asked worriedly abandoning the paperwork she was doing on the table and running over to the teenager girl, who was holding her head, slightly hurt from the impact. I'm all right, Mrs. Kathy, Caitlin smiled at the woman, Kathy but her head was still hurt a little. I heard you screamed before falling to the ground. What happened? Kathy asked before a frown made it to her face, you had those nightmares again, hadn't you? Yes Mrs. Kathy, Caitlin nodded her head before looking at the older woman with begging eyes, Please Mrs. Kathy, can I use those sleeping bills, the nightmares are getting worse and worse. I. I don't think I can't handle it, sleeping bills were the only things that helped Caitlin had a good night's sleep because from the day she was a little girl, she had been having these dreams. I'm sorry Caitlin, but you know that they are not good for your health, the blonde young woman sighed in defeat, plus, it not happen very often now so I guess you don't have to worry, soon they will all gone and you will be fine. Okay. The girl nodded her head and stood up, returning to her chair and leaned her head on the window, looking at the dark, raining street outside, all the sleepiness had disappeared anyway. Beautiful, wealth, talent. Caitlin Sharp got it all. She was the daughter of the leader of the Sharp Group, one of the current most powerful joint stock corporations in the world, who got their hands on almost any aspects in life, especially the economy of the United States of America. However unlike her brother who was working at the company at the position of chief officer operation, she had no talent over politicize and absolutely no leadership. However, it wasn't like Caitlin was useless, quite opposite actually. She dreamed to be a singer at age 4 and an actress at age 5, 8 years old her dream came true when she became a special guest in a music movie. Since then her talent in singing spread all over the world and now, at the age of 19, she was one of the most successful and popular singers, if not the most at her age around the world. Therefore, instead of leading an entire empire by skills, money, Caitlin chose to lead thousand and thousand, billion and billion people by her voice and her acting. Just like any girls her age, Caitlin still goes to school, university at this age. During her time touring around the world, she had tutors in order to keep up with her education and Caitlin was proud to say that she was able to get into one of the best school in the world, Harvard College. Currently she was on her way back to school, after traveling to China and had a show there. Of course, since she was already a singer and actress, there was no need for her in learning them right now, but her father still forced her in doing so. Sighing, the beautiful blonde girl looked at the world outside her crystal clear blue eyes mirroring the raining drops on the windows. The nightmares, Caitlin thought, eventually they would return to her and disturb her sleep once again. She never understood the meaning behind each dreams, nor were they relate to each other. However, lately, that blonde man had always appeared in her dreams since a month ago. 
She never seen his face, but she did watch him do some unimaginable things before the scary roars or ugly faces woke her up from her sleep. Reaching for her diary hidden deep inside her backpack, Caitlin opened the book and began to write down everything she could remember in her dream and draw the picture of a gigantic creature that its upper body was taller than any skyscrapers. Line break. Man, this shit is so damn good. Naruto Uzumaki moaned out in satisfaction as he took a bite of the hot dog in his hand, grinning ear to ear while chewing happily, which, by far was the impossible fact that was yet to archive by any human. He was wearing bright orange shirt with black jacket wore outside, black pants and black Converse sneakers, an orange backpack laid on the chair next to him as he sat cross-legged looking at the city in front of him. Naruto's hair remained the same way it was these past two years, as spiky as possible and as bright as golden sunlight. Two years had passed since his leaving and Naruto had finally adapted to the mortal world called America around one and a half year ago. Now, if they didn't know his true identity, they would mistake Naruto for your everyday New Yorker, even though he was 202 miles away from the city. Yes, he was in Boston, Massachusetts. Took him a couple of days to get here, by foot actually but he managed to get away from the heart of Western civilization, away from the so-called Moton of the Gods. And of course, away from Artemis hunting wolves and incredible tracking skills. Even though he knew after day of Ho's leaving the Gods were searching for Naruto all over the world, Naruto didn't know how or why but Artemis in her hunt was the one who was able to get close to him the most. Sure she wasn't be able to see him, let alone catch him but every time an auburn-haired woman appear, Naruto understood that sooner or later her arrows would find the way to the place where the sun don't shine. He could feel her emotions every time he saw her across the street and not every time they were positive. To tell the truth, the negative emotions became much worse every time he managed to escape right under her nose. At least he found a way to hide his present now, Artemis' present stopped appearing about three months ago, probably still searching for him somewhere else. Wasn't it so cool to be able to get away from the hunting goddess? Standing up, Naruto pushed the last of the hot dog into his mouth and turned around, throwing the orange backpack onto his left shoulder Naruto head to the nearest bus station to head to the place where Uruka or any other teachers at Ninja Academy would never imagine he was able to get into, even though the education here was a bit different. Grinning ear to ear, Naruto climbed onto the bus, bought a ticket and sat down on a chair, put on the headphones and turned on the white iPod in his pocket, throwing the cap of his jacket over his head Naruto waited patiently for the bus to get to its last stop, Harvard University. Yes. Harvard University, Harvard College to be specific. Now who is going to say he is not smart now? Some might ask how in the freaking Hades Naruto was able to get into a school like that and why would he need to study since the basic knowledge Athena taught him was more than enough to survive in this world. The problem lay right in the person who taught Naruto the basic information of this world, Athena. He couldn't care less about other gods and goddesses, especially the goddess of wisdom. Escaping from Artemis was one thing, but from Athena was another. She was smart, extremely smart. He already saw it from the first day they met but he couldn't believe that there was someone who could outclass Shikamaru's late father in tactics. Athena almost caught him once and if it not for some help, he would have to put on a fight to get away from her. Hell she even came to elemental nations for the second times to search for him, knowing that it would be the first place he goes to. Because in Athena's eyes, he was rather dumb and stupid, the last place she would choose to search for him would be some of the most popular schools around the world. After a lot of hard works and a lot of clones, he got admission and finally got Athena from his tail. It had been two years, not a single day Naruto stopped wondering what was going on up there. Hestia visited him every time she got the chance but she didn't tell him much about the situation on Olympus but he was enjoying the life like this. He visited Konoha and his friends once every weekend or maybe twice, if he were in the mood he would return and did some missions with Sakura and Sai before returning to this world. If it not for his auntie Hestia, he would leave this world as soon as possible and kick any asses that come to get him back to his parent, in the hard way if necessary. She said this world need him, the godly world need someone like him to change the way they are and it was still not the time for him to return, they both agreed at that. Naruto still hadn't forgot what he read in that Greek mythology yet and didn't intend to forget any of that soon. Plus, part of him still not wanted to leave them yet, because they are his family, the people who always wished for when he was young. He would never abandon them for something they had done in the past, 
Just because they were like that didn't mean they could not be changed. Naruto lives up to that motto after all, no matter how bad they are, as long as you guide them into the right direction, they will become good. His friends always said he got this power to change people and for some reason Hestia said it too. He changed people like Gara, Obito, so changing a world full of gods and goddesses from their millions year way of living wouldn't be a big deal, right? Naruto asked himself that question multi times before and hadn't stopped asking that from the depth of his mind. What was so special about him that Hestia placed so much trust in him anyway? Deep in thought, Naruto didn't realize that the bus had stopped and the people was slowly getting out of the car. Quickly gathered his things, Naruto got down and headed into Harvard College with hands in his jacket's pockets. Line break. Good morning Fishcake. The dude who was just call him that was Daniel Young, the boy who guided him around school the first day he was here and for some reason, he called himself Naruto's best friend since then. Now Naruto didn't have any problem with people calling him Fishcake, intentionally or unintentionally it was good nonetheless. However, when they called it like they was making a joke, it pissed him off. It was a nice name, made by his late Aero Senen when he was eating ramen. The Toad Sage even used it to the main character of the tale of the utterly gusty shinobi. What do you want Daniel? He could flick this guy away, knocking his skull in if he want, but he didn't want the tomorrow newspaper's first page's article would be, dead body found in Harvard campus. This person was excessively annoying to his taste. What are you up to today? You coming to school sooner than usual? The black hair boy asked with an excited tone. Daniel Young wasn't a bad-looking college student but compared to Naruto who was in another league of his own, that kind of level was totally out of Daniel's reach, not to mention Naruto was taller than him, standing at 5 foot 11. The girls hailed Naruto Uzumaki at the most attractive boy on campus, not to mention the whisker marks on his cheeks made them squealed out in delight every time he was in sight. He guessed it was something that would never change earth or elemental nation. Oh, I get it. A mischievous smile made its way to the black-haired boy face as he stared at Naruto. You came here this soon to see Caitlin Sharp, didn't you? Who is that? Naruto asked, totally confused. Ah ha ha ha. Daniel laughed idiotically for a second before his voice became quieter and quieter before looking at Naruto with a look of horror. You're kidding, right? No, Naruto replied blankly. Did you watch the news? He asked with a shock. Scratch that. Did you watch television? Of course. I watch UFC every day, it was the only thing Naruto watches every time Naruto turned the TV on. The other shows were too boring for his taste, only UFC was the only thing that took his interest. Speaking of which, he should try out some of the cooler moves he saw from the UFC fighters. That's not the point dude, he shouted, earning quite a lot of attentions from the other students, you're telling me you don't know Caitlin Sharp, the Caitlin Sharp. No need to shout lick. However, he didn't have the chance to finish it because Naruto suddenly felt a slight tingle at the back of his head, his warrior intuition was telling him something was not right. Indeed it was. At the other side of the street was a large horde of large, black mastiffs like beings with glowing red eyes, various sizes from a grizzly bear to a rhino, or a small truck. Hellhounds. Naruto thought with his eyes slightly widened in surprise. This was the first time he saw them the children of Cerberus running around the city like this, but this was the first time he saw them in a large numbers like this, which was a very strange things. Most of the time Naruto ignored them, knowing that they would ignore mortal like him. He let them go away and they let him be. However, this wasn't something he could let off easily. He better stop them before they do something bad. Doggies? Daniel asked with a slight chuckled, wow, the animal center must be having a massive prison break don't you think? Naruto glanced to the boy slightly. The mist worked very effectively in blinding human eyes from supernatural things. He had learnt that clear-sighted mortal like him wasn't very common, so he didn't have to worry about they see those hellhounds. Here catch, Naruto threw his backpack to his self-proclaimed friend. Keep that for me, you stay here pal, Naruto patted Daniel on his shoulder before quickly running away. Hey where are you going? Nevertheless, Naruto was already out of sight. Seeing a dark alley. Naruto made a heel turn and ran into it in order to get away from human's watchful eyes, channeling considered amount of chakra into his feet, Naruto put his feet on the nearest wall. Launching himself into the next one, Naruto got to the rooftop of the building in the matter of seconds before quickly following the hellhounds, 
jumping from rooftop to rooftop, catching up to them easily with his shinobi speed. I should take care of them now. Naruto muttered before summoning two bronze black kanais in his hands, a mixture of celestial bronze and chakra steel. Naruto was able to get his hand to this godly metal about more than a year ago. Hestia thought that maybe there would be time when Naruto would need to fight against the monsters, and celestial bronze was the best metal to kill them effectively. Not that he would need them but his techniques were all too powerful and destructive to fight something smaller and less powerful than Jubi's minions were. A clean-cut lead to a quick dead was something he would need to do inside a city full of people like Boston. Hey! Naruto jumped down from a rooftop, stomping his foot on the surface so hard that it broke to launch himself down as fast as he could. There, Naruto delivered an enchanted kick straight at the head of the lead hellhound, sending it high to the air before landing roughly on the ground of the park beside them. He couldn't care less about their intentions so he would take them down before any of them could kill someone. Cage Bushin no Jutsu. About ten clones appeared and ran at different directions. They would take care of the people currently at the park, making sure Naruto could fight freely without worrying about innocent people getting hurt. Since when I'd become a superhero? Naruto wondered to himself as he stood facing the horde of hellhounds, which were glaring at him and growling dangerously, baring their incredible sharp fangs at him. Here doggy doggy, he smirked challenging. At this moment, they probably realized that he was able to see them. All at once, they shot at him and Naruto turned around sharply, starting to run straight at the park. However, right in front of Naruto, running at him with neck-breaking speed, its claws sinking deeply into the ground with each lightning-fast steps, the monster roared angrily and leapt forward to grab him, trying to bite Naruto's head off his head. But Naruto was faster, he crouched down and also leapt forward with his arms outstretched, twisting his body in midair, slashing his kanais deeply into the neck of the massive hellhound, killing the beast instantly. Naruto landed on the air just as the beast smashed into the other of its kind before turning into golden dusts. The smirk still presented on his face. After the war, Naruto didn't get much action so doing something like this was a great thing for him. Without the need to turn around, Naruto jumped once again, stabbing his left kanai at the side of the head of the hellhound trying to make a sneak attack on him, turning it into golden dusts. His fist tightened and Naruto punched as hard as he could on the head of another hellhound from upside down, making it roar out in pain as its body was forced down to the ground hard enough to crack the area. Looking up, Naruto saw a gigantic jaw full of teeth a few inches in front of him, which only a millisecond later closed down powerfully. However, all the beast got was a piece of wood in its mouth. Kanai isn't the only thing I fused with celestial bronze, you see, Naruto smirked, standing a few feet away from the monster. Bringing both of his hands behind, Naruto summoned a massive windmill shuriken from the seal at the back of his right wrist. Throwing the shuriken at the hell's monsters, Naruto then clapped his hands together and shouted. Shuriken Cage Bushin no Jutsu, a higher caliber Cage Bushin no Jutsu for Naruto to add into his possession of Cage Bushin techniques learned from Kakashi during one of his first visits. The attack was devastating, thousand of windmill chakra head toward the horde of hellhounds, which got nothing to do other than stood watching the shuriken finished off their life, acting at the one-way ticket for them to Tartarus. The biggest one, being the fastest and strongest, survived the devastating attack. And it always have to be the big one. A golden Rasengan appeared in his palm, this morning and like just what he wanted it to be. Line break. A crowd was gathered in front of the school. Students, people with their cell phones out, camera mode on and flash of light could be seen almost anywhere. Even reporters and journalists were present, with the gears full on their body. It's her. Here she comes. The crowd roared out excitedly as the door of the colorful bus stopping in front of Harvard College School's gate slowly opened. Hey, get out of the way, I can't see a thing. Daniel shouted as he tried to get past the crowd of people but it was almost impossible because he was carrying two backpacks at once, seemingly stopping him from walking any further. Then suddenly, a hand found it way the orange backpack and grabbed it. Daniel cried out in shock as he was pulled backward out of the crowd. Hey what are you thin? Naruto, he shouted in shock. Thanks for keeping this for me. Naruto returned his bright color backpack to his shoulder. The first class is microeconomics so we better get moving. But. Dot but. Caitlin Sharp is right there, three steps away from us, he shouted, 
pointing his hand at the bus in the crowd, which was crying out in excitement for unknown reason, at least for Naruto. So? She isn't some expensive and rare diamond that you can only see once in your lifetime, Naruto shrugged and walked ahead. However, he stopped when a droplet of water fell onto his face, looking up Naruto saw that it was about to rain. Three minutes ago, the sky was beautiful and cloudless. The sunlight was warm and all. But now, the sky was full of dark clouds and he could feel the wind is about to pick up the speed, more and more drops of water fell from the sky and it started to rain, heavily. Oi what the hell Naruto, get in here before you catch a cold, Daniel really doubted a man like Naruto could get a cold that easily, but he was standing in the middle of the rain and looking at the sky strangely, unfazed by the wind. Hellhounds running around the place, weather changed drastically. If he didn't know any better Naruto would think that this was pretty normal. Just what was happening up there? Line break, just what are you reading Naruto? Greek mythology. Naruto answered simply as they were both sitting at a table at Harvard's elegant dining hall, enjoying the one of the most luxurious lunches any university around the world could offer. Greek mythology. The book he just borrowed from the library was in his right arm while a burger, which was the fifth ones, was in his left hand. Naruto didn't think that there would be the day he picked up this book again and just by reading it made his stomach sick. Why can't they serve ramen anyway? Naruto asked finished his burger and picked up the next one from the mountain of various kind of burger on the table at his right. Well downgrade foods like that. Gah. Naruto flicked the toothpick straight to the middle of Daniel's forehead, making it impaled into his head. The boy cried out in pain and quickly pulled the toothpick away from his head, looking at Naruto angrily, what the hell man. Don't ever call ramen downgrade food, got that? He warned with a very dangerous tone. Geez. All right. You're a fan of it or something, he looked at the toothpick while using a handkerchief to hold his bleeding forehead. How can you flick this thing so hard anyway? A lot of practice flicking a racer piece at idiots like you, Naruto said blankly. His attention returned to the book, searching for every details that involve problem between gods that would cause changes to mortal world. He could ask Hestia directly, but something was telling him that she shouldn't leave Olympus at this timing. Anway, what are you? Holy shit. What? Naruto asked, looking up from his book. She's here, look, Daniel gestured his head to the behind of Naruto excitedly and this time, Naruto turned around to see it. Standing in front of the door of the dining hall was by far the most beautiful mortal girls he had ever seen around here, with straight yet stylish golden blonde hair, holding up by a blue headband on top of her head. Her sky was sky blue, the same color of his eyes. She was wearing the wine color t shirt of Harvard University, with the top strained against the size of her bust, dark color jeans, and brown sneakers. The young woman dressed simple, yet spoke volume of her feminine figure and physical charm. Well, she looks good, she was no doubt the same age as he was. Good? She's totally gorgeous, man. Daniel said in disbelief, We shared three classes together this morning, hadn't you realized? I slept mostly through those classes, sorry. Naruto said sheepishly. Ugh, you're impossible. Naruto chuckled. Now, let's me fill you in what you had missed this entire life. Open your eyes and listen carefully about the background and career story of that girl, Caitlin Sharp. Wait before we start. We are having a trip to New York next week, aren't we? Naruto asked. Yeah, so, perfect. Naruto smirked, closed the book up and put it back into his pocket. Now, Say you want to say and shut up for the rest of the day. He looked at his self-proclaiming friend, unaware of the fact that the young woman Daniel was telling him about, with Naruto's back facing her was looking at him with her eyes wide in shock. Dude. She's staring at you. Daniel whispered to Naruto as they stood at the head of the line in front of the principal's office, lining up to get their student cards for the trip tomorrow to New York City. Or maybe me. But I really doubt that, his voice lowered. Naruto. While signing the paperwork the principal gave him couldn't help but turn his head a little to verify his friend's observations, and indeed just like what Daniel was saying, Caitlin, who was standing at the end of the line of students, was looking at him with her head titled to the side a little. Her eyes widened when she realized that he was looking at her, she quickly stood up and disappeared from his sight, returning to the line where everyone was looking at her excitedly. And. Naruto asked Daniel lazily. Why don't you think that she was simply wondering what's taking the two of us so long, making the entire line waiting impatiently for their turn? He shrugged his shoulder, 
taking the student card from the principal and put the blue necklace around his neck, hanging the student card in front of his chest. Dude, she has been staring at you this whole time, all day. Daniel try to reason, of course since you sleep through most classes you don't know that. You're mocking me aren't you? Naruto asked since usually, it was the other way around. Maybe Daniel was spending too much time around him to the point he was greatly influenced by his personality. Not at all buddy, the self-proclaiming best friend shook his head. What was with that girl anyway? Naruto wondered in his head. It wouldn't be a surprise if she was Aphrodite in disguise and came here to find him. It did happen once before and if not for the fact that she always used that ridiculous strong perfume, he wouldn't have been able to recognize her. He had come to learn that the goddess of love could change her appearance as will, normally it would be the person's ideal of beauty but indeed she could change into any appearance she wanted to. However, that girl wasn't using that kind of cosmetic product, with his sense of smell, Naruto could see that she does use perfumes but different in both quantity and quality from the ones the goddess of love used, and he was grateful for that. She could be a demi-god, Aphrodite's daughter to be more specific, with that kind of beauty clearly she could be the child of the beautiful goddess. Naruto knew about the way of the gods, especially their affairs with mortals and he doubted their thousand years of living would change the way they were, even now. Naruto, are you gay? Say what? Naruto nearly cried out in shock. That was the last question he would expect from anyone. They was standing in the quiet library of Harvard University, one of the most quiet places in the world, so his voice earned a lot of attention from the students and a rather pissed off glare from the librarians. Shish. They all did at once. Hee hee. Sorry, he scratched the back of his head and smiled nervously at them before grabbing Daniel's collar, dragging him out of the library under the stairs of the students in a certain blonde. Naruto threw the black-haired boy into the wall rather roughly before looking at him with an evil smirk on his face, cracking his fists. Give me one good reason not to punch your skull and Naruto asked dangerously. Relax bro. Relax, Daniel was on the ground, looking at Naruto nervously, it just that, a hottie got a thing for you and yet you still give me lot of ridiculous excuses. Naruto raised an eyebrow at that, either you're gay or you're not interested in someone as hot as her, which mean you're gay. Naruto nearly face palmed at his friend's logic. Can't you see those boobs, that ass and that pretty face? Not to mention her background and her worldwide popularity. Men will kill to have her and yet you still react like she is just a your next door neighbor. Sigh, you're impossible. Naruto offered his hand to Dinal. She is Caitlin Sharp, not Aphrodite. Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty from Greek mythology right? Naruto widened his eyes slightly when he heard that melodic, very feminine voice behind him. He saw Daniel's eyes almost pop out and his mouth drop to the ground in shock, gaping like a fish. She's right behind me, isn't she? Naruto asked himself. Naruto slowly turned around and saw the young woman in question was standing behind him holding the belt of her blue bag worn across her upper body. She was looking at him with a curious expression on her face and something more that he couldn't read. Hey. Um, Naruto greeted cheerily before he became lost of words, hi. Muahaha. Since when did you start getting lost for words in front of a female? Karama roared in laughter. This boy survived the feisty goddess of the hunt, he was completely immune to the lust goddess charms, he outran a wisdom goddess by getting into the place she would never think he would be able to get to, the best university in the world and yet, he was lost of words in front of this mortal young woman. Oh wait. It did happen before. It was at the night before his leaving with Hanada. Shut up Karama, she just randomly appeared behind me like that, what am I supposed to say? He asked the fox with a glare before returning to the living world. Um, is everything alright? She asked, looking at him and from Daniel who was still on the ground, I heard my name mentioned in your, conversation. Everything is perfectly fine, Naruto nodded his head before being shoved out of the way by a very excited Daniel. Miss Sharp, can I have your signature? He asked, reaching his hand into his bag. However, before he could pull out anything, a very muscular black man wearing a black suit, standing at the height of nearly six foot eight stepped up and pushed him back roughly, separating him from the girl before taking a very protective stance in front of her. Oi, what the? Daniel was once again on the ground, holding the notebook he was about to give to Caitlin to get her signature. The boy looked at the big black man from head to toe with his eyes wide. 
Is everything all right Miss Caitlin? He asked with a gruff tone. It's all right John. Caitlin smiled to him and patted his arm. He's just a fan am I right? She turned to Daniel and saw his blonde friend already standing in front of him, offering his hand to the boy. You're making yourself look like a total fool you know. Naruto asked, pulling Daniel to his feet. Even though Daniel was a little annoying sometime, but he was fun to hang around and not to mention good at almost anything, even idiotic things. Nah, don't worry bro. He then turned to Caitlin, Miss Sharp, he gave the notebook to her, please give me your signature. Okay then, what's your name by the way? She asked, taking the object from him and began to sign her own name. I'm Daniel Young. Daniel then snaked his arm around Naruto's shoulder and said, this is my best friend. Fishcake Uzumaki, John kept a very straight face, but Caitlin looked at Naruto like he was an alien. My name is Naruto Uzumaki, Naruto said, raising his leg and stomped hard on Daniel's foot. The poor boy cried out in pain and fell down to the ground, holding his foot. Oh my god, why did you do that? She asked in disbelief. Don't worry, best friends do it all the time, right buddy? He made sure to cause pain not break bones so his self-proclaimed best friend would be okay. Indeed the boy was because Daniel slowly got to his feet, a little limp on his right left but overall looked alright. Here, it's yours. Caitlin smiled and gave the notebook back to Daniel, all the pain immediately disappeared from his face. Caitlin then turned to Naruto and they looked at each other for a moment. Oh, sorry but I'm not one of your fans, he shook his head. If not for Daniel being one of Caitlyn's biggest fans and she had become the new icon of the entertainment world lately, he would still completely oblivious of this woman's name, let alone what she was doing. Oh, it isn't like that. She shook her head, smiling at him. Nevertheless, she admitted she felt a little surprise at his confession. You don't look Japanese to me. Kind of, Naruto said. Elemental Nation's language was indeed Japanese so when people asked where he came from, he could say that he came from Japan yet his appearance suggested otherwise. I see, she smiled, oh my, where is my manners, I should also introduce myself shouldn't I, she offered her hand to him and smiled, I'm Caitlin Sharp, it hink your name is kinda cute. Thanks, Naruto smiled. This was the first time someone told him his name was cute and it was from a girl no less. I got class so. Dot see you guys later then, she smiled at them before turning her heel around, walking ahead of them. Yeah, see you later. Naruto waved his hand to her and to his surprise, Caitlin turned around and waved at him, flashing him a very bright and beautiful smile before disappearing at the corner. Naruto put both of his hands into his pockets and sighed, he turned his head to Daniel and saw the guy looking at him with a mischievous and somewhat jealous smirk. Scored, he said shortly, what? Naruto asked, smiling forcefully. She likes you, Naruto shook his head before walking away uncaringly. Daniel quickly followed behind him, hey, admit it buddy, she got a thing for you. Naruto kept on walking to his next class, remaining silent all the way to his destination even though Daniel couldn't stop talking for one second. As the person who came from both worlds and with the time Naruto spent at the mortal world, he had come to learn a few things about mortals, more specifically, godly children. Therefore, with the help of Karama he was able to develop a special and unique ability to tell the difference between demigods and normal mortals. However, that girl, Caitlin, the feeling fell into neither of them. This was the first time Naruto met someone like her, a clear-sighted mortal. Plus he needed to keep a close eye on her, girls like that only attract attention from the guys above and the last things he would want would be Caitlin becoming the next victim of their lust while he has the power to stop it. Line break that night, it couldn't rain harder and yet, the crowd couldn't get wilder. Whose idea was this? Naruto asked the boy standing next to him through the sound of cheering and screaming, the sound of winds tearing through the air as well as the hard rain around them. Her. Daniel shouted and pointed his hand toward the stage. There were lights, lots of lights with various colors, moving around in the booming sound of music. The whole campus ground had become the stage for Caitlin's music night, the students as well as a lot of citizens of Boston were gathering around the place to see their favorite idol in action. True enough, when the idol made it to the stage like a troubled teenage girl having trouble with her life and parents, completely ignoring the rain pouring down on her, the bystanders cried out in absolute excitement and all jumped up and started to follow the music. The fuck is this? Naruto asked himself. 
Daniel was the one who pulled him to this place, while Naruto could just stay at home and watch the UFC World Heavyweight Championship. He got his money on that match and yet he was standing here, listening to this strange music. Relax Naruto, weren't you the one who thought you should keep a close eye on her? Kurama asked with a slight chuckle. He didn't know much about music but even a biju like him could see why this girl could become such a famous singer without her beauty in the help. Plus, this is kind of entertaining. To me, entertainment is watching Brock Lesnar getting his revenge on Frank Mir on their rematch. Naruto muttered. He nearly destroyed his television when Frank Mir managed to make Lesnar tap out in his debut match, so Naruto was very eager to watch their rematch tonight and his money was on Brock Lesnar. Suddenly, his eyes caught something rather interesting. Hey Naruto. Where are you going? However, Naruto didn't reply. Instead he kept on heading to the backstage. He was right about keeping his eyes on this girl. Line break. Thank you for your help everyone. Caitlin smiled to her friends and staff, taking a towel from her manager and use it to dry her hair. This wasn't the first time her show got caught in the rain so she wasn't too worried about catching a cold. I think you should change your clothes before you can catch a cold, Caitlin. Kathy advised, pushing her glass up while holding a hairdryer to help Caitlin dry her hair. The night was still young and Caitlin still needed to save her strength for the rest of the show. Don't worry Mrs. Kathy I will be fine, she smiled while having her manager's hand ran through her golden hair trimming it. But you still need to change your clothes. Caitlin shook her head in defeat and handed the towel back to Kathy. The beautiful blonde-haired young woman walked to her bus and stepped inside, closing the door behind her and began to strip. She got ten minutes before her next song starts so Caitlin wasted no time. Um. Caitlin winced slightly at the tightness while trying to put on her bra. Caitlin knew that she was a growing girl and was blessed with greater assets than the girls her age or even older, but her ever-growing cup size were getting on her nerve. A little too tight aren't we? Kya. Caitlin squealed out in shock and used her hand to cover her body when she heard the strange male voice behind her. Turning back the blonde saw a muscular, large man with cheeks filled with scars. He was wearing black jeans, combat boots, a leather duster, and muscle shirt with a bulletproof vest and an iron padlock necklace. A pair of red-tinted wraparound sunglasses to cover his eyes. Who are you? She screamed out. How did you get in here? She asked in shock, scared. The door wasn't locked, so I let myself in, he said with a leer and began to step forward, taking his jacket off. No. Get away from me. Caitlin screamed, grabbing everything in her arm's reach and threw it at the man, but he easily swiped them out of the way, even the sharp and pointy things. I like feisty girls, it makes things even more. But before he could finish that sentence, coming from behind Caitlin was no longer the random thing, but an actual weapon. A kanai. No freaking way. Ares muttered before his cheek was cut by the kanai, which was thrown faster than any bullet. Yahweh. From the window at his left, Naruto jumped in with an angry shout, breaking the window with a powerful kick which also made a contact with Ares' face. The god of war cried out in pain at the all too familiar force, which was strong enough to shake the entire bus with shockwave before sending him out of the place through the opposite window. Naruto landed on the bus and turned his head to look at Caitlin who was staring at him in shock with her eyes wide. He gave her a thumb up before jumping out of the window. Fancy seeing you here Ares, Naruto said in perfect ancient Greek, how are you? Fucking punk. His smirk widened when Ares furiously used his hand to wipe the ichor away from his cheeks, leaking down from the cut, so you were hiding at this place all this time eh? Ya fucking coward do you know how much troubles you had caused for us gods on Olympus by simply disappear? I will fucking kill you asshole. Uh-huh. Naruto nodded but didn't care much about it. I happen to come across this place, surprise huh? Naruto asked. If you still want to fight, I will kick your ass harder than what I did last time, his fist tightened. Naruto didn't know what about the other gods, but Ares' actions disgusted him, he wanted to beat this guy until his mother wouldn't recognize him. T-C-H. Remember, we're not done yet punk. Ares was one of the first gods who got the pleasure of tasting Naruto's strength so he chose the smart move in the current situation and teleported away. Damn Hades, and I thought this place can't get any. Stop. Bang. His reaction got the better of him, before the gun could even release the bullet Naruto already moved his body out of the way by bending his back to the side, 
so the lead object flying at almost the speed of sound passed through him harmlessly. The hell, Naruto muttered and turned his head to the behind him and saw John, Caitlin's bodyguard standing with a smoking handgun in his hand, pointing at Naruto. His face was what people could say absolute shock and the beautiful singer was no better, she was also in her state of shock with her jaw dropped to the ground. Oi, did you just shoot me? He asked, sorry, it was a misunderstanding, he said, but did you just dodge a bullet? Okay. I wasn't expecting that, Naruto thought before coming up with a quick excuse, I got lucky, he better get out of this situation quick, or else unnecessary question would pop up from those two. I need to go now, my friend is probably looking for me, he turned on his heel. Wait, Caitlin shouted, stopping him on his track. Naruto turned around, looking at her, thank you, she smiled at him, a little pink on her cheeks. Naruto grinned widely before running away. Olympus. Inside her palace, Aphrodite looked at herself in the mirror and she saw nothing but herself. Not like that of course. Unknown to most, even the goddess of beauty herself was affected by her own power. Aphrodite looked at herself in the mirror. A few moments ago she had dark hair and dark brown eyes, now her hair had become bright blonde with sky blue eyes, her features became much toner and her face became much more beautiful, almost to the impossible level. This was her true appearance. Yes, Aphrodite's ideal of beauty was herself. Taking the hairbrush on her makeup table, Aphrodite put it on her golden blonde hair and slowly moved the object along the incredible smooth surface of her long and curly hair, tilting her head to the side. Blonde and sky blue eyes. It was just like him. It had been two years since the Prince of Olympus left them, two years since Aphrodite saw Naruto jump from that cliff down to the mortal world below. At first she thought he was crazy and had become mad because of what she told him to read, but after hearing from Hades that the boy was still alive, Aphrodite realized how little she thought about him. His disappearance brought huge chaos to Olympus, every single god and goddess was sent all around the world to find him by his parents. However no matter how they tried and how many days, weeks, months and years had passed, they couldn't find the prince of Olympus. Even two of the best trackers, Artemis and Athena weren't able to find him or even come close to his mysterious location. Zeus and Hera were shocked when they found out about Naruto's reason for leaving from Athena, when the goddess of wisdom gave them the Greek mythology book Naruto borrowed from her library that night. Aphrodite decided to keep her mouth shut for the rest of the night, because she didn't know what they would do to her if they found out she was the one who told him to read that book to find out the reason she cheated on his brother. Ares was nearly blasted out of the throne room by Zeus Master Bolt because he couldn't keep himself from laughing. Hera was really distracted and she spent most of her time these past two years around the world looking for her son. The numbers of divorce marriage couples rose dramatically the last two years because of this, to the point Aphrodite felt sick most of the time and barely had the energy to do anything because of the lack of love from the mortal world. If not for Hestia who quickly stepped up and comforted Hera. Aphrodite and the goddess of the hearth would have faded away by now. Everything had become quite the past two months, at least until the sudden accident happened after the winter solstice. The Olympian gods were barely around Olympus at this time, they had their duty of taking care of their domains and also at the same time continue their searching, and Naruto wasn't the only thing that was being looked for. A mischievous smile appeared on her face at the mention of him. Naruto wasn't only incredibly attractive and she was talking about a 17 years old teenager boy, but he was also incredibly powerful, showing enough skills alone to fight on par with the god of war, and enough power to fight on par with an individual whose power rivaled the primordial beings. He was also very caring, warm and even though they only just spent a little more than a few minutes together, he was kind of fun to hang around to say the least. But the thing about him that aroused, Dot yes, aroused her the most was the enormous amount of love within his body. She was the goddess of love, she could feel the, love, within a person's heart. She couldn't explain it in word, but she could feel the, love, in a more, physical, way and she could tell the, size, of these, loves, within different people, which represent the feeling they would have for their partner when one appear. The bigger it is, the more feeling they will hold for their partner the more they will love, the more they will stay loyal to their partner. This, love, could increase or reduce in, size, depending on the situation but normally, it would stay the way it was. The girl Naruto falls in love with, 
no doubt would be the luckiest girl in the world because in all her immortal life of being the goddess of love, she had never felt such a powerful and enormous amount of love from someone like him before. He completely surpassed every loyal married couple in history, even his mother who was the goddess of marriage and faithfully loyal to her cheating husband. The luckiest girl in the world. Aphrodite, the luckiest goddess. Dot she couldn't help but giggle at the sound of that, it did have a nice ring with her name. Aphrodite was snapped out from her thought when a blinding flash of red light appeared in the middle of her palace. Her expression didn't change in the slightest when her lover the god of war appeared. However the second after that, her eyes widened in shock when he pulled out his sword and slashed violently around the place, kicking and punching, destroying everything that was in his sight. Hey! Aphrodite shouted, standing up, what are you doing to my palace? She asked angrily. That fucking punk! With a hatred-filled mind, Ares was completely oblivious of Aphrodite's cry, someday, I will fucking kill you! He roared and kicked over Aphrodite's wardrobe, making it fall down to the ground. The goddess of love's eyes widened in shock at what he just said. The only time she had seen the god of war this angry was when he was beaten and humiliated by Naruto so it didn't take long for her to put two and two together. What? Ares, she ran to him and grabbed his jacket, you found Naruto. What about it? Ares asked with a grunt, his eye sockets flared with red fire. Holy Zeus, you did find our prince. Aphrodite gasped in shock before her lips spread out in a smile. I need to go and tell. But when she was about to turn around, Aphrodite's throat was grabbed roughly by the goddess of war and he used it to pull her toward him, glaring into her blue orbs angrily. Don't you fucking dare tell them woman, he said, gritting his teeth, his hand tightened around Aphrodite's throat, choking her. Yes, I did find him, but his location is mine only, and the fact that I found that fucking blonde will be our little secret, got that? He asked. Bibi. Oot. He. Ra. Z. Love. Aphrodite tried to form some words, but she wasn't able to no matter how hard she tried. Ares was too strong, his strength was far greater than hers, the. Prince. The god of war raised his hand and backhanded the goddess of love hard across her face. Aphrodite fell down to the ground hard, with golden ichor running down the corner of her lips, tears falling down from her eyes as she held her bruised cheek. Don't you fucking dare call him the prince of Olympus. Ares roared, his body flared with power, covering the entire area in red light. That title belonged to me, I'm the rightful prince of Olympus, not your crippled husband and especially not that fucking mortal. He ignored her cry. If you spill a word to them Aphrodite, I will make sure every single one of your children will be seriously hurt, both mentally and physically. My sons after all, love to have fun with pretty girls, and he walked out of the palace, grunting mostly to himself. Aphrodite just sat there and sobbed, her hand holding her cheek with ichor dripping down to the ground from her lips, tears couldn't stop dropping from her eyes. Line break. Listening to the music while doing his everyday morning exercise was something Naruto greatly enjoyed. The iPod must be one of the best invention that he came across in this world, he could store thousands or even millions of songs within such a small place and listen to the beats anytime he wants, and anywhere he wants. Normally, he would prefer the strong and fast kind of music like rock or heavy metal but lately, he had come to like Caitlin's pop songs and downloaded some of her best albums onto his iPod. He couldn't help but admit how good her voice was and how well she could sing. Kind of made him reconsider about his decision about calling Daniel a fan maniac of Caitlyn, not to mention that she was not only good on stage but also the best in a movie studio. Currently Naruto was doing his daily 100-mile run around Harvard campus. Wearing long black plant, orange t-shirt and black jacket with hood over his head, headphones in his ear, his usual combo. Naruto woke up around 3 in the morning and had been running for 2 hours since then, he didn't stop for a second to rest, just kept on challenging the limit of his stamina which by far was nowhere near his limit yet. Then, he felt someone approaching him. Oheyo oh, gozaimasu. Good morning, Naruto turned to his right and widened his eyes slightly when he saw Caitlin running right next to him, with her blonde hair tied into a ponytail behind her head. She was wearing a dark color sports bra that spoke volume of her amazing ample bust and tone figure, exposing her toned stomach and small waist. Same color fitness pants that reached past her knees and clung to her lower body like a second skin, 
once again showing the world why she was the new icon of the entertainment world and lastly white sport shoes used for running. Good morning, Caitlin, Naruto greeted her with a grin, removing the headphone in his left ear, no need for Japanese, the two kept on running, smiling at each other. But I wanted to surprise you, she giggled, you do this every day? Yeah, it is a part of my morning workout routine, Naruto nodded his head, what about you? I hope you're doing fine, it was clear for Caitlin the blonde didn't ask her about her health or her morning exercise schedule. I'm fine, don't worry Naruto, she smiled at him, once again, thank you, I don't want to know what would have happened without you there. Don't mention it Caitlin, he then turned to her, you took it better than I thought, not the first time? Yes, believe it or not, it was not the first time a fan got overexcited like that, Caitlin sighed, looking away from Naruto. I guess that is the reason why my father allowed John to carry guns within him, to protect me in case anything bad happened. I doubt Ares is a fan of your songs and movies Naruto could only nod his head, and I doubt John could handle a god of war, even with a tank, he added in his head. Say, Naruto, are you up for the trip to New York today? She asked, changing the topic quickly. Of course, Naruto grinned. The trip to New York was going to take place today and they were going to various places before stopping at New York Metropolitan Museum of Art. He hoped that with this visit he could learn more about the godly realm and find out more what could be possibly happening to it, you. Yes, it's one of my most favorite cities, she said brightly, my first music night was there. Really? Naruto asked, wow, that's cool. Kind of like home coming for you right? Of course. Caitlin smiled before smiling mischievously at him. Tilting her head to the side she quickly grabbed the unused headphone before Naruto could stop her, hey what are you listening? She put it on her ear. Oh hey. A massive smile spread out on her face when she heard the song. I thought you said you're not a fan of mine, she told him, want my signature now? Changed my mind after realizing your voice wasn't half bad, Naruto joked and got a light punch on his right arm. His morning jogging ended like that. Line break, the fuck? Daniel cried out in shock, horror and jealousy before slamming the newspaper down on Naruto's table, surprising him because he was in the state of nearly falling asleep. What now? He asked while yawning, looking at the black-haired boy lazily. Liked it or not he might have picked up some of Shikamaru's bad habits of falling asleep anytime he wants. Read the front page, Daniel pointed out, glaring at Naruto, that guy is clearly you. Naruto grabbed the newspaper and gave it a glance, his eyes widened slightly at the article in the front picture. Mysterious man seen with Caitlin Sharp this morning. And the front picture was unmistakably the scene of him and Caitlin doing jogging with each other this morning. This must be a picture taken by an unprofessional photographer, because they couldn't capture his face hidden under the hood of his jacket, plus he was looking at Caitlin, away from the camera. Below was various lines written about Caitlin and the possibility of her love life. Even though his face was trying to remain as calm as possible, he couldn't help but feel a little worry about this. Not because of the picture or the articles, or what was written but about the possibility of being found out by the godly world. There was a chance that Ares wouldn't tell anyone about his wherever about, he was too hateful to do that but if this newspaper got into the hands of someone like Athena or Artemis, they would feel suspicious about it and come to this place. Not to mention the fact that Ares could figure out his friendship with Caitlin. He had seen that Warmonger wasn't very hesitating when trying to attack him with his axe even though his lover was right there in the attack range. What would stop this war god from using Caitlyn to get to him? Or maybe he was just thinking too far ahead, maybe spending too much time around Shikamaru made him think too much and become paranoid. Or maybe he was slowly turning into a mini version of his father, he heard from Hera that Zeus was very paranoid. And? Naruto asked, giving Daniel back his newspaper and? Freaking and. This guy is clearly you, Daniel pointed out. There were not many students in their class and each of them were also minding their own business, so Naruto wasn't too worried about it. You're the only guy the first know around here would wear orange in the morning. This hoodie is clearly yours. And, you said you're not interested in her, he cried, with two lines of tears running down his cheeks, and only interested in UFC fighters. Firstly, I never said I'm not interested in her. Naruto said blankly but it was enough to make Daniel widen his eyes in shock. Secondly, why are you so sure this guy is me? There must be a lot of guys out there wearing orange, 
Hell maybe there is a whole summer camp with orange uniforms. Naruto shrugged his shoulder, tugging the newspaper from his hand, reading it quickly before saying, other than spying on her life, why don't they put the match between Brock Lesnar and Frank Mir last night on the front page and tell us how dominated Lesnar was? Naruto stood up and checked the clock on the wall, it was about time. Gather your things, the bus will leave in 20 minutes, Naruto threw his bag on his shoulder and walked to the door. Hey! We're not done yet Naruto! Daniel shouted, quickly gathering his belongings, fishcake wait. Line break unfortunately for Daniel and oh so lucky for Naruto, he was sorted to bus 99 while his self-proclaimed friend was sorted into bus 94, which meant Naruto could relax, have his own space and be freed from Daniel's annoying stories for about 5 hours of traveling. Naruto chose a seat at the middle of the bus, beside the window so he could look at the world outside. While there were some differences between Earth and elemental nations, Naruto couldn't help but see so many similar things between the two worlds. Pulling out his iPod Naruto put the headphones in his ears and chose the songs, going through various kinds of music, he stopped at the folder where he stored all of Caitlyn's songs. When he was going through the list chose the song he hadn't heard yet, he heard a voice. You should give Love Story a chance, it was my best last year. Naruto turned his head to the side and saw Caitlyn standing there smiling at him, her hands put on the chair to support her body, hey. She greeted him softly, with her head tilting to the side. Hey, Naruto grinned, you are bus 99 too? He asked, looking at the student card lying on her generous bust. Yes, cool huh? She held it in her hand and smiled at him. Mind if I sit here? She motioned her head to the seat next to him. Sure. Go ahead, Naruto nodded. Caitlin put her bag into the cargo hold cabin above them and sat down beside Naruto, raising her hand to adjust the air conditioner above them she asked, where is your friend? You mean Daniel? He is in a different bus, saving me some headache anyway. Naruto nodded his head while Caitlin giggled. Where is your bodyguard? I thought someone like you will have him around 24-7? John will follow behind us in his car. Caitlin smiled and raised her head when the bus roared to life. Oh, here we go. They didn't talk much the first hour of the journey, mainly because Naruto was watching the recording of the match between Brock Lesnar and Frank Mir he missed last night while Caitlin was reading a guide book about New York. Many students who happened to travel on the same bus as them came and asked the blonde for her signature, asking Caitlin about her plan for her next movies and songs or just to take a picture and selfie with their idol. Most male students came and looked at Naruto in jealousy, which he ignored. Some of them even asked Caitlin to come and sit with them but she politely refused. Damn. Naruto grinned and put his phone back into his pocket, the fight was awesome and it was too bad that he couldn't have watched it live last night. You like UFC a lot, don't you? Caitlin asked. Well yeah, the only thing I find entertaining, Naruto nodded his head with a smile. What about my music? Well you can say that it was added to my list, Caitlin giggled. My brother likes it too, Caitlin said, to meet up with his partners in business actually, you know the higher class people. Yeah I know, Naruto nodded his head, you have a brother. What is he like? He's really nice and a very hard worker, he is the CEO for my father's company. Naruto Wolf whistled while Caitlin was wondering where Naruto was coming from. Clearly everyone knew about the sharps everyone but the blonde in front of her. Unlike him I don't have this. Leader's attitude and a mind for business, so I can't be a part of this bigger picture, like my father said. And so, I decided to create a bigger picture of myself, become Caitlin Sharp, not the daughter of Sharp. She looked at him and said with a small smile, I stepped into the world of entertainment when I was eight years old. With my performance on stages and in movies around the world, I fulfilled my own dream faster than I thought. I finally stepped out of my family's shadow, she smiled, what about you Mr. Japanese but not Japanese? I lived on my own since the day I was born, Caitlin gasped and was about to say something but Naruto quickly added, not like that, there was an accident and my parents thought I was dead, so they returned to their home and didn't know that they left me there on my own, Naruto said, I grew up with the dream of becoming the leader of the village I lived in. It was really hard at first but slowly I think that the villagers finally recognized me and accepted my existence among them. Then two years ago, my parents found out I was still alive and brought me to their homeland. Naruto continued, but then I suddenly realized that they weren't the people I thought they were, 
doing a lot of bad things in the past that I can't accept. So I decided to move out and stay on my own. After all, I had always been alone most of my life so I'm kind of used to it by now, he chuckled bitterly. Nobody likes to be alone Naruto, Caitlin said softly as she took his hand into her hands. No matter what they did Naruto, the past is the past, what's important is that they love you, you're their son Naruto. Caitlin, Naruto looked at her and smiled, thank you, his hands tightened around her smaller ones. My pleasure, she smiled at him and leaned back in her seat, closing her eyes but the smile never left her face. Line break. The buses arrived at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Manhattan, New York City at 12 o'clock noon after five hours of traveling. If not for Caitlin who sat next to him and got a lot of amusement tricks to entertain him, Naruto would have been bored to death because sitting in the same place for five hours straight. Caitlin was a little sore but she quickly got out of the book and stood next to Naruto, holding the guide book in her hand she read. Did you know that this museum is the largest art museum in the United States and among the most visited art museums in the world? She read excitedly. Its permanent collection contains more than 2 million works, divided among 17 curatorial departments. You're slowly turning into Athena you know, Caitlin looked at him questionably, I mean, the smart kind of girl, which says everything can be found in a book. Oh, you do compare things around you a lot with the gods in Greek mythology, don't you? She smiled mischievously, and I do remember that you said, she's Caitlin Sharp not Aphrodite. Naruto chuckled while scratching the back of his head. Luckily for him, Daniel came to the rescue. Kanbanwa, good evening, my friend, he said happily at Naruto looking around the blonde's shoulder. Who's your? Oh my god, Caitlin Sharp. He cried out and tripped over himself, nearly falling to the ground if not for Naruto who quickly caught him. First idiot keep your damn voice down, Naruto said before letting go of his arm, making the boy fall down to the ground and Kanbanwa is, good evening, Caitlin giggled, using the guide book to cover her mouth. Let's go guys, the others are already coming in, the singer-actress said, motioning her hand for the boys to follow her, which the black one did faster than Naruto could even blink. Shaking his head, the Prince of Olympus quickly followed them but when he was midway up the steps that led up to the museum, Naruto stopped when he suddenly felt a slight tingle at the back of his head. Turning his head back Naruto's eyes were met with a bus with the world, Yancey Academy, on top of it. The students inside began to move out of the bus and he could see that most of them weren't the best kind of teenagers you could find, most of them around the age of 15 and 16. But two of them caught his attention the most. One smelt like goat while the other smelt like the sea. And there was one explanation for this. One was satyr and the other was a demigod. The End Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.